Thank you. Good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting of Full Council. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and the recording will be made available on the Council website for public listening. Could I remind councillors to follow the good practice guidelines, which includes muting microphones and switching off your video when you are not addressing the meeting, writing yes or speaking in the Teams chat function when you want to contribute rather than raising your hand. If you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Those in the room without access to the Microsoft Teams chat, if you wish to speak, please catch the attention of Nick Evans, who will enter your request into the chat. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members. 
No material should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function and then join when you rejoin the meeting so we can keep track on whether the meeting is co-read. All members should speak clearly and directly into the microphone when making contributions and when referring to reports, please provide reference to the relevant page and paragraph to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions on areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. Members may notice when calling members to speak, I will, I will refer to them formally using their title and surname so that it is clear who are councillors and who by the process of elimination are officers. We have scheduled a break for lunch around 12.30 noon, which will be assessed as we proceed through the agenda. I intend calling regular comfort breaks throughout the agenda. Given the large number of items we have on the agenda today, I would seek members' cooperation and asking their questions, waiting for an answer and confirming if they are happy with the response without introducing supplementary questions. This will allow us to move on in an efficient manner. Before we move to the start of the agenda, we have some excellent achievements to celebrate. First, on Sunday 10th of March, some of our pupils attended the William McIlvany campus in Kilmarnock for the Scottish Schools Pipe Band Championship. It was a day of competition and camaraderie and a showcase for Scotland's talented young musicians. Firstly, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Andrew McCartney and the SWSPDA for working with young musicians from Dumfries and Galloway schools to form a band to enter the competition. It is clear the immense amount of work it takes in order to prepare pupils for such an event. And as someone who as a, a youngster actually used to compete in these events myself, I, I do appreciate the effort involved in getting everyone there. The work that the SWSPDA do is not funded by the council, but closely supported by the instrumental music service. It was clear that the young musicians had to put in a lot of effort as their performance was accurate and polished. The enjoyment of and pride in the performers shone through, along with the pride of their tutors, parents and supporters. Congratulations to Dumfries and Galloway School's Pipe Band, who came a remarkable second place in the junior C section of the competition. A huge achievement. In addition to this, Dumfries and Galloway School's Pipe Band were the winners of the Ailey McLeod Endeavour Award. <clears throat> Ailey McLeod was a young piper from the Scoyle Lana Cleet Pipe Band who tragically lost her life in the Manchester Arena terrorist attack in 2017. The award was presented to Dumfries and Galloway School's Pipe Band for demonstrating perseverance and resilience, community contribution, enthusiasm and camaraderie and innovation and efforts to include everyone regardless of their circumstances. I wish the SWSPDA every success going forward and again express the gratitude and congratulations of the Fries and Galloway Council for your support of young musicians in the region. So a big well done. Secondly, on Saturday the 9th and Sunday the 10th of March, the Fries and Galloway's Young Women's Network hosted their inaugural conference and celebration evening focused on empowering young women and girls, part of a programme of events to mark International Women's Day. This was a fantastic event for the region for many reasons, one of which being that the conference brought together over 140 young women and girls, community leaders, educators and advocates from Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The conference provided attendees the opportunity to participate in workshops, panel discussion and networking sections. And guest speakers praised the young women for stepping forward, speaking out and shaping a brighter future from the, for themselves and their peers. A highlight of the weekend was the unveiling of an ambitious three-year strategy for young women and girls empowerment, developed by young people in our region. The innovative strategy represents a comprehensive approach to addressing the unique challenges faced by young women and girls today, while harnessing the potential to drive positive change across our communities. It encompasses a wide range of projects and initiatives 
aimed at promoting gender equality, leadership and better access to opportunities in sport and the art. I'd like to congratulate the members of the Young Women's Network who are supported by the Friesen Galloway Council's Youth Work Service in developing this strategy and their commitment to work collaboratively with partners and stakeholders to implement the strategy and monitor its impact on the lives of young women and girls in our region. Thirdly, Peter Whitelaw, sixth year at St Joseph's College in Fries, accompanied on the piano by his brother Donald, fourth year at St Joseph's College, won the vocal category of the Scottish final of the Rotary Young Musicians Competition. Peter will now compete again with Donald at National GB in Ireland final in Manchester on 21st of April, and we wish them all the best and congratulations on their achievements so far. Well done to them too. <laughs> Lastly, the Friesen Galloway Council has been successful, having finalists in six categories at this year's Scottish Veterans Awards, demonstrating the significant activity and high calibre of people involved in our region. The nominations are Role Model of the Year, Archie Driver MB, <laughs> Health and Wellbeing Award, the Veterans Garden Dumfries, <laughs> Employer of the Year, Dumfries and Galloway Council, Volunteer of the Year, Mark Harper from the Veterans Garden Dumfries and Morris Kennedy from the Veterans Garden Dumfries, Lifetime Achievement Award, Archie Driver MB. Veterans Group of the Year, the Veterans Garden Dumfries. Congratulations to all the nominees and good luck. So, well done. <laughs> well done to you, Archie, for all your and thanks for all your hard work. No, please do. <laughs> I, can, I can understand the lifetime achievement. <laughs> the other one was a bit concerning. <laughs> Uh, it's not every day you get called a role model, is it, Archie? Let's be honest. So now moving to the tabled agenda for today. Sedan apologies and Chair's approval of members' remote participation. Vlad, can you provide the Sedan and any apologies, please? Good morning, members. Uh, I can confirm uh, we've received no apologies so far. We've got uh, 30 present uh, in the hall. We've got 11 on Teams and not present currently is Councillor Justy and Councillor Wood. Sorry, um, I've had a message from Councillor Justy. I think he's attending the funeral, but he'll try and get along later. Thank you. Thank you. I confirm my agreement to remote participation of members recorded as uh, participating remotely. Declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of interest or statement of connection they wish to make? Councillor John Campbell. Uh, thanks, convener. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, item 13, just uh, a statement of connection. My role as chair of West Rands. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, agenda item 18, I sit on the IGB, so um, I'll excuse myself while that's been discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hagman. Hagman. <laughs> oh, sorry. No. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, it's item 17, a statement of connection, um, purely because of my national role working with trade union colleagues, but it is just a statement of connection. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McGregor. Thank you. You looked at me when you said Katie's name. Um, yeah, item seven, uh, statement of connection in my role as environment spokesperson at COSLA. A lot of this has been debated nationally. Thank you. Councillor McFarlane. Yeah, thank you, convener. Just a statement of connection as chair of the IGB in relation to uh, item 18. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ian Crothers. Similar to Council McFarlane and Stevenson, I think, in regards to item 18, but I think it's every decision making body that's referred to within that particular notice of motion, a statement of connection. Thank you, Councillor Crothers. Councillor Ferguson. Exactly the same for me, uh, at IGB. Thank you. We now have further. Councillor Hill. Same for me, I sat on the IGB. 
Thank you, Councillor Hill. And could I just uh, reiterate, when you want to speak, when you're at remote, could you please put speak in the, in the chat function? Because it's quite difficult to keep track of people putting their hands up on the screen because we, we don't see everybody that's on the, on the screen in front of me. So it's actually quite difficult. So if you could please use speak in the chat function, it would be most helpful. Now we move on to item three, minute of the joint full council and youth council meeting of 7th February 2024. Can we approve the minutes of the joint meeting held on 7th February 2024? Thank you. Item four, minutes of meeting of 27th February 2024. Can we approve the minutes of the meeting held on 27th of February 2024? Thank you. We'll now move on to item five, Treasury Management Strategy 2024-25, report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report provides members with the Council's updated Treasury Management Strategy for the upcoming financial year, including the prudential indicators supporting the Council's agreed capital investment strategy. Paul Garrett, Head of Finance and Procurement, and Karen Donaldson, Treasury and Capital Manager, are here to assist members with any questions in this report. Can I have members' questions and contributions, please? Councillor Jameson. Thank you. Um, I'm referring to page, page number 32, uh, 4.6E. Uh, it talks about the delegation of council role of scrutiny of the Treasury management and policies to a specific name body, which is the FPT committee. My, my question is, my comment is, it's a really good report list. It's really intensive and extensive, and reading right through it three times probably to get my head around it. My, my question is, and, and this is not to be in any way confrontational, but there was an FBT committee cancelled recently by the chair and the vice chair. Um, there's a lot in this stuff. The FBT is the delegated body responsible. And my personal concern, I can't speak for everybody, is any any opportunity to learn more about it and speak with the officials would be very welcome. So that space that was cancelled for fairly, I would imagine, legitimate reasons could have been used to help the FPT committee become more informed and more able to make the sort of policy decisions that we are held responsible for. So it's just a comment on th th this document mentions the training that the officials have, and it does touch on members' training, but we need to have that more regularly. Um, I've, had, I've run a business and I've been a business consultant, so I've got some handle on this, but not enough. Not enough to feel able to, be, to take on that responsibility and all due, all due diligence. So my question is, please don't cancel time spent with officials. Uh, and, and secondly, keep us up to speed on, on a regular basis, because this is important stuff, particularly with the financial difficulties and the challenges ahead of us. Thank you, Councillor Jimison. I think, I think you make a good point there. That the time was allocated and it could perhaps have been used, used for something else. And I, I fully understand, despite the fact I've got an accountancy background when I first became an elected member, the difference between the way um, the public sector reports things, I found it quite difficult to come to terms with initially at first as well. Councillor Dryborough. Have you very quick? Yeah, I have a very, very, very quick. Three words, can we have a seminar? Four words, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Driver. Yeah, th thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, this is basically a compliance report, and, and you know we have to look at what we're going to do, make sure in the future. I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm going to look forward to actually seeing what opportunities there is in the future. But I have to agree with, with Councillor Jameson about you know that strategy management was overviewed by FPT, and we may come on to some issues later on looking at future strategic committees. Um, the opportunities are about the UK Infrastructure Bank and seeing what opportunities there are for capital pro projects in here. And I'm just wondering, have, has there been any, um, you know, sort of discussions with, with the UK Infrastructure Bank to see what opportunities there can be as a council to move forward from the Treasury, Treasury Management Strategy? But it's important, I think, you know, Councillor Jameson was absolutely right. That process of managing that strategy is going to be really important to us over the next few years because of the budget concerns that we've got uh, in, in, in year two and three of, of our council budget. 
Thank you. Paul or Karen, can you? Paul? Yeah, but in terms of the, the UK Infrastructure Bank, we've had some preliminary discussions so far, but obviously we wanted to ensure that we had member approval to the strategy and the inclusion of the bank before we make any formal approaches. Uh, based on initial discussions, we, we think there are some projects within our capital investment strategy that, that may be suitable for support from that bank. As it's reflected in the report, it's a slightly lower rate than is available through PWLB, so we'd like to take those opportunities. Uh, things like the Zero Waste Park have uh, been part of the initial discussions, and we think that is one that would, would likely get some support going forward. Also, we've agreed recently some additional investment in energy efficiency programmes, including LED lighting. That's another uh, prospect. Also, things like the levelling up fund projects, electric vehicles, and so on. Those are the kind of things that the uh, Infrastructure Bank tends to support. So now that we, well, hopefully if we get approval to the strategy today from full council, we'll, we'll approach the bank uh, in more formal terms and see if we can get those opportunities taken forward. But those are the kind of things that we think are, are likely to be supported. Uh, if I could just come back to the earlier points as well, I, I think that's, that's a very good point in terms of the importance of member training and support in relation to this. I appreciate it. It's quite a lengthy and detailed uh, set of information in front of members this morning. I think Councillor Jameson mentioned the seminar there, which I think probably would be helpful just to reinforce some of the training that members have previously had on this. So I'd be happy to support that. Thank you. Councillor Hislop. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the points Councillor Jameson and Driver have brought up, and yourself, with regard to a member training. I think that would be beneficial. I think maybe going back five, six years ago, we had a seminar on treasury management about assets and stuff and how they were put into the uh, their categories and how we looked at it against uh, borrowing money, etc. So I think that would be good to uh, and expand that. Now, it might be worthwhile if members get their thinking caps on any issues that they would like to have a, a bit of training on. If they could bring them forward, we could incorporate that into a, a plan for a training. The other thing was, it was just to move the recommendations as they are. I think the opportunities uh, to move into the MMF and the UK uh, Asset Bank that would be quite good. It gives us a chance to actually save a little bit of money or gain a bit of money. And I think that would be good for this council in these hard financial times. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hislop. On that basis, if there's no further questions. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, 2.3 there, and then if you you go to 4.19 in the papers, uh, talking about amendment to the capital investment strategy and the potential indicators in the treasury management strategy, um, are we, should we not be actually thinking about separating them out? Because I, I, I appreciate they go hand in hand, but they're two separate things, um, and I'm actually wondering there and. I, I see there's a bit there, depending on what happens later on in the agenda, and, and as, the, as the, the chief exec's uh, um, the reformation of the, uh, the council take, takes place, where it would report to, I, I totally get that bit. But I'm wondering whether the capital investment strategy and the treasury management strategy are two separate things. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Paul? They are separate things, but they're also very closely Connected, obviously, our treasury management strategy is driven by what we decide to, or what members decide to spend and borrow in terms of supporting capital investments. So we do typically take forward to the FPT committee detailed reports on our capital investment strategy, and then separately we take forward reports in terms of treasury management. But I think in terms of approving the overall strategy, which we do annually through full council, it's essential that we look at both the potential indicators and the capital investment strategy side by side. And that's effectively what reflected in this paper. But I do take on board the point that, in, in their own right, they're both significant pieces of work. But I think it is really important that they're looked at jointly when it comes to setting our Treasury strategy for the year. 
Uh, uh, th thanks, Kevin, for letting me back in. So I think, Paul, for what I'm picking up from you is there are two separate issues, but conjoined, right? You know, you, you can't really separate them out, but they should stu still be two separate documents. Uh, that's a, a two separate, you know, a, let's be clear, there, there are two different strategies, but they do work together. I, I, I've got that bit. Thank you. Councillor Marshall. Yeah, just a quick question on page uh, 47. It, it does state that uh, it allows for some flexibility for limited early borrowing. And then in the next paragraph, it says, this view takes into account current commitments, existing plans, and the proposals in the financial plans. Does that include projects such as, you know, Dumfries Academy in Lorburn? Paul, going to come in. Yes, it's, it's based on the, the Council's agreed capital investment strategy and as the projects you've mentioned there are reflected in that strategy, so it is fully linked to and based on that approved capital programme. Obviously, in terms of the timing of the investment there, that's, there's further work to be done to take that forward, but certainly we've built in that based on what members approved in February. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, yes, so I think 2.3... I think it doesn't really mention in there the capital investment strategy, and I'm, I, from what Councillor, what the conversation with Councillor Ferguson brought about was, I can see where there's, there is a kind of agree to note the first bit, which is about the monitoring, and then effectively 4.19 saying that we're, we're effectively agreeing the delegation FPT to make amendments in year to the capital investment strategy uh, uh, as required. But I think uh, I would be happier if that was more explicit in either the, that becoming a 2.4, and where appropriate, FP, agree that FPT can amend during the course of the upcoming financial year as detailed at 4.19. Just to make it, it's like sort of two things are combined there in the one, but it's like two separate things, and obviously acknowledging that FPT will become something else, presumably, as the transformation happens. So it's more just a tidy up exercise, but I wonder if that would be cleaner. Thank you. So basically what you're saying there, Stephen, is that you would like to take the first half of 2.3, you're going to note the potential indicators on Treasury management activities, subject normal and I think, where appropriate. And then a 2.4, where amendments can be made by the... Uh, yeah, so two, effectively they agree, but so 2.3 would be note, second bit would be agree that FPT would uh, be able to make amendments in year as per 4.19. Paul? Yes, I, I'm not sure if I, I fully understand the change, but I, I don't think it would cause any difficulties. Uh, I think what members are agreeing is the, the, the strategy and indicators today. And, and what you're, I think you're saying is you're, you're giving authority to the FPT committee or its replacement to, to amend that going forward. Have I picked you up right there? Yeah, thank you. And it's specifically because it doesn't mention the capital investment strategy in the recommendation, but clearly that's going to be part of the business going forward in year of the FPT committee or its successor, given what you've said about the Zero Waste Park, or these other capital projects, for example. Paul? Yes, I mean, I mean, the, the delegations to the FPT committee include uh, monitoring and amendment to the capital investment strategy. I think what we're saying here is that if that is the case, then the, the Treasury Management Activities and Prudential Indicators reflected in this strategy would be updated accordingly. So I, I, I have to admit, I, I think recommendation 2.3 is appropriate and sums up how we'll take things forward, but I don't think there's anything in the suggested changes that would cause us any great difficulties. I have to admit, I'm not 100% sure if I'm clear on exactly what's being asked for. Okay. Councillor Thompson, you want to come back? I, I must admit, I'm kind of agreeing with Paul here. I think I think it does cover it at the moment, but I understand you just want it to be a bit more explicit. Is that really what you're saying? Yeah, that, that's the kind of councillor I like, uh, convener, which is just one which is pretty clear on the front page. It just says, because the, the meat of this is going to be around the capital investment strategy, I suspect, but it's conspicuous by its omission in 2.3, not for any sort of dubious reason or whatever, it's just it would be helpful so that everybody knew, yet we're actually agreeing the uh, amendments to the capital investment strategy in year as per 4.19 are right there on the front page in what we've agreed. And I think that's just uh, upfront and obvious. That's just, just my personality, convener, but uh, it's, I'm not going to die in a ditch over it. Thank you. 
No, I, I'm, I'm quite happy. I'm quite happy to adopt your suggestion. If everyone else is happy, councillor Ryan. <clears throat> Maybe to, to help move it along here in, in two point three. Note that both the prudential indicators and treasury management activities, including the capital investment strategy, will be subject to continual monitoring at the appropriate um, future meeting, rather than FPT. There you go. Perfect. So we're happy to move forward on that basis. Thank you. Uh, now you keep flinging in curveballs here, Stephen. That's what. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we'll move to the recommendations. We're asked to 2.1 note that a review of the Treasury management strategy has been undertaken in conjunction with the Council's Treasury advisors and that the resultant recommendations have been incorporated into the 2024-25 strategy as detailed at paragraph 4.16 and 4.17. And 2.2, agree the Council's Treasury management strategy statement incorporating the prudential indicators and updated annual investment strategy for 2024-25 as detailed in Appendix 1. And 2.3, Councillor Dreiber, can you just give us your, just for the record, your word on again? So, note that both the prudential indicators and tre Treasury management activities, including the capital investment strategy, will be subject to continual monitoring at a FPT or whatever future meeting uh, am amendment during the course of the upcoming financial year, as detailed in 4.19. It's, it's just adding a few words that yep. clarifies that situation. Thank you. Have you, have you got that? We'll take the or whatever bit out there. We'll put the appropriate committee <laughs> instead. Thank you. So now we'll move on to item six. Account Commission's findings on best value in the Friesen Gallery Council, report by Chief Exec. The purpose of this report is to advise members of the Accounts Commission's findings from the Controller of Audit's statutory report on best value in the Fries and Galloway Council. Lorna Meehan, Director of Economy and Resources, is here to assist members with any questions. Can I have members' questions and contributions, please? Oh, Councillor McGregor. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I, I'll be brief, but I very much welcome this report. Uh, I, I think it highlights the, the great work that the Council does and, and that previous administrations have done as well. Um, on page 76, with the findings, it encapsulates, as I say, all the positive elements that, that have been viewed by the Accounts Commission over the last five years. We had a really good follow-up meeting with the Accounts Commission just a couple of weeks ago, and we'll obviously get an updated um, report from them at some point. That was a really constructive meeting with all group leaders uh, and gave us an, a, an opportunity to, to feed in where we're going with the recommendations, which I think are very much on track. So I'd just like to thank elected members for their input into that meeting and officers for their hard work of getting us a, a really positive best value audit and, and, and commend the finance team in particular for that. Thank you. Councillor Lowell. Thank you, Convener. Um, page 72, item 4.5 and the third uh, bullet point. I think it's just a wording thing because it looks like we've agreed a three-year budget that's absolutely fixed, but I believe it, we should really be saying indicative because we've set it for this year, we'll work with it, we'll try and run it for two years, but we haven't got a clue where funding is going to be in year two and year three. I'm just wondering, since this is a public paper, whether we should say that it's an indicative budget of savings because we don't know what's going to come at us in the next two years, three years. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Lona, would you like to make a comment on that? Yeah, that, thanks, Councillor Lowe. Um, if I draw attention to page 76, it's really a summary of the Accounts Commission's own words, not our words. So we're just making sure we're not um, amending them in any fashion. Um, but it's their words, um, not ours. OK, we any further questions? Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Thank you, Convener. Sorry. Good morning, members. Um, yep, great report. Don't have any issues um, on that one. And it's nice to reflect on the past as well as the present as well. Um, one issue to raise on page 76. Um, one, two, three, fourth paragraph down. Um, I'll just read a bit of that out. The Council's financial plans rely increasingly on transformation to new service models. And that's fine because change is always normally good. Um, we have a change in savings enabling team in the Council which is, um, we've budgeted 300,000K for. Um, it would be useful to know or feedback at some committees 
um, probably the new FPT in terms of how that's performing, because at the moment it hasn't realised any savings. So there is, whilst it's a good report, the Accounts Commission are saying there are some challenges here, and one of these is transformation, and one of these is achieving savings. So some clarity on that would be useful going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Warner, can you... Happy to do so, Councillor Dorward, and bring a report forward to the next appropriate committee. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any further comment or question? Councillor Hislop. Thank you, convener. Just a quick one. It's on page 73 at paragraph 4.6. I think it's the fourth one down, bullet point down, utilising the LGBF data to inform members. Now, my understanding, whenever we get this local government bench work, benchmark framework, what they actually tell us is, well, you can't really compare it with other councils because actually you're comparing apples with pears sometimes. Now, could we make sure that if we're getting benchmark data, that it's the same thing? Because we've seen it through the budget panel where um, there was one that came in of how we, I think we collected money against someone else and ours was higher than somebody else, but then actually it didn't include this, but it included that. So could we get a more robust LGBF, which gives us clear data rather than, well, actually, they do it this way, we do it that way? Thank you, Councillor Isabel. My, my recollection of, of this is that we actually... Uh, benchmark against a, a family group of councils, is, is that the case? Yeah, the, the local government benchmark and framework um, is operated um, with Improvement Service in COSLA with all 32 local authorities and provides for comparison over quite a considerable time now, up to 10 years, across a quite a wide range of data and measures. We do compare in family groups depending on the measure that could be related to rurality, um, for instance, or, or other measures as well. But what it's not intended to, to be is an exact comparison because it's about understanding and looking into those facts in more detail, whether it be around cost or performance or quality. So there, there are um, differences between local authorities because local authorities set their own policies on a number of areas, but it's really to um, prompt investigation and understanding. Um, but Councillor Hislop's point is um, a, a frustration, I think, which is shared um, around particularly around cost issues where there's real challenge about understanding um, cost inclusion and the sources of information for costs which are drawn from returns made to the Scottish Government um, for local government finance. So there are um, differences which I think have to be unearthed in, in looking at things in more detail. We'll certainly feed back those comments to uh, colleagues who are supporting Improvement Service and Local Government Benchmark and Framework. Thank you. Do we have any further questions or comment? No. So we'll move to the recommendations. Member asked 2.1. Consider the findings from the Controller of Audit Statutory Report on Best Value in the Freezing Gallery Council attached as the appendix to this report. 2.2. Note the uh, Council Commission will be advised of the steps that the Council has agreed to take to respond to the findings and publish a required public notice following full Council consideration. So we're happy to consider a note. Thank you. Item 7, the Freezing Gallery Council Net Zero Target Report by Director of Economy and Resources. This report asks members to consider the Council's current Net Zero Target of 2025 as agreed at full Council on the 27th of June 2019 and amend the Net Zero Target in line with considerations highlighted within this report. Sarah Farrell, Climate Emergency Project Officer, is available on Microsoft Teams to assist members with any questions. And I know, as a member of the, 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 the climate group, we've, we've discussed this quite extensively. Councillor Driver? Yeah, th thanks, Convener. I, I think, you know, the Cross Party Working Group has had a briefing on this from Simon and Sarah um, uh, a couple of weeks ago on, on the Friday. And, and while the, the importance of 2025 was the, 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 you know, the, the cross-party working group seen it as an opportunity to try and get as much done as possible to, to get to net zero, there has been, over the last number of years, 
a huge amount of um, research done and, and, and data gathering from not just ourselves but from other other councils as well. And when you look at some of the things that are happening, and I'm going to say it, Stephen, APSI uh, Energy, um, you know, there, there, there has been some real concerns about some of the issues with regards to local authorities in Scotland, for instance. So to replace the, the fleet, for instance, of, of waste vehicles for the whole 32 local authorities, that's going to cost something like three billion quid to electric vehicles. There's also within that, you know, issues around the area of, of what's the infrastructure that's required to change to electric vehicles. So you've got your, your charging things and all that. Now, we do have funding um, from le levelling up and things like that about all this, and, and we want to try and get to net zero as quickly as, as possible. Um, but that data is really important for us to understand where people are practising or piloting projects and getting that information back as quickly as, as possible. So that data should be sought and, and, and you know, where, where we make decisions to try and reduce to zero, that, that, that's really important. As I said before, I think the 2025 target was absolutely correct to focus the mind on what we could do within it. And there's been a lot of good work in the council, especially in the facilities management teams in schools and things like that. We, we had a report at the cross-party working group before. I would love to see, you know, 20, 2025 as that opportunity, but I don't think we're going to get there. We're, we're, we're sort of, you know, a quarter of the way through 2024 at the moment, and, and you know, we're not where. I think opportunities are, are, are endless, especially with the UK infrastructure bank that we met, met, mentioned earlier on, the opportunities for that. But, you know, there, there is, I mean, obviously within the cross-party working group, there is there's concern that we haven't met the target. But we understand why. We've, we, we deal with all these, these things all the time. So I'm, I'm happy to go with the recommendation, making sure we have a council target, then we have a, a, a region target as well. Because we can't do it in Dumfries and Galloway on our own. We need all of our uh, citizens to, to help us reach that, that, that target of zero. Not to, not, not to forget, of course, that both our governments have changed their targets as well and increased the date on, on, on that as well. So I'm happy to go with the, the recommendations, but I am disappointed that we haven't you know, had the amount of carbon reduction we'd like to have seen within that particular time. Uh, thank you, Councillor Drybra. Uh, Councillor Beretti. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm not going to mention APSI, so don't worry. Uh, first off, I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to thank, actually, Councillor Dougie Campbell and all the elected members who, uh, way back in 2018-2019, managed to get the first targets up and running. Yes, they've not been reached, and I doubt very much that we will reach it by 2025, but we have actually made over 50% reduction, which is tremendously good considering what's happened in the last three, four years. I think also that the new approach that Simon and Sarah have looked at and done an immense amount of work on is the correct approach of having a tiered structure to 2033. Now that is going to take in other geopolitical events. We can't, we can't stop them. They're going to happen and they're going to have an impact on us. But we have got all the necessary technology and all the necessary brains in Dumfries and Galloway, whether it's in the, cal in the council or within the region, to drive that reduction forward and get to zero by 2023 and beyond. So I'm very happy with what they've done and I would recommend these, these recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor John Campbell. Uh, thanks, uh, Convener. Yeah, uh, I, I can remember it well when we decided to make 2025 the uh, target. It was quite ambitious, and I think most of us at the time even realised that. I suppose uh, one of the questions would be that uh, because it was an ambitious target, it, it did focus the minds of trying to get this reduction. It would be interesting, I don't know if Simon's got any details, but uh, it would be interesting to find out uh, with other councils who have got... 2030, 2045, whether they have actually achieved similar sort of, uh, reductions in, in carbon. Uh, Councillor Driver is absolutely right. Uh, much, much of the emissions uh, within the region are out with you know, our direct control as a council. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that, that goes forward. But yeah, I totally agree. We should separate out the two, uh, have the council's target and have a region-wide target. I, I suppose makes complete sense in my view. The only other point I, w I want to raise, Convener, is that uh, we did set up 
uh, a citizen's panel. I've just wondered how did they feed into this report because there's actually no mention about that in here and I'm sure they've probably come up with a few ideas themselves. Thanks, convener. Thank you. I, the citizens panel was drawn to my attention as well and I've, I've asked for the feedback from that. Sarah, can you help us with that? Thanks, convener. Yeah, the citizens panel was uh, very successful. We carried out across the region. We have got feedback from the citizens panel, and we're working through that feedback at the moment. Uh, the the panel was set up to to feed into the um, route map to net zero, and we will be, as I say, considering the feedback on that report towards uh, the next iteration of that. We will be coming back to our future committee with um, an update. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, do we have any comparators with other, other local authorities, similar local authorities? We have um, the, the different dates, which I think is in the report, that other authorities have um, put, put their targets on to be net zero. Uh, we don't have a comparison of other authorities, how they are achieving that as yet, but we can certainly look into that and, and bring something back to committee again. Thank you. Can I bring in Councillor Dougie Campbell? Thank you, convener, and good morning, members. Um, it, it was it was myself that introduced the the climate emergency declaration and the the twelve point plan and the, the establishment of the the, the working group. Um, and there's been a lot of great work uh, done by Sarah, um, Simon, uh, and indeed the the working group. In terms of the, the 2025 date, um, I think it was based on the information we had at the, at the time, and it did appear as though it, it was very ambitious, but it would be achievable. Uh, however, a lot has changed since then. Um, yeah, we had the, 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 um, the pandemic and also the, the, the war in Ukraine, the, the climate crisis, the, sorry, the the cost of living crisis uh, and, and so on. Uh, I fully support the, the the report in terms of adjusting the dates, and it was actually myself that raised that uh, as a as a, a proposal to to take forward. Um, I think, though, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about us losing um, some momentum, and certainly the 2025 date did provide that momentum, and I don't think we'd be where we are today in terms of. 50% uh, reduction, but the hardest part is ahead of us. Um, we're, we're working on the, the low-lying fruit at the moment, but it's going to be more difficult, and we're relying on technological advances uh, and, and so on. Uh, and what I would I would like the the full council to consider is that, uh, and it's something we're discussing later on the, the housing subcommittee, that perhaps we consider a, a climate and environment subcommittee to provide that um, regular oversight of how the, 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 the Council is, is progressing, but also to, to widen out um, understanding of the, the work that we're progressing to uh, uh, more councillors. Um, and I'm not proposing that as a recommendation, but I just think it, we, we should be thinking about it, and perhaps we could have a, a commitment to some point in the near future to have it on the agenda for the leaders panel. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds quite a good suggestion to me. But, uh, did you want to come in, Lorna? Yes, yeah, so just um, it was just in relation to the comments Councillor Campbell made. And, and one of the challenges we have um, in comparisons and measurement around climate change nationally um, is about consistent information. and. COSLA and um, a Scottish Government are, are establishing um, a new climate intelligence um, service to be able to build that consensus. We've done a lot of work locally to, to get benchmark information and, and base it on best practice, but to get a consistent um, comparison across local authorities and other agencies is, is a real focus for the work just now. So we will bring that back to members when it's available. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, I, I, I mean, I know Dougie passionately uh, pursued this in the last council and, and, and in this one. Um, we have some very able lieutenants working alongside him, I have to say. Uh, 
One of the, it's no problem I've got here because I don't think anybody can fault the work that's been done. Is, is it, but if, if, if you can like this, how did we find America? You know, we found the Canaries first, then we found the Azores, then we found the West Indies, then we found the, the, the North American, you know, and the Vikings did it the other way around, it was piece by piece. We don't have a thing in here uh, that actually shows us the journey, um, because if a lot of the work has been done in the first five, or four or five years of, of this um, is recognised, it's dangerous, it gets stuck in the back burner and people don't know just how far we've actually come. Uh, so I, what I'm suggesting is is, is, is there a way we can illustrate that journey? Um, please don't use a car, um, maybe use a sailboat um, on, on the journey um, to, to where we want to be. and just. So there's a measure for future generations about how we actually got to where we are. I think that's th because you're, we're making history here. Right? That's, there's no doubt about that. So we need to document it so that future generations are really aware of what we did, how we did it, um, and the outcomes and, and the bonuses of, of what we've done. Um, and I, I think that that's where my only suggestion on this whole report is how do we sell that story better? Thank you. And I think that the, at the last uh, climate group meeting as well, there was discussion around phased targets as well to try and keep the keep the keep the pressure on it. Uh, Councillor Dorward. Thank you, convener. I think it's always good to be an ambitious council, um, and climate targets have been demonstrated as being a movable feast. Unfortunately. I would ask how achievable are the new targets we're proposing to set, and also add on to that we are in a national emergency. So talking and not doing anything isn't good enough. I'm not saying we haven't done anything, but we haven't done enough as a council. We're not doing enough as a region collectively to address these. It's a national emergency. It's not just something that we need to put on the back burner, pardon the pun. We're not doing any worse, though, than Scottish Government, because the climate, strategy watch, the climate watchdog warned a couple of weeks ago it is now impossible for Scottish ministers to meet their ta legal target of reducing emissions by 75% by 2030, after Scotland missed eight of its past 12 annual emissions targets. So collectively, in local government, in national government, and in Westminster, we're not doing enough, I don't think. So I think we need to be looking at how we can push that boat out a little bit further and do a little bit more. And I think Councillor Campbell, Dougie Campbell's suggestion of having a subcommittee is a really useful one, so we can keep a constant eye on this, because it isn't something we can just push back and keep pushing back and pushing back and saying, oh, COVID was responsible or, you know, we've got um, a cost of living crisis or we've got whatever's going on, you know, we can't do any more because of that. We need to look at how we can do something. And one of the things I would ask about is LUF monies. So I think LUF monies, investment coming from Friesen Galloway is fantastic. LUF money is fantastic. But only 10% of these have been released from Westminster. So when is LUF money coming in for the electric charging, for the electric vehicles and the charging. That's something that will help us tremendously. And I know, Leader, that you suggested, you know, in, in November 2023, that we must use this to address, um, use sustainable, environmentally friendly tra transport options to accelerate our drive to be a net zero carbon emission region. So I think we need to push the government on getting that money in to do this. So eight years for Dumfries and Galloway, another eight years to achieve council to achieve net zero emissions is hopefully doable, but we need to monitor that really, really closely. 21 years for the region is really disappointing, but probably something that's hopefully achievable. But it's disappointing that we're taking this long to do anything. Um, but unfortunately, it matches both Scottish governments and Westminster's moving the dial on this. So I think what we need to do is pressure government to get monies in to help us, but also look to be a leader as opposed to a follower in this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And it's not only a national crisis, it's an inter international <laughs> crisis, worldwide crisis. Um, Councillor McGregor, you wanted to come in. Thank you. I think quite a lot of the points that I was going to mention have been covered. <clears throat> Councillor Dorwards mentioned the, the Climate Change Committee's findings. Lorna's covered the Climate Intelligence Service, which I think is really important. It's a piece of joint work between local government, Scottish government and climate experts at the University of Edinburgh. And it's going to give us a, a really good data-rich and, and you know, an analysis 
platforms that we can do that benchmarking and, and ensure that, that we're all looking sideways, left, right, upwards and downwards at what other authorities are doing. I think one thing that we, we've got to be is ambitious, absolutely, Doogie. Don't dispute that for a moment. But we do also have to accept that we're dealing with national factors, um, UK-wide factors. We know that Scottish Government have delayed their Climate Change Action Plan a couple of times. Um, we know that the Biodiversity Action Plan has been delayed a couple of times. We've got the Circular Economy Bill going through um, Scottish Parliament at the moment. There's a lot of factors out there that we have no control over. So I think what we need is a good route map for Dumfries and Galloway, but it will have to be a flexible route map depending on what policies come out from Scottish Government or UK Government. And I'll certainly follow up on the Luff funding. My understanding was that funding had come from UK Government for some of the EV infrastructure that we have in Dumfries and Galloway, but certainly if there's more, um, I, I will ask for it. But I think we have to understand that we can be ambitious as a region, um, but national policy will also dictate some of the things that we can do and that finance will have to come with it because there's no way that, that we can make those steps that we need to make without proper resource and skills and capacity. So there's a lot of factors there, but um, you wouldn't expect me as an environment spokesperson not to be highly passionate about this. What we need is a route map at some point, and I think perhaps a subcommittee that targets that would be really helpful. Thank you, Leader. As a, a first-time speaker, I'm going to bring in councillors Slater before we come back to second-time speaker. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I welcome the report. I actually sit in at the Climate Emergency Committee, but the problem we have here is obviously not just ourselves, it's national. And the fact is we don't have the infrastructure. Uh, the national grid needs upgraded. It's estimated it could cost as much as 60 billion to run in new cables and pylons and that. So we're kind of stuck here in some ways. If you don't have the infrastructure in by the third parties, like obviously Spen Energy and companies like that, uh, sometimes it's just simple projects. It takes a long time to get the infrastructure there to get connections to the grid. And also, a lot of the charging points are only the small charging. It would take six hours to charge a normal car. So we need a lot more fast chargers, but we need to move, the government obviously need to move things forward, and the energy companies need to move things forward as well to get in more infrastructure in place so that the council can move forward. That's really my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It is important that we, obviously, that we we uh, work with partners to make this make this possible, and it's it's the only way we're going we're going to achieve it. Bring in Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Convener. No, I welcome the report. Um, the caveat to all this is at 4.9, the council's ability, their own ability, to reduce carbon emissions. We only emit less than one percent of the region's carbon emissions when we have and hold 48% of the nation's dairy herd, you know, what was, is in with our own control to reduce is, is pretty limited. So I would say that, um, that the new trajectory towards net zero is a, a fair, sensible and measured report um, and, and far more realistic than the, the 2025 date so I would welcome the report and move to the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring in Councillor Beretti again? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, first off, um, I actually liked what uh, Councillor Campbell said about the Climate and Emergency Subcommittee, and I think that is something that should be investigated to see if we can draw it in. Secondly, we should be thinking about what this region and this council can do, irrespective of what whatever parliament, whether it's in Edinburgh or in Westminster, because those factors are like the, the, the climate, they change. So therefore, we need to concentrate on what we can do, and we have that skill in this region to make those changes. So that is what we should be concentrating on, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Diggy Campbell. Yeah, thanks for letting me back in, convener. A uh, couple of points. Um, one of the, the strengths of the Climate Emergency Declaration and the working group was cross-party support. And I think uh, there was only one voice, uh, I'll not mention the name, but there was one voice who, who wasn't perhaps as supportive as the 42 other councillors. Um, 
the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the discussion that we're having around uh, a, a, sub, a potential subcommittee, I think, has highlighted to me why it, it is a, a, the right direction to go in, because we do actually have a strategic route map, and departments right across the council have action plans on reducing emissions. Um, and I, I, you know, I mentioned earlier about the, the um, cost of living crisis, pandemic. I think you know, and you know, and include everybody here. Uh, perhaps not councillors who were elected in 2022, but I think we all lost sight of it. Um, and one of the strengths of a subcommittee will be that we could receive regular reports from departments on how they are progressing, and we can monitor that. And I think that will really address some of the concerns that have been expressed about um, the achievability of the new targets that we're setting. Uh, I think it would be a much more effective way to scrutinise the work that's going through. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree entirely. I think the, you know, the, the, a climate subcommittee would be an excellent idea. But equally, we're proposing to set this target here, this, this timeline here, and it would be sensible and prudent going forward to bring regular reports back to monitor progress towards achieving that, and maybe even potentially to shorten it if that was that was possible. You know, and I think that would be a very useful thing. Uh, Councillor Slater, you want to back in, and then we'll go to the recommendations. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've raised this before uh, regarding the river and the amount of water that pours over the call every year, millions of gallons or millions of litres. Uh, there used to be a generator on the call, and the, the, the sluice gates are still there. But this is many years ago, and obviously, as time went by, electricity companies came in, and uh, the electricity used to supply from the from the generator used to supply to Quia, uh, and I, I think the other place, but. The thing is, I believe that should be looked at because modern technologies come on in leaps and bounds. And you can get what they call low head turbines. And if that was feasible and it was built, it would put the face on the map, would be in the way out in front as regards zero waste. You could actually, zero, net zero. And you could actually uh, generate that power to run your own buildings here. And I think that if you built it and it was feasible, as soon as you turned that switch on, it would start generating money back to our region and our council. And one other point uh, as regarding net zero, I believe it's advertised on television now as well. Rolls-Royce are working in small nuclear reactors that take up very small space and could be strategically placed across the country. And I believe that will have to happen because wind power and water power won't be enough at the end of the day. So we need some backup. Uh, and nuclear power has got a lot safer. And you can build possibly three within the size of a big football stadium. So that's my question. Why? <laughs> oh, I'll leave you in peace now. <laughs> uh, I think it's more a kind of a comment. And I think, I think that's the kind of work that the Climate Committee and would potentially be looking at. Uh, Councillor Thompson, seeing as you know, let me get to the recommendations. Well, uh, just to help speed it on its way, uh, happy to support the recommendations, uh, and I think the climate subcommittees um, sounds like gets agreement across the chamber, which is good. Um, but it was just really in terms of a process. So, if we agree that we can establish one, but the details of that would go through the regular um, process in terms of review of standing orders, because obviously we've not sort of bottomed out as full delegations or whatever. So, but. We can set set sail on that journey, convener. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll be agreeing to consider because it would have to go through yeah. Rosso. So that I think that's the way forward with that. Councillor Lowe and then Councillor Ian Crothers. Mine's a really practical point that in recommendations two, 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 three, and two, four, that the paragraph numbers are incorrect, so they will need correcting. Yeah, we picked, we picked that bit up, Councillor Ian Crothers. Just to add an ad hoc, potential of an ad hoc committee as well, as well as sub, it, just to add that in the mix for Rosal. Thank you. Thank you. We're just having a, a check at these paragraph numbers, because we did notice at 2.4, it said 4.34 and it's 4.33, so by definition 2.3 can't be right either, because it's, 
4.2, 64 .33, so just bear with us a second. Maybe if I come back, it should actually read. Well, two, perhaps. Is that 2.2 .2 is um, 4.1 to 4.24, 2.3 is 4.25 to 4.32, and 2.4 is 4.33. Yeah, thank you. So that, that's fine. So we're just going to go to the recommendations on this one. 2.1, note that the current net zero target of 2025, as previously agreed, has helped to prioritise and focus resources and actions on carbon reductions. 2.2, note the desktop research on net zero targets as outlined in paragraphs 4.1 to 4.24. And 2.3, agree that the current target, whilst ambitious, needs to be amended to reflect changes in funding, techno funding technology and resources as outlined in paragraphs 4.25 to 4.32 and 4.4 consider the recommended changes proposed in paragraph 4.33 and a new 2.5 consider the establishment of a climate change subcommittee so we'll be happy to note one two four agree three and agree four as well could, could we just very quickly could, could, Campbell, could, yeah. could I be a bit pedantic here but could it be the climate and environment subcommittee because they, they, they do work in tandem with each other Perfect. We're just, we're just kind of making that one up a bit on the hoof. <laughs> so, so thanks for that. So we'll now move on to item eight, council plan delivery, report by the chief executive. This report provides, provides members with an end of year position on the council plan delivery for 2023-24 and presents actions to deliver on council plan outcomes during the year 2024-25. Lorna Meehan, Director, Economy and Resources, Heather Carnican, Business Intelligence Manager and Council Directors are available on Microsoft Teams or in the room to assist members with any questions on this report. I now invite members' questions and contributions. Councillor Dreibler. Thank, thanks, Convener. And, you know, the, the, this is a, a report on, on, you know, the position of the Council's delivery plan 23-24. And, and there are a few things in it that if I can go through just to, to, to ask, ask questions on this particular thing. On, on, on um, page 20, for instance, um, there, there is a, um, a triangle. And now we've put in place the opportunity for people to do the training. Some people haven't come forward, and we can't force people to come forward. So is that really a triangle? Or, you know, that's one of the things. Um, I would like to ask about um, the, the Borderlands Business Infrastructure Investment Programme with the three sites in Annan, Castle Douglas and Newton Stewart, and where are, are we with them? We've just discussed the net zero side of things, and on page 31, the local, uh, the LHEs, we're, we're working in partnerships with, and officers have been diverted in that particular thing on page 31. So does that have a knock-on effect then to the net zero target? Um, that we, we just mentioned. The digital service re, uh, redesign in page 32. Do we know how this is going if we're, if we're looking for a, a massive improvement? Now, the reason I'm asking that on that particular one, Chair, is um, when I was at seminar last week, the Commissioner for Roads Scotland was here. Uh, and and he'd, done, he'd done a bit of a data search. And the local authorities have been actually brilliant at looking at utilities and, and, and road um, defect remedies right, on utilities. And the standard went from 40% pass to a 90% pass over a number of years. That's because local authorities were looking at utility uh, re, re, um, um, improvements on, on their um, work on road defect repairs. However, we hadn't been looking at ourselves. Now, from the 1st of, March, the 1st of April this year, he has going to have the opportunity to see a local authorities, road departments, um, road defects repairs, and if they're not their standard, can give a hundred thousand pound fine. So you know, we should have been looking at ourselves as well over that period of time, we're looking at utilities, and we have seen the complaints of road repairs go up in in, in the council. We've also seen the responses to those road repair defects 
being advised that it's, it's not appropriate, you know, we'll, we'll bung you on the list that we've already got, isn't an appropriate response as far as, you know, elected members are concerned. So there's, there's, there's three or four issues there, Chair, that I just want to consider. But the first one is, is we've done that one, why is it, why is it you'll add? The other, the other three are about how are we getting on with that? Thank you, Lorna. Thanks, Councillor Dryber. I'll attempt to answer the majority of that, and colleagues might come in, I think, probably on the last point particularly um, to add to that. Um, in terms of um, the, the buttons or the kind of signals there around the um, Midas minibus train and, and support for local businesses, we do think we're going to continue to try and make further progress on that. So it's not that we've, we've not carried out the action as you've described, that's right but we think there's more to come around that as well, to offer that as well. So that was our assessment, that we've, we've got some further work to do around that. In terms of business infrastructure, we will bring a report either through the next DNR committee or indeed full council. Um, and as the report indicates, and as I think there's some of the discussion last year at full council, there are some challenges around um, securing the sites. Um, very different reasons in all the sites, um, but there, are, there is some further um, decisions for members to make there, which we will bring forward. I'm happy to discuss them in more detail with members when that comes forward. In terms of the work, and, and Sarah's um, just been offline now, um, in terms of the Ellis um, work. So that work was commissioned Scotland-wide by all 32 local authorities to carry that work out. It was very challenging. Um, Economy and Resources Committee approved the um, Dumfries and Galloway lease. Um, in November, um, and that's been delivered and in place. But what it what it did show is that we've got very um, limited resources um, across many services, but particularly around um, some of the development that we can take forward on um, different energy schemes, particularly things like district heating schemes and some of the projects that are currently commissioned and, and underway. But we almost had to divert resources to focus on the delivery of the LEs, which was a statutory obligation. Um, and indeed, see us back online, but we're, we're, we're fo we focus back on the, the projects that are in here to get further momentum around them. Um, and they do link to, the, to that, that new strategy as well, so they're, they're embedded in it, but it's not necessarily made the progress that we wanted to and members agreed to as well. I'll touch on the digital service redesign in the broadest sense. I'm not going to comment on the detail around roads. Um, there will be an update to members, I think, tomorrow or tonight on the roads um, website um, pages which have been developed um, with further um, in information about further sort of um, processes and um, transactions that the public can carry out that are coming through um, around that and it's broader than roads, it's around uh, parking and traffic management infrastructure as well. So there's been quite a lot of progress there. I won't comment in terms of the, the actual defects and reporting of that and, and other matters, but we've still got work to do around that. Um, but there has been further progress and we'll continue to update members as we, we launch next parts of the, the website, which are coming um, in the next few days. Can I just bring in Derek Crichton for an update on some of the road stuff? Yeah, thank you, convener, morning members. And as uh, Lauren has indicated, uh, we're on a journey of improvement. And uh, therefore, firstly, we're well aware that there's progress to be made. But as we've indicated next week, uh, heralds a significant move forward when we introduce uh, the improved customer relationship management system, which we believe will be a, a significant breakthrough in terms of both the, the, the speed and the quality of responses the public will receive, but also elected members as well. So we'll closely monitor that. There'll be an opportunity to discuss that in detail at Communities Committee next week. And obviously, we'll monitor the, the volume of inquiries. We'll we will monitor the, the, uh, the public responses, the satisfaction levels, and we'll continue to do more around the whole digital connectivity that's so important. In terms of the utilities uh, and the, the implications of not doing things uh, correctly, uh, officers uh, are very uh, aware of that. And through the National Body Scots, dialogue continues. But uh, more than happy, uh, A, it's something we can discuss. There are reports at Communities Committee that we could easily touch on that in more detail. Or if it's felt more helpful, happy to bring a specific report uh, to the Communities Committee in the future. Thanks, convener. Thank you, Derek. Councillor Walters. 
Thanks, convener. Um, just following up on the, the roads, but I've also got another question as well. So um, on page 28, the additional 70 frontline roads operatives. I thought that was a pretty impressive number, actually. I just wondered, um, where are, they, are those new positions? Because I, th I thought the last time we discussed this, we were talking about an additional 25, 30. Um, so I'd be interested to see, uh, are those actual positions at the moment and is this part of the thing that's going to happen next month my second question is at the bottom of page 29 where it says communities are protected from the impact of floods uh, i can't see any mention there of the white sands flood protection scheme um, and there's mention of other flood protection schemes so i uh, i just wonder where whereabouts in the document it was because it is part of the council plan presumably thanks Thank you. Derek, can you help out about the roads operatives? Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, clearly my understanding is we've recruited uh, a large increased number of operatives, but uh, I'm quite clear that I would wish to clarify that before committing to that figure. I'll do that offline uh, if that's acceptable to the member, because quite clearly for the public record we want to be a uh, point of accuracy. So we'll do that. Uh, I think the reason for the no mention of the White Sands is purely because it was a specific uh, uh, position on Newton Stewart in terms of publishing the scheme, but reassure officers that uh, the works continue as previously agreed uh, in terms of White Sands, and that reports through Communities Committee. Thank you. Councillor Little. Is it, is it possible to come back on that a moment? Um, just, just quickly, Keith, yeah. Well, just, just on the White Sands position, I, I, I can't quite see why it's not included if Newton Stewart and Stranraer are. I, I, can, you just cl can we just clarify that, and the, whether it is included in the council plan or not? I, th I think from what Derek's saying, it is included in the plan. This was just in relation to those, because it's agreed to take it forward. So is, is that the position on the flood scheme, Derek? Thank you, Gunnar. I'll defer to colleagues, but uh, as I understand it, what we have in front of us here is what's in the plan, and uh, I see 8182 uh, mentioned Newton Stewart, Stranraer, uh, and 83 uh, talks in the broader position on resilience, so I'll defer to colleagues. Thank you, Lorna. I think we can help with this. So, um in terms of White Sands, I think through last year, members took um, clear action and clear decisions about the next steps on that project. And at the time the delivery plan was prepared, those clear steps and actions that to progress hadn't been determined. So that explains why it wasn't in there. Just to reassure members, it does feature in the council plan as part of the overall flood protection outcomes. And indeed, in the proposed 24-25 plan, there is a, an Action 46, which is very much focused on the White Sands. Thank you. Councillor Little. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's regarding the delivery of the one-off funding lift for the twinning. Um, I thank officers for addressing that issue. Toot sweet, so thank you very much for that. But I do notice it's not in the Council delivery plan. So can I have on record that this will actually be added to that? Thank you. I think that's for the coming year. Am I right in saying this report reflects last year's? It has both conveners. So if members were minded to, to reflect that in it, then officers will add that in. Thank you. So that will be added. Councillor Ian Crowley, do you want to come in? I would just say it was Action 46 in the Appendix D delivery plan, but Lorna covered it. Thank you. Thank you. Have we got Councillor John Campbell? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Yeah, on page uh, 67, uh, reference uh, 37, uh, the implement of the Dumfries and Galloway parking strategy, uh, there's a wee omission there, uh, and we do have it coming to communities, which is the decriminalisation of uh, parking enforcement. Uh, so th that that be omission there it is our delivery planning. We have taken that through uh, the committee stages, and it will be separated from the, the parking strategy, I believe, uh, in the upcoming report for communities. So if, if we'd like to add that in its separation, that uh, decriminalisation of parking is added to the delivery plan, probably just next to that page number or 
or whatever, as you yourself, uh, convener, and uh, the other ward, uh, Nith ward members, when we go to Lorburn Community Council, we're inundated with uh, you know the, the the parking, and and I think we've all sort of agreed that we would take that forward. Thanks, convener. Yeah, we've all got the scars. Are you happy to? Yeah, Lorna said she's happy to to agree to take that forward. So, uh, Councillor Slater. So it's okay. Uh, my questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Low. Thank you. Page 22, item 3.9, the support for the resettlement programme. Um, discussions continue with Scottish Government. It actually should be really Scottish and the UK Government because we've had the input recently with the um, Afghan refugees at the Mercure. And also just to ask how we're going with actually getting our money back in making sure that that's redressed. Um, and also, page 30, item 10.1, the recycling rates. I know it's a bit of an ongoing conversation to be sure it's recorded that we need some better public media in terms of, you know, out on our um, Facebook post posts about how much it costs to recycle waste. If we don't, how much goes to landfill? What does that cost us? Just for that to be part of our active um, recycling targets. Thanks. Thank you. I think Chief Executive's uh, telling me she's quite happy happy to add the UK to the. It's in the it's in the heading, but we'll add it to the to the paragraph as well. So, and on the waste recycling, can someone, oh, Lona? Happy to take that way as a, an action um, with the comms team and the waste team, um, Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Councillor Ian Blake. Thank you, Convener. Uh, it was in relation to the question that was raised earlier about the number of, of road staff. Uh, I, I'm aware that Derek's going to wait and he's going to check that number. My understanding is that that is the total number that we envisage. It's a 50% increase. It went from around 50 odd to 70 odd. Uh, but I, I think that that'll be the, the correct information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Convener. A number of the points I was going to raise have been covered, but I was going to suggest, in the same way as we did last time, uh, there's a couple of amendments which I can send on to um, Governance Support, uh, but it was around, particularly, um, Councillor Little raised it, just to make it articulated in the plan about supporting those twin in commemorations, um, which we did agree at, in December. Also, the um, uh, items 37, which Councillor Campbell had already raised, just about adding a, a line specific to implementing uh, DPE, um, which I think we've taken on board, um, but just to formalise that. And then an additional item I was going to suggest in terms of an allocation of 30% annual allocation from Coastal Communities Fund to maintain and improve coastal footpaths and infrastructure, which has been well aired in these chambers, um, but, and is also a line in the narrative for the budget, but obviously that's up to the Council to decide how to take that forward. And also an additional item to prioritise fast EV chargers uh, with a reasonable time limit for slow and fast charging bays in council car parks. Happy to put that in as a amendment or happy to take that up through the leaders' panel if that's maybe a more appropriate way to do that. I don't think it's particularly controversial, any of these, but we did have similar discussions last year about how to, to add those. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there is any controversy there. I, I do think the leaders' panel is probably the, the best option to take it forward if you're happy with that, Councillor Tolton. Councillor Driver, did you want to come back in? Yeah, Chair, it was just on page 50, um, and it was about the extension of free school meals to all primary school children. It was, you know, the, the we were looking at primary six. We've got primaries through to one to five, but we're looking at primary six. And there are discussions. I'm just wondering if there's an update on where that is with local authorities and Scottish Government with that dialogue, um, because obviously it's going to be important to young people to get that education and having a good, good meal on that particular day. Uh, is also good for their education, which is just exactly where we are at the moment, basically. Thank you. Lorna, can you help out with that? There's been a, a recent um, further distribution of capital investment for um, school catering facilities, um, and the Council has been awarded some money from that, Council Driver, but I'll get you a, a further update and share with all members on um, the current position around the extension of the free school meals. Thank you. I have no further question or comment. We'll move to the recommendations. 
Members are asked to point one, consider and agree the end of year report and position for the Council Plan Delivery 2023-24 at Appendix 1 and related case studies at Appendix 2. 2.2, subject to 2.1, agree that summary public reporting on 2023-24 delivery on the Council Plan is published on the Council website and 2.3, agree the Council Plan annual delivery for 2024-25 included at Appendix 3. Are we happy to agree? 1 to 3 with the... Are we taking an, an action forward to insert these items, or are we just are we putting that in the recommendation? I'll take the advice of governance, but I mean, just I think we've, we've agreed to take it forward in the appropriate way, whether that's leaders' panel or whatever. So if we can just record that, if that's okay. Yeah, through yourself, convener. Uh, yes, uh, I, I've noted it, and uh, governance officers have noted it in terms of um, I, I've got four actions. Uh, Yep, one, two, three, four actions uh, in total. Uh, 3.9, uh, which was mentioned in terms of adding that uh, UK government, um, the the waste recycling uh, promotion, uh, and uh, the costs associated with that, um, the decriminalisation uh, also to be added, uh, and the twin uh, element of it as well to be added. Uh, so we'll, we'll put that within the actions. Uh, for officers to take forward. So that, that's been recorded from our end and that'll be in the action tracker. Okay, and the additional items that I mentioned to take forward through the leaders panel, potentially, yeah. Chief. Okay. Thank you, yeah. So as, as we did last year, members, any suggestions for additions into the council plan deliverables for the year ahead? The route uh, we took last year was through the leaders panel and then it came back to full council for endorsement. And I'd suggest that because there hasn't necessarily been um, a, a decision around that previously, that that's the preferred route rather than it being agreed today. So if we can follow the same route that we took last year, that would be really helpful and there'd be a, an amendment to the council plan delivery um, in due course through full council once there's been full consideration through leaders panel. Thank you. So now we move on to item nine, the schemes review, scheme of delegation and responsibilities to officers and statutory appointments, report by head of governance and assurance. This report asks members to consider recommendations from the review of standing order subcommittee and to agree amendments to the council's scheme of delegation and responsibility to officers <laughs> and statutory appointments, referred to as the scheme. Vlad Valiente, Head of Governance and Assurance, and Mark Thompson, Risk and Assurance Business Manager, are here to assist members with any questions. I now invite members' questions and contributions. No. No, just agreed. We'll just move to the recommendations then. Members are asked to agree at 2.1, the amended scheme of delegation and responsibilities to officers and statutory appointments as detailed in appendices 1 and 2, and 2.2, to carry out a review of the updated scheme of delegation and responsibility to officers and statutory appointments after an initial 12-month period. So we're we happy to agree 1 and 2. Thank you. Item 10, schemes review, scheme of administration and delegation to committees, report by Head of Governance and Assurance. This report asks members to consider recommendations from the review of standing orders subcommittee and to agree amendments to the Council's scheme of administration and delegation to committees, referred to as a scheme. We also have to consider voting rights of non-elected members. Vlad Valiente, Head of Governance and Assurance, and Claire Rogerson, Senior Governance Officer, are here to assist members with any questions. Councillor Drybra. Th thanks, Convener, and, and you know, this is... Uh this is the step forward for the um, move to whatever the new structures and committees are actually going to be. I think over uh, the last couple of years we've 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 put our position clear on what the restructure is um, uh, and whether we support that or not. But it's it's moving forward at the end of the day. And I, 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 to, to come to the simple one, I don't have any issue with voting rights for you know um, for. Um, the the, the, the the faiths or whatever because you know they've not, they've hardly ever used it so what's the point of removing it basically as far as I'm concerned um, but on 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 the actual review or the scheme of delegation itself we're going to be moving into a position where there's going to be you know we've already seen agendas 21 22 23 
you know, reports coming forward. And as we move through that process, there, you know, there's going to be quite a few reports coming to the initial um, committees of, of those new um, schemes. So I, I, I would propose on page 200, um, where we have the minimum number of meetings, is that those in um, the, the areas of education, skills, community wellbeing, enabling community customer service, economy infrastructure, social work services, and audit and risk is a minimum of five meetings per year to be reviewed after two years. And the reason for that is, you know, there, there, there has been an awful lot of reports coming recently to, to committees. Um, I can see a lot more coming because of the changes that are actually going to happen. And, and I know that Councillor Dawood has similar concerns on this. Uh, so I would move that chair as part of the recommendation in 2.1 is that we have five minimum meetings per year and review it after two years. Yeah, the, the, this is going to take quite a lot of bedding in. I, I, so I appreciate your, the sentiment behind that. Councillor Norwood, are you just wanting to second that? Is that Correct, convener, but if I could say a couple of words on it as well. I just did a, um, totally agree with what um, Councillor Driver is saying, but I did a, a quick review of committees held last year and the maximums in terms of service committees. So we're moving from five to four but we had five service committees last year. The maximum amount of committees held for one directorate was eight, and the minimum was five. So I don't see why we could move to less service committees and have less meetings over the year, initially as a bedding-in process. Um, I think we need to be quite sensible about this in terms of the workload. I get the workload on, on um, executive directors and um, deputy directors, There'll also be an increased workload for elected members. So I suggest if you have a minimum of five service committee meetings per year, as has been um, suggested by Councillor Driver, I think that's the right way forward. That allows us to carry out our role in terms of governance and scrutiny of papers coming forward. And I think there will be a, 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 um, a, a, a period of bedding in, which we need to consider in this as well. Thank you. So I second the motion. I think I think it is uh, it is clearly a, a minimum, as was specified. But Vlad, do you want to make any comment on that? Uh, thank you, convener. And uh, I'm I'm in the uh, the hands of uh, full council on this. Um, it is a minimum, uh, and uh, the, it will be reviewed. And uh, I, I know the the proposal that it should be reviewed after two years. Um, from a, a governance perspective, what we're trying to do obviously is uh, make uh, the, the whole system as efficient as we can uh, and we need to continue to review that but I envisage uh, that most of those service committees will have a minimum of five anyways uh, in terms of uh, for the first year anyways until we bed that in uh, but uh, acknowledging uh, members uh, discussion there uh, uh, there's no issue from my end in terms of the, the governance position on uh, a minimum of five if that's what full council would want. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vlad. If you, you know, just by, by the fact that you've just said you'd expect there to be a minimum of five, it would make sense just to make it a minimum of five in the document. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, just on uh, two point two in terms of the voting rights. Uh, I mean, I would move that we just uh, have it so that only elected members vote at committees of elected members. Um, and I appreciate there's been a bit of work done in this through the review of standing orders. Uh, and I accept that, you know, while the right has been there, it's maybe not been exercised, but on the same side as the uh, flip side of the coin is like, therefore, it makes no difference to remove it and it just makes it more consistent because we, we have um, youth reps, religious reps, other reps, you know, at committees, <coughs> they don't vote, they don't exercise the vote. And I think it would, I would move that we um, remove the right to vote, but accept their valued input at committees in, in other regards. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marshall. Yeah, thanks. Chair, uh, mine's a kind of a different point. It's something that I've, I've kind of observed. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if someone can point me in the direction under maybe scheme of delegation or, or standing orders, is that my understanding was always with regards to strategic committees, main service committees, and that's, you know, the big four at the top, that you were never allowed to actually substitute. And I think that was to 
to allow members to be consistent, you know, who attended that because there were ongoing issues. And I've just started noticing, you know, that we're now allowing uh, people to substitute. And I just wondered when that was decided or whereabouts it is in standing orders, because I can never remember that being that position with regards to strategic committees. Thank you, Vlad. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> just uh, checking in. Um, thank you, convener. And uh, it, no, just to clarify, uh, the substitutions aren't allowed as such, but you're allowed to change the membership uh, as long as you give notice. Uh, so that's what uh, is happening. So in terms of there's, there has been changes, not substitutions as such. Substitution is different. So uh, you're only substituting for that particular meeting. If you're changing the membership, which you're allowed to do, um, then you proceed through the, the process for that, which is a different process. Councillor Marshall, you want to come back? Yeah, because I think some of the service committees I've experienced is that they have been substitutions. Now, I don't know whether or not there's some sort of process where you have to then inform them that there's a change and then change it back. But I'm, I've certainly observed, you know, people substituting at education, etc. I'd probably let that check. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to have that double check and just confirm that uh, to members. Uh, the usual process is uh, the, through the kind of proper officer, there's a notification process um, for any changes, uh, and we would implement that in the governance team uh, straight away. And uh, you'll see that the website will be updated and so on within that, and it might be that it's been updated a couple of times uh, through that process. But I'll, I'll, I'll take away that action to, to check that for members. Councillor Driver, do you want to come in on the same point? Yeah, same point, and, and, and obviously that that, that clarity is, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to that that clarity. It's about the timing of when you can do it. I I think it's been changed from 72 hours to 24 hours, if I remember, but that was for substitutions. I'm not sure about what. Yeah. Claire, do you want to come in on that one? Yes, thank you. We haven't had any changes on that provision. There's um, that 4.2.1. It's um, a notification to proper officer no later than 24 hours before the start of the meeting. So where there have been changes in membership of strategic committees, it's been changes in membership, not substitution. There's never been provision for substitution on only on subcommittees. Councillor McFarlane, is that the same? Yeah, thank you, Chair. But perhaps in order to address this, perhaps the um, committee should be informed. We have had a situation where there has been a, a change of membership and and it was raised, well, was that person substituting? And it was identified, no, they hadn't been substituting, they had been replaced, but clearly that's not been updated and, and committees are not being notified. If we just formalise that, then it, it takes away any issues. Yeah, it would probably be a, a useful thing, at, even for the, at the start of the meeting, for the chair to make it make it known what, what the position is. Councillor Jameson, I think you've been waiting to come in. No, just to go back to Councillor Thompson's motion, I, I'd like to second that. Um, I sit on the Education and Learning Committee, and the, the value of the, the youth reps, the religious reps, and the teachers is, is not to be underestimated, and, and it is influential. But I don't think it's the play. They don't require a vote, in my opinion. Elected members should have the vote. It's their responsibility to be on top of all the issues. Um, as I say, hugely respect the, the input from, say, the youth and the religious representatives and the teachers, but it's the place of the elected members to make any decisions. And, and while Councillor Driver is quite correct, I've never, they've never actually used a vote, the religious reps. But they could. So let's have clarity that they should just be elected members. Thank you. Councillor Dougie Campbell. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, just on that e exact point, um, I think we as uh, elected representatives, we are directly accountable for the, the decisions that we make. I uh, appreciate the comments from the 
Roman Catholic Church and the, the, the Church of Scotland. I don't think a decision to withdraw voting rights undermines our position on the, the Education Committee, but there have been examples, I understand, elsewhere in Scotland where that entitlement to exercise the vote has actually occurred. Um, so, uh, with all due respect to, to the churches, um, I would also support the proposal that we withdraw the, the voting right. Thank you. Councillor Richard Brody. Uh, th thanks, Chair. Yes, uh, just to support Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Jameson, Councillor Campbell on, on that. I think I think that, that course of action would, would put uh, religious uh, leaders in the same contacts as, as representatives of the Youth Council and parent councils and also the teaching representatives who don't vote. But, yeah, religious uh, Religious representatives are obviously their, their contribution all, all, is obviously valued, and in the question of substitution, uh, I think there was a case. There was a, there was a case where uh, there was a change of a substitution or change of membership at the, at the not the last meeting, but the meeting before the education committee. So I'll probably was seeking clarification on that whether it was a, done properly. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Can anyone help us to whether that substitution was done proper, properly or change of membership? Sorry. Thank you, convener, and uh, thank you, members. I think uh, I've taken an action to to report back to members, so I'll just bring it back to that action. We'll, we'll check the process, uh, and if we need to have better comments around it, we'll uh, obviously put that back to uh, and put that in place in terms of implementing that, rather than look at specific uh, points. But obviously, members, uh, feel free to contact me if you've got any specific examples that you wish to to raise, and then I can look specifically at those. That's not an issue at all. Councillor Hislop. A couple of points. One on the substitution. My understanding is substitution or replacement on a main committee is allowed, but that person who is uh, put in a change of committee, I think it was about five, six years ago, we changed standing orders that they must remain in the committee for about six months, unless there was a a reason, maybe they to kill or something like that. That was to stop uh, people coming in this month for a meeting because somebody couldn't attend and then leaving next month. Uh, I don't know if that's still in standing orders. And the other one is, I would actually support Councillor Driver on the fact that I think we should uh, retain the voting rights of the uh, religious representatives. They're there as statute. And they exercise their rights, um, I would say, well. They don't abuse them. And I would support, if Councillor Dreiser is moving uh, that we retain them, I would second them on that. Thank you, Councillor Hislop. I don't think Councillor Dreiser has uh, not actually put a motion forward as such. No, that was in another matter. Yeah, can we just clear, clarify the six months? Thank you, convener. Just to clarify, there's no provision in our standing orders for any sort of minimum length of time to be served on a committee for any committee changes hasn't been for several years. Thank you for that, Councillor Dempster. Thanks, convener. No, I, I very much support what Councillor Driver is suggesting. I, I think. Committee should be fully populated. We should be able to support and ensure that committees function. And how that's achieved, I'll, I'll leave that to officers and, and other members to decide. In the terms of substitution, we'll have to be sure that the individual has been suitably trained because there are some committees where a requirement of training a, 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 is requested before members can sit in that particular committee. And the only other thing I, I, I would suggest, and it's in the back of Councillor Driver's proposal as well, about increasing the number of committee meetings if required, it might help to reduce the volume of agenda items because we get information overload sometimes, and it's quite 
daunting for members to be looking at 25 and 30 agenda items in a day, and it may be that that number of agenda items you don't then pro provide or able to then depth the examination and discussion that's, that's required for these particular agenda items. So it's some food for thought. That's all, Kadina. Thank you. Councillor Driver. Just want to clarify the position of, of the motion, Chair. Is all, all I asked for the motion was to increase that to five meetings per year. I said quite clearly that I wasn't bothered either way whether the, you know, the religious let reps had, had voting rights or not. So, you know. Uh, thank you. That was my recollection, and uh, I, I, I feel that there's support for everyone for to increase the, the minimum number to five. I think that's that's quite happy. Uh, other than Councillor Hislop's comment, I've not really had anything else about the religious reps. Can I just clarify, um, Councillor Driver, you also mentioned a review after two years, um, and the recommendation currently is 12 months. So I just wanted to check whether that's part of your motion that's been seconded by Councillor Dole. I, th I think the, the two years will give us that bedding in period. We've got, we've got you know, when you look at what the council business is going to be over the next two years, especially with budgets, things like that, we're going to have to have a look at how we do that. Thank you. Councillor Hislop, you want to come back in? Chair, uh, could I move then that we retain the voting rights of the religious representatives on the Education and Lifelong Learning Committee or its next uh, reincarnation? Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Ian Crothers. It's not a second. Just to make my point clear, apologies for this, Carvina. Uh, but I mean, I, I've advocated for what Councillor Thompson put forward for about 15 years. So I kind of really reverse on that now. So apologies, Ivor. I can't second that. Thank you. Councillor Denerly. Thank you, Convener. And I would support Councillor Thompson regarding the religious representatives as well. That this is a political responsibility and we don't want to mix the religious side of things with politics and so my vote would be to remove the voting rights for religious representatives. They have a place but I think that we should keep these things separate and uh, we allow fully elected councillors to make those decisions and we just allow religious representatives to make a contribution in those committees. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Hislop, I'm afraid we don't have a second. There. Councillor Wilson? I'll second Councillor Hislop's motion. Thank you. Oh, we do have a second there. <laughs> Councillor Wilson's seconded, seconded that. Uh, so, it looks like we're going to, to have to have a, a vote on this. Thank you, Convener. Yep, uh, we're just uh, putting the roll call up uh, for members to see. Um, and what I'll do is uh, I'll clarify the motion. So the motion is from Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Jameson, and that's to remove uh, the voting rights from the religious representatives from the Education Committee. Um, and the amendment to that is uh, from Councillor Hislop and seconded by Councillor Wilson, uh, which is uh, to uh, retain uh, their rights as they currently stand. Are members clear what the motion and the amendments are? Yes. Okay. Uh, convener? Motion. Deputy Convener? Amendment. Councillor Bell? Oh. Motion. Councillor Beretti? Motion. Councillor Blake? Amendment. Sorry, Councillor Blake, could you say that again? Amendment. Amendment. Councillor Brodie? Motion. Councillor Doogie Campbell? Motion. Councillor John Campbell? Motion. Councillor Ian Carruthers? Councillor Karen Carruthers? Motion. Councillor Dashford? Motion. Councillor Davis? Amendment. Councillor Dempster? Motion. Councillor Denerly? Motion. Councillor Dorward. Motion, please. Councillor Drybra. 
abstain. <laughs> Councillor Drysdale, I think, might have left. left a, yep, she's left the meeting. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Hagman. So apologies from Councillor Hammett. Okay, Councillor Hill. Amendment, please. Councillor Howey. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Ingalls. Okay, not here. Um, Councillor Jameson. Motion. Councillor Maureen Johnson. Amendment. Councillor Jordan. Amendment, please. Councillor Little. Motion. Councillor Lowe. Motion. Councillor McCammon. Amendment. Councillor McFarlane. Motion. Councillor Mayo. Amendment. Councillor Marsh. Motion. Councillor Marshall. Amendment. Councillor Scobie. Motion. Councillor Slater. Motion. Councillor Stevenson. Motion. Councillor Stitt. Amendment. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Walters. Motion, please. Councillor Wilson. Amendment, please. Councillor Wood. Abstain. And Councillor Young. Motion. Okay, as members will see, uh, the motion was carried uh, 25 votes to 12. Better put the microphone. Thank you. I'll now move on to the recommendations. Yep, sorry, yeah, Councillor Scobie. Yeah, I wonder why you were taking the vote there. I, I did indicate I wanted in. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> no, I'm looking at the, the, the remits to the various committees, uh, and in particular on page 180 in terms of the remit to social work, and I note the changes there in 5.55 and 5.56. Uh, I'm just curious about you know, the, the Dumfries and Galloway Clinical and Care Governance Committee uh, as to what that actually is. Uh, and whether, you know, in scrutinising and monitoring, we would be able to take decisions that if we are not particularly uh, happy with some of the, the way that the IGB or any of the health services are moving. Also on page 181, in terms of area committees, whether the changes uh, have gone far enough to, to actually make the, the area committees more relevant rather than just looking at reports that are very much dated, six months, uh, almost every report that comes before us, uh, although I do note in 5.77 uh, that is to monitor the major local projects uh, and the report of these. That would be good to see a report coming up on the local uh, projects. But So my question is, uh, you know, who is it and do we have powers to, 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 to put forward to IGB on any change that we would want to see uh, in the monitoring and scrutinising of these uh, services and reports, uh, and also uh, whether we've gone far enough in terms of making area committees more relevant to the local area. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Vlad, can you help us out with that? So in terms of uh, the, the governance uh, for, for the uh, IGB, first and foremost, it is, is an outside body and actually it's, uh, it's within uh, members' papers later on uh, in regards to that. Um, th there's an appointment to uh, the, that uh, IGB outside body uh, and thereafter um, the, those members will vote uh, in terms of that outside body uh, and uh, in, in essence that's the process so uh, full council will agree who those representatives will be and thereafter those representatives uh, will be there uh, within their relevant 
uh, status within that outside body, whatever that outside body's constitutions will be. And that applies to all of that. Um, so I don't think there's anything more in terms of uh, what the, 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 any other governance around the IGB, so I'm not sure what the question specifically is for that, because that's an outside body. It's not for us to, to have that constitution. We may well uh, scrutinise some of the work that we are delivering for the IGB, uh, but not thereafter. Yeah. Just got to bring, bring Claire in. OK, th thank you. Um, go back to uh, page 180 um, that has the delegations for Social Work Services Committee and, and as you say, gives a reference to that uh, Clinical and Care Governance Committee. Those, the wording there highlighted there and again in the Area Committee delega delegations is reflective of the integration scheme between the Council and the IGB, which is in the process of receiving ministerial sign-off. And uh, that's why that text is highlighted. And when that integration scheme gets a full formal agreement, that text will be updated to reflect what was formally in place. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Scobie, are you happy with that response? Well, well, yeah, it was just a question of what powers we would have in, in, in scrutiny, monitoring and scrutinising reports that come before us. Uh, I, I think Blood's answered that in terms of uh, it's an outside body and, and with its own governance. I would like to have seen we had more powers, but it's, it's no there. Thank you, Councillor Ian Crothers. Thanks so much, Convener, for letting me in. Hopefully, we'll have more discussion about this in the uh, you know, it's a motion. But I'm looking at 5.7.1 on page 181 as well. And I think that makes it quite clear. It, it was my understanding, and certainly Anna and Ian Lester will use it in that way, that scrutinise and monitor the delivery of local services, particularly in relation to joint work and community planning. Well, they're part of the community planning partnership, so there's another route there as well in which to get into them particular aspects, because I know you like to see the, 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 the detail of that, Willie, but hopefully we'll touch that later. Thank you. So if no further comment or question, we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked at 2.1 to agree the amended scheme of administration and delegation to committees as detailed in Appendix 1 and as summarised at paragraph 4.1 to 4.5, subject to decisions being taken at 2.2, there's report on item 11 of the meeting. And is at this point we're incorporating the five minimum of five meetings with, I think the reviews refer to later. So the review of that would be after two years. 2.2, agreed to consider the voting rights as summarised at paragraph 4.6. We've agreed and considered that and we've decided to remove the voting rights. 2.3, note the ongoing reviews as outlined at paragraph 4.10 to 4.14. 2.4, agree to carry out review of the updated scheme of administration and delegation to committees after the overall thing after an initial 12-month period as summarised at paragraph 4.7, but the number of committee meetings after two years. Thank you. So we're happy to agree. One, two and four and no three. Thank you. Now, it says here in my timetable, this is, uh, should be lunchtime, is it? We're ahead of schedule, so we can now move on to <laughs> can now move on to item eleven, poverty and inequalities in housing subcommittee considerations report by head of governance and assurance. This report asks members to consider recommendations from the review of standing orders subcommittee with regard to the consideration of a poverty and inequalities in housing subcommittee. Mark Malloy, Service Manager, Young People. Jamie Little, Team Leader, Strategic Housing and Regeneration Investment. And Vlad Valiente, Head of Governance and Insurance, are available to assist members with any questions. Do we have any questions, Councillor Driver? No, no, not so much a question here. I mean, our, our group had a, a good long look at this, and obviously poverty, poverty and inequalities and inequalities is something that we're all trying to improve on. And, you know, the, the situation with the, the, the whole housing issue, of course, and, and that you know transfers to poverty and equality if you've got bad bad housing stock or have problem with homelessness. You can just say the same about education, of course. If you're bad education, your chance you've got inequalities, you know, and, and that type of thing. But our, our group considered that, and, and looking at the, the the options of this particular one, we thought that option two would probably be the best way to go forward, have an establishment of a joint poverty inequalities and housing subcommittee of the full council. 
in, in that particular thing. So I, th I think we can, you know, because of the council plan in the future, what we're trying to do with everything, that I think that fits in really well with, with everything that we're trying to do as a, as a council. So we would, we would suggest uh, option two, but, uh, you know, I've asked members to raise their, their issues with that as well. Thank you. So you're proposing option option two. Councillor Ian Crothers, I think you were next. Thanks very much, uh, I've certainly got sympathy in regards to what Council Driver is saying, but my preference would still have been to have had the two separate. I think we do need to both both uh, subcommittees. Lots of mentions across Scotland, actually the UK for that matter. We're, we're, we're in a housing crisis. I think Dumfries and Galway is just no so far about that. Uh, I, there's definitely a correlation. There's no two ways about that between the two. The impact that your housing has, whether it's from energy bills, so on and so forth, how uh, that, that affects uh, poverty and the inequalities for that matter. That is quite clear. But I think for me, certainly, we should have a clear focus on both, either both, but I'm certainly not willing to die in the ditch over it, uh, convener. But my preference would certainly be to have the two separate committees. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, like Archie, um, I, I would suggest. You can't actually differentiate at times. Um, Anti-poverty measures and housing go hand in hand. Uh, good quality houses make a significant difference, and I don't think we can take the two in isolation. They should be going together, and I'd be happy to, to move and go with option two if Archie wants to second me. Councillor McGregor, you want to quickly? These are two really important areas, and, and as Councillor Driver has alluded, the, the, there's other authorities across Scotland that have declared a housing emergency or housing crisis, or maybe it was Councillor Carruthers, um, and they are intrinsically linked. I, I was uh, aligned with Councillor Carruthers initially, but I think given the importance of this um, and, and given what the work it's going to have to do to have whole council support and everybody behind it, um, I would be minded to, to move with option two, given the, the mood of the room. I just think that this is such an important committee and it will have to report to full council, um, and it's going to have to deal with some really difficult things that, um, you know, if, if we amalgamate the agenda. Housing sits at the REP and costs and various other forums that I sit in as one of the number one priorities to tackle inequality and poverty. So, yeah, I'd, I'd rather the room didn't split on it, I think. Councillor Jameson. Thanks, convener. Uh, this has been brought up previously. I uh, sit in the Education Committee and Social Services. I don't sit in the housing, but Andy Ferguson has briefed me quite extensively on the need for housing. The Roundtree Foundation makes no bones about it that poverty, housing, education, social services, NHS, they're all part of a big picture. Um, in education, again, the Roundtree Foundation indicate, well, states through research that if children have got mental health issues, it bears down on the ability of the parents to, to kick out of poverty. If, poverty. if parents have difficulties, including mental health issues, it impacts the children. We need to take accountability, in my view. The whole council needs to take accountability on poverty. There's too many people in poverty and suffering po poverty, and it's, it's self-perpetuating. If you've got children that struggle in schools, they can't get out of poverty, or it's much more difficult to get out of poverty. So there's a lot of third sector work going on that's fantastic, but members of the council need to take responsibility for our own, what's within our powers, and we need to connect things. Kids that are going to school, unwashed, unclean, unfed, they're not in a position to get a good education. And that's not always the parents' fault, but we need social services and education to work together. Same with housing, there needs to be a connection. So I strongly support this because I think it's absolutely fundamental to the values of this council that we all take responsibility for the, the really serious problem of poverty. Thank you. Councillor Scobie. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and I welcome this report and that we're now looking at a uh, subcommittee for housing. Uh, and while we have no stock, there's no doubt in my mind that we should have a greater connection with housing. Uh, we've got huge problems in uh, homelessness, where they, they, what generally is offered to them just now uh, is bed and breakfast accommodation, which is just totally unsuitable. We've got huge overcrowding uh, situation, 
uh, where uh, families are living in two bedroom properties that require three, four, five and six bedroom properties. And that's a major issue. Uh, at the, the forums that I've attended, uh, we have uh, something like 2,000 plus uh, people who are waiting on an aid and adaptation. That's not just in the socially rented sector, but also the private sector, uh, where they are waiting on these aids and adaptations. Uh, this is disabled and vulnerable people, uh, hence why we need to get a handle on it. Uh, there was reference to uh, the climate change, uh, and I think we need to be innovative uh, uh, and moving forward in looking at uh, district heating systems through the, the Housing Committee uh, and see how we can push that forward because th there are uh, people in, in, in are facing dumb and uncomfortable uh, situations and, and we've got to at least show them that we are serious about this and how we move it forward. We've also look, got to look at uh, the future housing developments uh, and how we move forward with, with partners on this uh, without prejudicing any member o o on the planning committee. Because, you know, we need to, to see more housing being built uh, and to see what we can add to that. So while, like Ian, I would prefer to go for option three because, as Archie says, poverty and inequality can cross any of the committees. Uh, but I think that, that, that there is a place for it being a separate committee to look at all poverty and inequalities. But as Ian says, likewise, I'll no die in the ditch if we have it as a joint, but I would much prefer they were separated because there's so much work in both of them. Uh, but if it's the, the will of the uh, council to go for a joint one, then I'll, I'll live with that too. The very fact that we're getting one or, or moving to one is a move forward, in my opinion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor John Campbell. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Yeah, we did have a, a kind of lengthy discussion at the uh, review of standing orders uh, on both the inequalities, uh, poverty and housing. And we did come up with a, a number of options. Uh, I see the leader nodding in agreement there. Uh, yeah, I, I would support option two. Uh, my only uh, uh, concern would probably be the assurances in the appendix, because the appendix one just gives uh, three options, but that's purely related to the uh, poverty and inequalities side of things, whereas uh, appendix two is housing. So if we go for option two, I take it that both appendices will be put together, and that would form the I, I see nods in agreement. Thanks very much, convener. Uh, thank you, Councillor Campbell. If my recollection is correct, it was actually you were the first person to float the idea of joining the two. So, <laughs> Councillor Dempster. Thanks, Convener. Like everybody else, I, I, I support option two. I think it's the right thing to do. I think housing needs a home, for want of a better word. It's important and it plays an important role in tackling poverty. The only other point I want to make, and, it, and it, it, it's been pedantic maybe, but I would hate to have send out a message to the wider world that we're poverty stricken. We should be tackling poverty, but to entitle our a uh, new committee poverty stricken DNG, I think is wrong. I think the, the, the approach is right. I think the sentiment is right, but I think poverty sends out the wrong message. Maybe rename the committee. It will do the very same work. It's important work but with it describing it as being, being poverty-stricken D&G. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was, oh, Councillor Campbell raised one of the points I was going to raise. Just, so option three should really be Appendix 2, and option four is what's option three in Appendix 1, just to make it confusing. But uh, And the other thing is I, I do have a sympathy with um, Councillor Dempster, and I think, you know, more accurately... Um, you wouldn't have a murder committee or a smoking committee, you would have a preventing or, you know, so I think in this sense it's a tackling poverty and inequalities, if that makes more sense, if that's kind of in line with what you're thinking, because we don't, you know, that's actually what the committee's for, uh, or subcommittee's for, so I, I would suggest that we think carefully about our language rather than advertise, we're tra tackling it, so I would suggest the addition of a word in there, thank you. Rather than tackling, I mean, I put anti in front of it instead of, but, uh, and going back to appropriate names, and uh, the Minister for Defence used to be the Minister of War, but Councillor Driver. 
Yeah, and I, I think obviously that report will come back to the June June Fool Council Committee, what we're going to call it, and I'm happy to call it either Auntie or, or you know, tackle them, whatever. The thing is, I, I, would, I would like to also see it, and we're talking about numbers earlier on on sub, subcommittees. I would, it's, it's, so, it's so an important subcommittee, and if Andy's all right with uh, a subcommittee of 15, I think, would be ideal for that, that particular thing of 15 members. Uh, sub, subcommittee of full council, but 15 members on the subcommittee. Thank you. That, at least that gives a, a broader representation. Councillor Jameson. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Stephen and, and councillor, <laughs> the councillor's uh, comments. What I would say is that we shouldn't underestimate the problem. We must not underestimate the problem of poverty, because there is poverty. Annandale South has got one of the lowest SIMD in, in the country. So let's not flower over this. We have got serious issues with poverty, closing the attainment gap, positive destinations, so we, we must not underestimate it. But I fully agree with, with the comments on, on the, the wording. Councillor Ferguson. Thanks very much, uh, Archie. Thanks for that very helpful uh, uh, suggestion. Um, I'd be quite happy going 15 um, as long as there are 15 members with teeth, because uh, this, this committee will need to have teeth. It's not a talking shop, right? Um, unless it's got teeth, um, then it, it will just, things will just go round and round in circles and punted from department to department. This is the committee that will oversee, at my suggestion, will oversee all the council departments are actually delivering what they're supposed to deliver in either the housing sector or the anti-poverty strategy. That's what it's for. That's what I'm suggesting it for. So it's not just a case of let's set up a committee of 15 and we can chat about it or a cup of tea and a biscuit. No, we mean business. Everybody, it's everybody's responsibility. We need to get, uh, get somewhere. And um, I think Jim's point of view to an extent is we need to be careful with the language about how we, how we couch this because uh, we've got members of the press who listen to every single word we say in this chamber. Right? So we need to be very, very clear Right, on what words we use. So I'd be quite happy, as, as, as Stephen said, tackling poverty and inequalities in housing subcommittee or addressing or whatever word um, we want to come up with, as long as it makes it clear to the people um, uh, uh, who we serve that this is what this is all about. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Driver, any more? No, 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 you're just waving your pen a bit. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's getting, it's getting, it's getting to you, exactly. So I think we've agreed to go with option two, is that? That's correct. So we're, we're at the point where we just move to the recommendations. We consider the options presented at 4.3 and agree a preferred option, which was option two. Subject to the decision, note that a further report will be presented at the June 2024 meeting of full council presenting delegations and committee membership details. And we're advising that the committee should be of 15. Is that correct? And at that meeting, will we finally decide the name or are we deciding the name right now? Are we going to make it tackling poverty, addressing poverty? There is the options. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go to a vote. Yeah. A, a suite of options for debate, yeah. Well, that'll take us we'll go for hours. tackling. Yeah. I think we'll go for tackling. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So now we move on to item 12, scrutiny review. Oh, lunch is here, finally. So we'll break for half an hour. We'll be back at 10 past one. Thanks.
on to item 12, which is a scrutiny review, children with additional support needs report by Head of Governance and Assurance. This report presents members with the findings and recommendations arising from the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee's Children with Additional Support Needs Scrutiny Review. Fraser Davis, Improvement Development, Development Officer and Hugh Smith, Integration and Inclusion Manager, are available to assist members with any questions. I will now ask the Chair of Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee to introduce the scrutiny review. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Convener. Uh, as Chair of Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee, I welcome this opportunity to introduce the report to the Council. The Committee undertook this review to ensure the Council has appropriate arrangements in place to meet its statutory duties under Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act 2004 in the provision of support to children and young people who face a barrier or barriers to learning. The Committee is happy to report that the Council does have appropriate arrangements in place as part of the review, the committee identified a number of improvements to better support children and young people with additional support needs, and these are detailed in the report in front of members today. I would like to thank the members of the committee and the officers who supported the scrutiny review and would commend this report to full council. And if, if it's OK with your forbearance, I'll pass over to the vice chair, Councillor Drybra. Thank, thanks, convener, and thank, thanks. Um, Stephen, for allowing me to, to come in and, and, and agree with what your suggestion was. I think the, the work that the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee have done in this has, has been very much appropriate for the, uh, the, the, the issue that, that's in front of us. Importantly, it's where do we move from here and how do, how do we go, go forward? And, and I think, you know, as, as Stephen says, the work of officers and, and members on this has brought these two recommendations uh, forward. And, Importantly for us, um, as an audit risk and scrutiny committee, we can move on to other things and hopefully bring back future reports of, of where we can show improvement and also potential um, um, improvements through the recommendations. So mainly just for, for us, it's where do we go from here with the, the two recommendations. But happy to agree what Stephen says and, and bring it forward to the, the, the chamber. Thank you. So we'll now Thank you for that, Councillor Driver and Thompson. We'll move on to questions and comment. Uh, Councillor Jamieson, you want to come in? Yeah, thank you. I, I really welcome this very thorough uh, <coughs> review and insight. The Education Committee have been working on this for a long time, and uh, it is a lot of the work was done over the last few years and the assistance of the Education Committee because there was such serious concerns about assisted support for learning. So the committee requested that they did a deep dive, as the, as the words are used just now, and, and to be fair to the officers, they did that. There was an incredible amount of research done into that, and, and this, this report highlights some of the work they've done. The next steps are actually there. We have agreed to a new system, ASN uh, allocation of hours and oversight of how these hours will be distributed. So we have a two, two-part system in ASN now, which gives us more oversight the one thing that I brought up at a full council previously was the, the legal requirements and obligations, and, and this has addressed that as well. But I direct you towards page uh, 257, the legal re responsibilities. There is still a bit of a grey area there. That I'll read it out. The legislation does not specify what type of support or how much support to be provided instead, stating that the support must be adequate and efficient, which can be challenging due to different interpretations. I think that's something that we should be wary of, not because of the legal implications, of course we have to be aware of that, but actually delivering for the children and the staff what is adequate and what is efficient. It has to be what they require. So I welcome the report. I think it's it's a good it's a good example of how things can work with education can be working on that and now they've it's went through the risk and scrutiny so it, the process works so thank you thank you do we have any further question and comment councillor scoby yeah chair again uh, as georgia said i welcome the report and indeed that's the uh, audit and risk did uh, look look at this and scrutinize uh, the, the service there's no doubt in my mind that the, the, the service is in greater demand following uh, post-COVID, where more children are being identified uh, and needing this support. Uh, and it's really for us looking at our legal responsibilities and how 
we apply uh, what our legal responsibilities are to deliver the service that young people require in terms of that additional support. So I would hope that in order and risk looking at it, in education also considering what they've got to provide for uh, children who need that additional support, and for the council to look at that we are adequately funding ASN, and I spoke of this at the budget, uh, where uh, education, I understand, and maybe they would have good clarity in this one, but they have mitigated the circumstances by using other uh, monies to make sure that we can deliver on this. I think that we do have to seriously look at it, because I think the, the leader said that uh, she hoped that there would be additional uh, consequentials coming to, to, to Scotland and that they could look at this. I think we've seriously got to be looking at this, whether we've got the adequate funding to provide for, for every child uh, that requires that additional support. However innovative we are in how we deliver, but we also need to shoot, make sure that there's the adequate resources available so that we can deliver uh, and make sure that we do get it right for every child uh, in terms of our needs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Hugh, do you want to make any comment on that? Sorry. I, I suppose I would, um, I would uh, um, first refer back to Councillor Jameson's point in terms of the separation of the process, in terms of specifically looking at the allocation of learning assistance, which I think was a, a main focus of this piece of work. Um, and, and that hopefully would provide Councillor Scobie with the reassurance that actually that we are we are in the midst of the identification of the need. The separate step next stage process is to look at how we deploy the resources that we have, and that will be ultimately um, with uh, through the oversight group will be reported back to the education committee. So we will have a process to be able to identify the level of need and the resources that we have that are available to meet that need. Thank you, Councillor Ian Crothers. Much. <clears throat> Chair, and thanks very much to the Chair, Vice Chair and the Audit Risk Scrutiny Committee and its predecessor as well in regards to doing this piece of work. I suppose the only, only piece was, was a question that was lying open for me was, I'm not sure who, who, who would answer it, but it's, it's the legal obligations, statutory obligations, how we're meeting them compared to the, how we manage the expectations from our service users and our parents and so on and so forth. I just wondered, how does that fit in there? That's Because there's expectations beyond the statutory obligations, I would argue. And it's how do we actually manage that? How did it? So that might have been for the chair, vice chair. It might have been for Lee. I'm just not sure if it can be answered. I think Councillor Jameson has wanted to come in now. Yeah, the, the education committee have, have worked long and hard, and this. the previous administration were, were quite <coughs> quite adamant, uh, and, and all parties had consensus in this. There was a there was a requirement to actually look at the legislation and look at the various reviews that were committed to, and, and the recommendations of the Morgan. In particular, we're very, very clear, and that's the aspiration we should. I, can, I, I get a wee bit worried when we, we talk about managing expectations. We should have expectations ourselves to meet the requirements uh, to get it right for every child. And I know there is limitations to that, but I think the progress we've made with this, and it's been highlighted in this, that there has been significant changes in, in motion, uh, chief of which is, is to increase the training, increase the... The, the pathways for learning assistance, it's more secure contracts. There, there's genuine effort here to try and address the situation that was clear for members to see. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do that. And we also acknowledge the fact, maybe rather belatedly, but we have identified, I, th I think, 1.7 million over the next three years additional funding from within education to try and address some of these issues. So we have to keep an eye on it. And as far as the legal situation, I've talked to the solicitor about this because it did concern me. Parents can still appeal, and, and there is occasions, two or three occasions, where they've appealed, but hadn't gone any further because the Education Committee were able to address the concerns. So we need to be sure that, that the parents and carers are aware of the process. So if they are unhappy, it doesn't come to a confrontation with the head teacher. We have systems where we can manage not manage the expectations, but really look at situations where parents and children are unhappy. So I'm really pleased with the progress, uh, and, and I think we should, the final comment is we really need to look, need, 
need before budget and then manage it from that direction. So, um, so I hope that, that, that uh, that's a part of an answer that Ian is looking for. <coughs> Thanks, no, thanks very much for that, uh, George. Uh, much, much, much appreciated. It certainly does. I suppose my, my thoughts probably go beyond just the parent service users as well, because we've got staff uh, that are under some incredible pressures as well. I uh, hope that extra resource will make a difference to that. Other committees, which I know you were part of, uh, George, uh, we, we see that level of pressure uh, kind of through, through uh, you could even say, physical violence, but it can escalate to that level. But it just it's how we manage all those expertise right across and how, how this piece of work is fitted into that. But no, thanks very much. I accept the answer, uh, convener. Thank you. Councillor Brodie. Uh, th <coughs> thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, and like, uh, like other councillors, I welcome the audit scrutiny review. I think some of the content should reassure INCRA others that we are meeting our obligations under the law and doing our best for young people. Uh, having said that, as, as Councillor Scobie highlighted, our, <clears throat> our budgets are under pressure and the level of need has grown in the last few years. And we ha as an education committee, we will continue to, to monitor that. And, uh, and uh, if there are resources, more resources available to, to the department, then these will gr gr be gratefully received. But as uh, Hugh Smith said, "We're looking at looking at we're through a process now where we're identifying the need and matching that up against resources, and that that uh, matching up will uh, come back to the the committee." Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, and thank you for this report. Um, just on page two five eight, it says at the top um, there is currently one job description for the role of the learning assistant which may not consist consistently reflect the nature of the job. I'm just wondering if it might be something moving forward that we could look at um, having the differentiated roles, depending on how much training now there is, predominantly more training on offer. Um, it's not going to be mandatory as far as I'm aware. So for, for those members of staff that do want to undertake that training, that do want to progress in more of a career role, um, possibly that could be reflected in the pay and also in a different job scale and also in um, the skills that they have, depending on the children, the higher tariff children particularly that they work with. Um, when we talk about the parents, and Councillor Carilla said there about parents do have expectations and so do staff. Parents, we say, know their children best, so their expectations will be high of the support because they give the support at home. So we just need to make sure that their views are being listened to, which I know through Charles plans they are. So there seems to be quite a lot of progress on this. But we do need to make sure that when these things are being put in place, it's the needs of the children that are being met. And like George Jameson, Councillor Jameson said, it's not about the budget, it's about getting it right for every child and making sure that the needs are met. Thanks. Thank you. Do you have you got anything to say about the job description? Thank you, um, absolutely, Convener. I can reassure Councillor Hill that there's been a significant piece of work which is engagement with learning assistants and other stakeholders looking at that very issue. Um, we recognise that a flat contract for, for a range of skilled workers across the, the, our educational establishment from very complex um, environments to, 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 to more generalist support needs more nuance in terms of the contractual arrangements and also the training and development that's available to those staff. That's a piece of work that's ongoing, obviously, in negotiation with our union colleagues as well. Thank you. Do we have any other comment or question? Councillor Dorward. Thank you, Convener. Just to echo, um, hopefully from a slightly different perspective, what some of my councillor colleagues have said. I mean, since COVID, the, whilst the funding from the recent Galloway Council may have gone up, the funding from Scottish Government has reduced for this in parallel with an increase in children with additional needs um, as a consequent reduction in support. So we seem to be, you know, we're all saying the same thing, that there's an additional expectation, that an additional amount of individuals need additional resourcing. And whilst we as a council can only do what we can do, um, the money needs to come in from national government as well. So I think we need to go back to, or suggest, sorry, we need to go back to the budget as well and, and, and the... the undertakings that were made in terms of consequentials for specific resources into education. One of them was for um, 
uh, children with ESNs, but one of them is also for an additional 14 teachers to go into. So it's about how we manage this and how we look at this. It, it's not specifically who I get it, we're not just, not just focusing on this little bit, it's the bigger picture as well. But I think we need to focus on how we can deal with this um, in, a, in a much bigger perspective, because I, I, I know she's with the report, totally welcome that, but is it sufficient that we're meeting our legal obligations only? I don't think it is for the children in Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was Councillor Crothers' comment as well. Just meeting the legal obligations, is, is that sufficient? No. So, And we do need to firm up on the, the money that's coming forward. Councillor Hill, did you want to come back? Yeah, sorry. Um, my other point was on um, page 260. It was just about, um, we say that we have the service understands importance and seeking support across the region. However, there is a recognition that there may be fewer opportunities in the west of the region. I'm just wondering um, what we're thinking about putting in place to address that, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, we are looking at the, the, the challenges, the available um, partners in the west that are available to provide some of the services that we're able to commission in the east. So it is a piece of work that we're looking at. Um, for example, the, with the autism provision we've been looking at, obviously we're looking at an east and a west um, options. Um, so it is a challenge in terms of who's available because some of our services that we are, specialist services we commission, and they tend to be more towards the east where they can access other, or, or other authorities can access them more directly. So I think that, I suppose all I would say is that our colleagues in the West are incredibly adaptive and creative in terms of utilising the resources that they've got in ways that they've, they've had to find ways to because we don't necessarily have some of the very specialist resources that are available to us in the, in the East. It's an ongoing challenge and, and we work really closely uh, with, with colleagues from health and social work and others and, and third sector organisations to try and develop opportunities, but um, it's, it's, it's more limited is the reality. But that doesn't necessarily mean that an alternative package of support isn't a success for a young person just because they're in a different part of the region. It can be a very different approach, but it can work as well as it could with a different model over in the East. Councillor Jameson. Yeah, it's just in response to Councillor Dorwood's uh, comments, which were quite accurate. What I would ask, though, is uh, uh, just to raise the issue and ask the question, how well do we use the... the Pupil Equity Fund and the, the inclusion strategy. These are uh, government money that's come come through to the council that's uh, that's available for this particular purpose and closing the attainment gap and looking after poorer children and and, and children with doubt by, by uh, divers, neurodiversity. Sorry. So there is money coming in the strategic equity fund and the pupil equity fund are, are funds that come from the government to the education department, so how well and how effectively are they being used? Thank you. The, the, I think it would be fair to say there's definitely a correlation between poverty and additional support needs. I think many um, academics would go further to say there's a, there's a causation between the two. Um, and historically, we have always encouraged schools to think about the pupil equity funding, which is devolved to, to school management teams, to think about the, how they can support the, all of their young people, including those with additional supports. Um, other CEF funding, and, and which is again, you know, looking at how we can build our capacity. One of the, the asks or the recommendations is about how we build the capacity of our staff, not just our learning assistants, and using some of that funding um, through staff to develop um, uh, the skills and, uh, and, and make that shift, which is this is a shift for education across Scotland, um, which was, as you know, called by the, the Morgan Report. 40% um, of our children have additional support needs. The model needs to change to be able to fundamentally meet individual needs of children rather than what probably in historically has been a large group and then there's some that don't get their needs met. So it's, it's part of that whole shift, Councillor Jameson, that you're very, very aware of and, and understand. Councillor Scobie. <coughs> Thanks for letting me back in, Chair. It really was just on a, a comment made by Hugh in terms of deploy the resources that we have but that doesn't say that, you know, that doesn't answer, have we got adequate resources to meet the needs, our legal requirements and, 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 and beyond in terms of the needs of, of, of the child. And it's really in picking up on what Linda was saying, that, you know, we do need more money from the Scottish Government. We, do need, we had expected or hoped 
that we would get some from the consequentials. I don't know if that has materialised or not, but we do need it. And if you look at page 261 in terms of the analysis, where well, there is no benchmarking data available from the local government benchmarking framework, networking with other authorities uh, is almost mirroring uh, across all the others. That there is a need for this uh, additional support. And I think that's highlighted in the national press as to the number of children that are now, uh, or the increased number of children that are now requiring this additional support. So it's really, you know, whether, we, you know, perhaps not, uh, well, it'll be the council that will be responsible, that we really should be lobbying the, the, the Scottish government and the UK government to say that we do need more money if we're going to meet the, the needs, and, and not just the, the expectation, but the needs of these uh, young people uh, in moving forward through their educational career. Uh, so I, I would hope that we do look at this as a, a lobbying issue in terms of the, uh, going to the Scottish Government and the UK Government to say we do need that extra funding to provide for this service. Thank you, Hugh. Can you answer on the resource issues? I, I suppose, Convener, I could, could answer in terms of the national perspective. I'm very aware how exercised um, the, the Parliament is, and there's currently the, and forgive me, I've not fully remembered the name of the, the committee, I think it's the Children and Young People's Committee at the at Scottish Parliament, which is, has an investigation and, and have had presentations from colleagues from ADES and local authorities, um, which is, my understanding is that being seen very much as a driver in terms of reviewing the existing um, improvement plan that the Scottish Government agreed with COSLA, which was um, on the back of the Morgan report. So we have a plan in Scotland. There's an absolute recognition of the challenges that Councillor Scobie is talking about. Um, and there are work that there's work nationally that's ongoing that we all are expecting to be able to deliver some tangible um, uh, uh, outcomes that will hopefully inform how we work together across, uh, across the authorities, but also how we can deliver more effectively um, for, for children. It is a national challenge at the moment, absolutely, and it's not just, it's an international challenge. I think we're seeing everywhere that the, the pressure on in terms of, of post-COVID um, and the cost of living crisis and the impact that that's having on children. Councillor Drybrand, did you want to, you want to come back in? No. Are there any further questions or contributions? No, in which case we'll move on to the recommendations. So we were asked to 2.1, consider the findings of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee's children with additional support needs scrutiny review as referenced in paragraph 4.6 and detailed in the appendix. And 2.2, agree the recommendations of the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee's children with additional support needs scrutiny review as referenced in paragraph 4.7 and detailed in the appendix. Are we happy to consider and agree? Thank you. Item 13, Outside Bodies, Annual, annual Review 2023, Report by Head of Governance and Assurance. This report provides members with the first annual review as agreed through full council and review of standing order subcommittee, providing an opportunity to review each outside body where we have current appointments and also provides the opportunity to remove or add outside bodies to the scheme. Tracy Sonko, Government's Officer, is available to assist members with any questions. And this basically re relates to outside bodies appointed by full council. So I see Councillor Dreiber and Thompson are having a bit of a bun fight as to who's going first. So we'll do it in alphabetical order. Councillor Dreiber. <coughs> Thank, thanks, Convener. I don't, I don't think you have any issues with the, with the, the report itself. It's just the... the um, some of the reviews are the outside bodies and, and the current councillor representation. Now, I don't know if they're, this was my fault or, or, or whoever, but um, in the one for the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, because of the Convention, um, it should have been my name in there rather than Linda Dorward. Um, so so um, I wonder if that, that could be updated um, for any future, because I have been to the Convention a couple of times, so I don't know what it is. I'm sure that can be updated. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Convener. It's really just around, uh, and it's maybe timely, um, just given where we are in the year, but um, the chairmanship or the chairpersonship of the REP uh, has come back to Dumfries and Galloway Council after a year 
been under the stewardship of the Scottish Borders. Uh, Russell Griggs was chair then, and he's um, been a, an, an able chair of that body for the last year, but it's come back to us to determine who will lead that. So I would ask, how are we going to do that, and uh, how will we take that forward? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if we've got anyone can help us out with how we go forward with that. Uh, leader? I can assist as much as possible. Um, Lorna's not here, obviously, to speak to it, and I think it would have been Lorna that would have... We've had conversations around... She's, oh, she's oh, online. Sorry. Excellent, she's Lorna. Online. I will hand over to you and then come back in if, if required. Thanks, Leader. Um, thanks, Councillor Thompson. Um, there are four members of the REC um, nominated by um, full council, and the terms of reference for the REC, as you, you'll be well aware, um, provide for the chair to rotate between borders, council representation, and... Um, to Bruce and Galloway Council reps. So it's really a matter either through the, the reps themselves to determine which one would um, maybe take up chair or, or otherwise, or indeed um, something that members might wish to um, take up in a different forum. But, but certainly there is no process mandated in the terms of reference about how each council will nominate its chair. Um, and by custom and practice so far, um, but only um, up to last year, it has been either the leader or deputy leader of the council who has chaired um, from either borders or um, to Bruce and Galloway. Um, but as you highlighted, um, Councillor Thompson last year, Scottish borders asked Councillor Professor Griggs um, to um, be chair in their term um, and up till the end of March. Thank you. So, am I right in saying, Lorna, it's a uh up to the representatives on it to, the, to the decide who's the chair, is that correct? Yes, members of the Priest and Gallery Council who have been um, um, nominated in and are members of the REP, that has been the custom practice of both councils to make those decisions um, through those forum. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, you want to come back in on that at all? I wasn't sure if the leader was going to come back after Lorna had answered, as I thought she'd indicated, but it was just really to say, no, um, comfortable that it is a bit of a custom and practice thing. I think it's appropriate that the leadership should probably come from the administration of the council involved um, or, or by their choice, but happy to take it up through the leaders panel. Or whatever. It's really just to get an understanding how we'll actually determine that, whether it's by friendly conversation or uh, a decision of the council. Thank you. I always prefer a friendly conversation. Leader. Yeah, thank you. It was briefly discussed at the last leaders' panel and was agreed that the four members would get together to discuss. And unfortunately, for a number of calendar reasons, you and I uh, have discussed it. Um, but we haven't been able to have that wider conversation with all four members, um, which I think we should probably do. Uh, but I, you know, I'm minded that it reverts back to the council and you know, through leadership one of the elected members would chair it, and if the preference is for the leader of an administration, then that would be the preference. Councillor Walters. Um, this is a slightly different thing. On, on page 263, on 3.2, it says about the, uh, the decision that was made by the subcommittee, and it says uh, the report is going to come forward with the option to add or remove organisations as appropriate. And I just wonder whether whether there is any any options to add organisations. I, I understand that a certain number of them have been sort of uh, looked at with the recommendations. Um, because I, think, I seem to remember the last time we discussed this, we talked about um, organisations like the Crichton Trust as to whether the council should be approaching them in terms of representation. And as it, as it actually says that in the action, I wonder what um, what was going to actually be said. Thanks. Thanks. Tracy, what's the procedure for adding? Thanks, Kavita. We've not had any request from any organisations to be added currently, but those ones we are looking at in the background, but we were just concentrating on any requests that we've received from organisations and the ones that we already had in statute from last year. So, so is, there, is, there a, is there a possibility that the council could approach organisations rather than waiting for them to request? Yeah, I can certainly take that up. Yep. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, uh, just a, a throwaway comment to start with. 
I think we should be looking at all the outside bodies, that all the political groupings should, if possible, you know, if it's practical, uh, have a place on, uh, on them. Um, sometimes it's no, but I think as a general principle, that's what the way we should be working. Uh, which brings me to the reason for my uh, intervention here. It's about the IGB, because um, uh, we took a motion to the full council uh, last year, which was agreed unanimously, that uh, the membership, the voting membership of the IGB should reflect the political makeup of the council. And that was one from each political group. Um, now, we've had anecd anecdotal remarks or innuendos or rumours that uh, a, one of the groups didn't want to take up their place. That didn't mean to say that another political group should automatically fill that place, right? Because the decision was they have five different groups should have a place if they wished them. So I would have thought that should have come back to this council um, for us to have another debate, to, for us to appoint, because at that stage, um, each political grouping after that decision had one place as a voting member. A, that's clearly not the case now. Um, but where are we with that? Um, because the, the makeup here still reflects the, the previous, pre that um, motion to full council. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we, I think we need to uh, sort that. And if the political group or a, any political group doesn't want to take up their place, then that needs to get reported back here. And then a council will need to find a solution for that to make sure we still have five voting members. No, I think it's important we have the five voting members, but if a group doesn't want to take part, then it's uh, obviously quite difficult. Tracy, have you got any advice? Thanks, Peter. I'd have to look back, but if I recall, um, yeah, a group didn't take up their place, and then it was agreed that um, if there was a, a vacancy on it, then all substitutes would be approached, and it wasn't political. But I'd have to look back um, at the decision from last year. <coughs> Are you happy with that, Andy? Um, no, really, it's no answer to the question. I, I mean, uh, Tracy's um, give, given a, a, a fair representation of where she, where she believes things are. But the decision was that day was to have five political group uh, uh, representatives on the IGB. Whatever happened after that should have been reported back to this council. OK, so we're going to have to take, take that forward. Uh, we'll have to take that away and come up with a solution for that. Councillor Marshall? Yeah, thanks. It's just in relation to the rep reps. Um, I'm one of those, and as Councillor Thompson's outlined, I'm quite happy for that, um, for the leader to take up that position on the rep. Uh, I think the other, the other representative was Councillor Brody. Thank you. Councillor Driver? Yeah, Chair, it's just for information, and really because I kind of remember if I've told people this. <laughs> The, the Reserve Forces and Cadets Association one, um, as you're aware, we are in the MOD Employer Recognition Scheme. We are a, a gold uh, thingy. We were reassessed in December because it only lasts for five years. And I'm pleased to advise that uh, we've now got our gold award again for the Employer Recognition Scheme, which I'm hoping, talking to RFCA, will be presented to the Council uh, at the Royal British Legion Scotland um, conference in 1718 of, of May this year. Thank you very much. Uh, no other comments or questions? No. Nope. So we'll move to the recommendations. When we're asked at 2.1 to note the activities undertaken by each outside body since appointments were made in 2022, where representation has remained stable for 12 months, as in the appendix. 2.2, agree whether any of the outside bodies should continue following review of whether any outside bodies should be removed from the scheme of outside bodies. I think we've basically agreed to keep it the same. So we noted one and agreed two. We now move on to item 14, which is a notice of motion, tree planting to offset carbon footprint emissions, report by Head of Economy and Resources. Before moving to the detail of the report, Given its subject matter, can we first agree to remove delegation from Economy and Resources Committee so that we may discuss it? Happy to agree that. Right, thank you. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Maureen Johnson and seconded by Councillor Ivor Hislop. The notice of motion is attached at the appendix to the report. 
Sarah Farrell, Climate Emergency Project Officer, is available on Teams to assist members with any questions. Councillors Johnson and Hislop, please propose and second your motion, after which I shall invite contributions and questions from other members. And I will remind you that the proposer has five minutes and the seconder two minutes. So, Councillor Maureen Johnston. Thank you, convener. I would like to propose my notice of motion on tree planting to offset carbon footprint emissions. There is concern and alarm being raised in our rural communities at the number of farming businesses in Dumfries and Galloway being sold to private companies with the sole purpose of planting trees to offset their carbon footprint emissions. There is little public engagement regarding carbon offset against tree planting and what it means to the local rural communities concerned. What has been coming through is the feeling of total disregard for the future of agriculture and the fact that tree planting on agricultural land is not considered a planning issue or a matter for local councils. People living in rural areas just feel powerless with little or no recourse. In the Locker Ward alone, there has been close to 1,000 acres of agricultural land sold for the above purpose. These companies can pay well above the average market value for land, pricing farmers out of the market. Quite often they buy as a syndicate or a company with the view to selling carbon credits and using offsetting schemes to avoid reducing emissions at source so that they can continue with business as usual. Farming businesses are a crucial part of our rural communities, providing employment for farmers, businessmen asso businesses associated with agriculture, local shopping, rural schools, contributing in so many ways to the local and regional economy and maintaining the fabric of rural communities. The loss of productive agricultural land reduces employment with families no longer living in rural areas, closure, closure of rural businesses associated with agriculture, therefore having a negative impact on all areas of rural and regional living. This will have an impact on our native fauna and wildlife who use our fields and open spaces to survive. We have ground nesting birds, curlews, lapwings, snipe, nightjars, red shanks, Birds who use the open spaces, buzzards, eagles, red kites, to feed. Also our mammals, our hares, voles, field mice, etc. And how credible is tree planting? Carbon dioxide released from fossil fuel can stay in the air from 20 to 200 years. Trees only store CO2 temporarily. To guarantee they will absorb CO2, trees would need to be in place for centuries and the right species of tree to absorb enough CO2 to make any credible difference. Compare this to the loss of agricultural land, causing an increase in imported animal produce, crops and grains from other countries, therefore increasing our carbon footprint, countries which we have no control over regarding animal husbandry, pesticides used on grains and crops, when in the UK we have strict procedures in place and traceability of all farm animals. The war in Ukraine brought it home to many how fragile our food security is and how quickly a shortage of grain can be felt in so many regions of the world. Now this is a time when we should be increasing our reliance on homegrown products, not using good agricultural land to grow trees. Perhaps these companies should look at reducing their carbon emissions at source. What rights do communities concerned have? It is a bit like the highland and lowland clearances. This will impact on every person in this country, as it is happening all over the country. We have some of the best produce in the world. Our ethics and standards are high. Sadly, this is not true of other countries that we may need to import from in the future if we continue to lose valuable agricultural land. We would like to ask that the Council agree that the Leader of the Council writes to the Scottish Government to propose that carbon emissions are cut at source rather than offset against the loss of agricultural land and our rural communities. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hislop, would you like to second the motion? Yeah, thank you. In seconding this, I think one of the main things we need to look at is food security. Now, just last week at the Environment and sorry, the Economy and Resources Committee, we took a decision uh, to look at the Scottish National Food Strategy. 
Now, within that, we one of the points was to make sure that there was food sustainability and security for this nation. Now, we are currently seeing in, for example, Locker Ward, uh, areas of land that aren't the best of land, yes, but aren't far away from being what we call Macaulay Institute 3. And uh, that can produce a wide range of crops. We're looking at 4.1, which narrow a range of crops. Now, if we can't maintain food security for an area, what happens? We see what happens in Brazil. Over in Brazil, we have seen rainforests uh, to the extent of 20 million hectares per year since 2016 being cut down. And what's happened there? They're bringing in land that isn't as fertile. It lasts for five years, and then they have to cut more trees down. We should be making sure that the fertile land produces our food and where we have uh, important resources, likes of your uh, rainforest, they're maintained to actually look at the carbon footprint. So that is why I'm seconding this motion. Thank you. Open up the comment and question. Councillor Jameson. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I've got a great deal of sympathy for this motion. Um, some of the, the narrative I could challenge. Forestry does employ people. Um, upland farmers struggle to make money at any time, because I know, because I've advised plenty of them. A lot of the issues with, with uh, the profitability of upland farmers is the supply chain pressures. But I do understand what you're, the, the, the ethos and the, and the ambition of this, so I'm not going to be picky about that. What I would say is, is it within our control? You're asking to write to the Scottish Government. The UK Emissions Trading Scheme um, is an EU scheme which the UK government took over in 2021. It covers Scotland, England and Wales. So I'm unsure, and, I'm, uh, and uh, the officials might want to delve into this, but I'm fairly sure that Scotland will not be able to do any independent legislation to counteract that scheme. However, as I say, I'm totally supportive of the ambition of this. Now, I suggest we look at the NFU Scotland's proposal to the Scottish Government, which reads, the Scottish Government and Scottish Forestry to adhere to the presumption against woodland creation on product, productive, not just prime agricultural land, with an emphasis on farm woodlands that add value to the agricultural business while delivering on climate and biodiversity objectives. Now, I would respectfully suggest that it's more likely to gain traction, and it's, that is NFU Scotland's policy. So I, I think we can all be in agreement that agri agriculture is hugely important in the Fish and Galloway. There's a lot of excellent land, and as, as uh, Councillor Hislop has mentioned, the Macaulay indicates the level of productivity. Now, actually, the Macaulay is very, very old. We're actually more productive than the Macaulay actually suggested because of modern agriculture. So my, my suggestion, and it's no more than that, is that we actually have a more accurate and, and doable uh, ask of the Scottish Government. If you want to, challenge the, the emissions trading scheme, it may be that you have to write to Westminster, but I don't see we'll get much change out of that. But in backing the NFU Scotland's proposal, which seems exactly in line with what we're talking about here, I think we're more likely to get some sort of traction. So I, I, I'll leave my comments at that just now. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thanks, 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 Chair. As you all know, I'm a farmer, a beef farmer, we're needing less trees and productive land. I've planted a number of trees in, on my unproductive land areas over the last few years, you know, to offset carbon and also to, uh, for biodiversity schemes. We're also facing shortage of beef and lamb in this area in shops, so we can't keep eating trees. Look at the Welsh Assembly, what they've done to the farmers there. Told them to plant 10% trees and 10% diversity schemes, up, uproar among the farming community in Wales. The really worrying situation around the corner is for farmers if the Galloway National Park goes ahead, possibly more trees, possibly less jobs for rural people and more red tape. This is a real worry for some of these dairy farmers if this National Park goes ahead in Galloway West. But one question I'd like to ask as well, what extensive consultation have you done with the NFU and the Scottish Landowners Federation on this, on this subject? 
Thank you. I'm not sure who can help us out with this. Uh, Sarah, are you aware of any consultation with NFU? I don't have that information to hand. I'm afraid I'm not aware at this moment. Thanks. Can't believe it. Councillor Dreibra. Thanks, Chair. I mean, obviously, this is this is a motion, um, and, and going forward, I don't see any problem with the motion. What, what's in the motion is, is, and the reasons for it, I do have a, a concern about. I mean, this is about how much land costs. Is if you, if you look at the, um, you know, the, the the people who put the motion forward, we've got these different things going on: food security, good food bill, you know, tourism, etc. That's actually happening. And, 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 and I do agree that uh, I do agree that we should cut carbon at the point of, of origin. Um, other than that, I think we, what, we, what we need to look at is how you know uh, farm uh, landowners sell their land as well. So it's not just about farmers. This is about landowners as well who have got huge you know potential of of of, of getting funds for for planting trees uh, in those particular areas. And again, we have to think about what type of trees are actually going to be in that particular area as well, because fast growing isn't always, always the best for the environment and ecology around about it. So in, in sort of essence, I don't have any issues with the, um, the, 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 the motion itself, it's just what's actually written, and I think that's what Councillor Jameson was saying as well, is about what's in the, in, in the, 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 the spiel. Thank you. Councillor Denerley. Thank you, convener, and I support uh, Councillor Dry Dreiber and uh, Maureen Johnson's motions about the importance of this topic. Topic: The Community Council, I've had a lot of feedback from the Community Council, a lot of concern and complaints about tree planting in the wrong locations. There's been no consultation with community councils and with the biodiversity um, we're, we're aware of the sale of businesses to be able to plant trees, and they're not the right type of tree either that's been planted. We, we need to look at native tree planting that fits within our environment, where our flora and fauna can thrive, and that we can have a ecosystem that is balanced and supports the communities uh, that live and work here. Um, yes, we need to look at land ownership, and uh, have consultation with the farmers and have some kind of a system whereby if they are selling land that we can look at also the sustainability of food and products um, that can be sold throughout the Dumfries and Galloway region. 7% of the, the land here, um, we need to look at the agriculture, we need to consider the uh, strategic plan to tree planting and look at having systems and processes in place that will support the right type of um, um, trees, but also attract the right wildlife and maintain our current wildlife. Thank you. Councillor Slater. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, I would support this motion. But what I have to say, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was involved with a company who top-dressed thousands and thousands of trees for the likes of Forest Commission, Fountain Forestry, and I just can't remember the name of the other one. But the fact is that a lot of these trees were planted against capital gains. Uh, also, the other thing about forestry, this type of tree is pl planted very close together and they grow very quickly. And the fact, if you go into these forests, there's, as, as say, Maureen said there, there's birds, animals, things like that. Nothing lives in these forests, it's just pine needles. And, and there's thousands and thousands of acres being planted, and I think the time is coming again where I believe the Forestry Commission say we're not planting enough trees for the next, we need to plant more trees in the next 10 years, otherwise we'll run short of this type of forestry tree. So I support, I support this, so I do, because of uh, land use, usage uh, for, trees that are not the foreign trees to this country, really, are not deciduous trees. That's really all I can really say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dempster. Thanks, convener. 
some food for thought for my friend, Councillor Bell and others. I drive from Sankar to Dumfries <laughs> two or times a week. I never see any crops being grown in the fields I drive past. Sometimes I can't, I can't even see livestock in the fields. So there's some contradiction about crop growing and providing food when there's no animals being brought on and no food being grown, or at least knowing the route that I travel uh, uh, within my scope of visibility. But to come to the, the, the point that Councillor Johnson raises, for a single landowner in my ward, and you can walk from the east coast to the west coast, I believe, and never leave his land. He's planting trees at an, at an alarming rate. One farmer's lost half his grazing to trees already. And what Councillor Johnson isn't covered in our motion uh, is the fish species. And fir trees take away all the water for tributaries, the, 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 the runoff in pine trees kill the small fish. So that will affect the Dumfries common good income because there's no more fish to be caught. There's a serious issue that Councillor Johnson raises. And I understand that once these forests are planted, the only thing you can do is replant them. There's so much damage done to the ground that you can't reinstate them to grazing. So there's certainly something having to be done. I would agree with Councillor Johnson. But her mind's maybe sharper than mine what we actually do to, to, to stop the planting. But certainly, it, it's certainly worth consideration the motion that should be put forward. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Convener. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I suppose it's back to maybe how effective can we be as a council if we agree the terms of the motion in terms of the actions we take? Uh, so I would, I, would, I would like to think we could maybe strengthen and target more effectively <laughs> the actions we do take to get a better result that achieves the outcomes we're all looking for, which is um, the right use of land to get the right outcomes in terms of food, biodiversity and all the rest of it. Because it is a, it's obviously going to be a balance across, across the piece. Um, so I was looking at a uh, paragraph in the officer's report, and it was just, I think it was 4. Point, um, let me just find it. 4.17, top of page 6 in the separate copy. And it's really just to get an understanding from the officer um, who provided the report. So it does say that the implementation of the schemes, uh, the UK schemes mentioned there, isn't assisting communities to be engaged and empowered in local decision making to maximise the opportunities. And it, it sounds like there's something that could be improved. Do we need to write to both governments about the terms of however this is uh, delivered to actually really get to the bottom of how we can have an influence of this? And similarly, if the NFU is uh, Councillor Jameson, and we can maybe confirm what their position is, but clearly what he's put forward is a seems like a eminently sensible suggestion, um, for, or at least to consult them to get that view um, as a representative group in terms of the, the farmers. So if that's a way that we can be more effective in our lobbying and representation, I would certainly um, suggest that to the movers and seconders of the motion if they could take that on board. Thank you. Councillor Johnston, you want to come in? Thank you, convener. It's just some of the points that have been coming forward. And someone raised the cost of the farmers selling the land. What we have here are businesses who are actually, the minute a farm comes on the market, they're coming in and offering well over the market value, completely pricing out any farmer from that land. And we're looking at syndicates and people from you know, London who are coming, you've got huge businesses, so that they can offset their emissions. So we're really pricing the local farmers out of the market. And if I can just give you some statistics here on one of the farms that has been sold in my, re my area, Locker Ward. Now, this is a 600 acres. On that farm, in that one year, beef, there was 64,800 kilograms of beef, lamb, 20,000 kilograms of lamb, and barley, 180 tonnes of barley. There was also straw for ha animal bedding, which was 90 tonnes of straw. And on that farm, there were five farm workers who worked this, that farm, and all under the age of 40. Now, these people have no longer got that land to work. They're all out of work on that piece of land. We won't be producing any of this beef, land, lamb or barley for the future. And we can't eat trees, as someone mentioned. And we've got to look at if there's no farmers, there's no food. 
I think we have to really, and this is not just Dumfries and Galloway, this is nationwide. That's my, what I'm, my point I'm also trying to get across, that we're losing families and people moving to country. We have tourism and agriculture, two of our largest industries and businesses, and they work side by side in many cases with agri-tourism. And I think we need to really look at this seriously and where we're going with this one. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think there's general support for the principle behind, behind the motion. Uh, and it's just, uh, there's a, other people waiting to come in, Tony, if you don't mind, I'll come back to you in a minute. Councillor Mayo. Thanks, Convener. Um, and in the far east, we have much the same type of problem. In fact, our problem started probably 60 years ago when they started to plant all the hill farms in Eslemuir. And in Eslemuir, we now have a sustainable forest. But the problem we're now facing is that our large landowner, as was mentioned, has suddenly sold off most of his land, and already we have probably 20 or 30 fields that have no trees growing in them without any consultation or anything else. We've got a very angry community council. We've got a very angry um, community. All small farms have just been wiped out, and all that's happened is the land has been sold to plant trees. Now, years ago, we also used to have a river that used to be lovely to fish, but it seems to be along the timescale of the trees growing and becoming sustainable, the river stopped producing even fish of the brown trout variety, never mind the salmon and sea trout. And where the pools used to have 10 or 12,000 sea trout in them, now if somebody sees 10 sea trout, they're excited. But this damage just is, going to, is, is going across our country, and I agree, we should be looking at how we produce to eat now in Britain, especially now that we're, we're separate from Europe. And we've got the land that could do that, and we could become totally self-sufficient, but we're not. We're selling off everything that can be sold off to plant trees on it. And, and Sitka spruce, which is the main tree, does not do anything at all for, for your carbon, because it's not, it doesn't in the ground long enough, and it's one of the poorest takers of carbon there is in the world. And as I say, we've got to find some way of starting to argue this, because there's going to be nothing left. And I know in the Esk Valley, all we're going to see now for about 10 miles is trees again on top of the largest, one of the largest forests in Europe. This will make it probably the largest one. And it's really, we've got to find a way to sort it. And I fully, fully appreciate and support um, this. Councillor McFarlane. Yeah, thank you, convener. Yeah, it's been really interesting listening to the, the conversation that's gone around this. Um, I mean, Maury's put it forward saying about offsetting carbon dioxide and such like, and then we've got other people saying that actually they don't absorb carbon dioxide, so you wonder why they're doing it. So for me, a lot of trees are planted for timber, uh, not necessarily because they're, they're using it to offset the, the CO2. We've, Councillor Denley made mention of, of one within our, our ward, whereby land has been brought and, and trees been planted, and you know the Community Council have come to us and asked us what can we do about it. And the inquiries we make mean that it's the Forestry Commission who make those decisions that actually we are powerless to do it. So unless there's legislation that means that we should be consulted and be involved in that, then really we're a bit powerless in relation to this. Um, as for, for the trees themselves, I mean, it's as if everybody hates trees all of a sudden, but actually they hold the, the soil together and we have had a lot of flooding in this area. If we don't have trees, we'll have a lot more landslip, we'll have a lot more soil going into the rivers, we'll have a lot more flooding, and, and they do serve a purpose. But I do think it's important that we look at where they are, why they're there, and, and if we can, get a wider range. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. That might be with all these things, it's a, it's a matter of balance. Uh, Councillor Moretti. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, first point. Um, uh, this country, since the Second World War, even during the Second World War, was never, ever able to produce enough food, which is why we had to import it and why we went on hunger strikes, uh, where we had to uh, uh, ration food. The second point is that Councillor Thompson raised some very good uh, issues on um, this agenda. I would like him to be able to repeat those because I want to hear what the motion and uh, what uh, Councillor... Um, what Ivor and Maureen have to say about that, because I never got an answer. Thank you. Ivor's next on the list to speak. So, Ivor, can you give a bit of clarity here? Chair, I actually welcome the discussion that's had. I think it has highlighted the issues there are. And 
I think the suggestions that have been made where we actually incorporate the NFU's proposal to look at where we plant trees, because that's my, more my concern, that we're using productive land to actually uh, put trees in. So that would be more of my uh, position. So I'd be happy to incorporate that. And if there are other areas that we should be exploring, likes of uh, going to the Westminster government, if that's required, then yes, we should write to them as well to raise our concerns. So I'd be happy to incorporate that, but that's my view anyway. Thank you. Leader, you want to come in? Just very briefly, convener, and thank you, because I think we're working towards a, a consensus. Um, I think it's fair to say that forestry is very valued in this region as well, and we can't get away from that. 27% of our region is forestry, and it's a big industry. And we're not trying to pit agriculture against forestry in any way, shape, or form. What we're talking about is businesses from out with this area who have no intention of, of, of even contributing to our forestry offering. Um, buying up farms and taking really you know, good farms out, out of circulation, which is dreadful. I think there are, I've spoken to both the cab sex fairly recently, one for net zero and one for rural affairs, around the tensions between forestry and farming because of this. And I think the key thing is that we have no locus in planning or change of use um, in Dumfries and Galloway or in, indeed with any council, nor do we have any locus to insist on consultation when a very productive farm is being taken out of agriculture to, you know, to carbon offset. And I think for me that that is the lobbying position that we should be taking as a council, whether it be with Scottish Government or UK Government or otherwise, incorporating the NFU's view as well. This is around empowering our local communities to have a say about what is happening in the region, which currently we have absolutely no locus in. So I think we're moving towards perhaps amending the motion, but I'd be very happy to take this away, look at the wording very carefully around it, what we need to get from this and ensure that, that all areas are covered. And that would apply to Forestry and Land Scotland as well, who do have you know, a say on what land can be used for forestry. Thank you. It's very helpful. Councillor Jameson. Yeah, th thanks very much, Leader. I think that's a very sensible approach. There's a danger here that We've all got a bit of knowledge in this, and we need to listen to experts. And I'm not an expert, but with all due respect, I'm more expert than maybe than some of you, because I've worked closely with agriculture and the forestry people in government, and I was part of a land-based commission with working with the forestry people and agriculture when I was with the NFE Scotland. I wasn't representing NFE Scotland, I was there as an independent commissioner. So I think we need to look at the, w w the anecdotes that come across are quite sensible and, and they're well-meaning. I'll go back to, the profitability of upland farmers it is really on a knife edge. And without environmental subsidy, etc., etc., people are farming in the uplands because that's what they do, <coughs> not necessarily because they make money. So I think we need to also look at the, the situation where a farmer's offered two or three times what his land's worth and he's worked all his life to make very little profit and he's offered that opportunity, then who are we to deny it? That's just an argument put forward from another perspective. So I, I agree with Gail that there's to be a balanced approach to this. And we need to put, if we've got to write letters to people, let's make them worthy of our council's opinion and a realistic approach that can we make a difference. Now we've talked about NFU Scotland, maybe we need to speak to forestry people, because the forestry, their mantra is right tree, right place and right purpose. So we need to hold them to account. In agriculture, we talk about the biodiversity. I went up to Del Rye and north of Del, Del Rye for another reason, and I used to be a consultant in that area. The land has gone to monoculture rubbish. It's monoculture scrub. It's not good to environment, it's not good to sheep, it's not good to anything. It's because there's no profitability in it. So we need to look at this from a balanced perspective, and I would, I, I, I totally commend councillors, the, the, the two councillors that have brought this forward, but let's make it meaningful. Let's make it meaningful so that we're actually doing something with a, an outcome rather than just making a statement. So I, I would go along with uh, the, the leader's suggestion and, and uh, Ivor's suggestion as well that we look at the wording and get it more effective. Thank you. Councillor Dougie Campbell. 
Thanks, convener. Uh, just, just some uh, ob observations, if I may, based on the discussion, which has been really interesting. And I understand that the motivation behind the the the, the motion. UK and Scottish governments have got uh, targets to massively increase um, forests to effectively sink carbon. Um, the debate over Sitka spruce is a, is a valid one uh, in terms of damage to the environment and the fact that they're, they're fast growing and are harvested perhaps 20, 25 years after they're planted. Uh, there is one or two good examples in the Glen Kens of the local community working with a landowner who wanted to uh, cover farmland in Sitka spruce and they managed to negotiate uh, a mix between Sitka spruce and uh, native broadleaf trees with paths for people to, to, to utilise. But on, on the NFU, um, Sarah will remember this, I'm not sure if you were there, Archie, but we did meet with Dumfries and Galloway NFU, uh, and they were quite clear, um, we'll support your, um, your ambitions for, for net zero. However, we will not countenance reduction in the production of lamb, milk, or, or, or beef. And there's a big debate about what part are farmers playing in carbon reduction. Uh, and, and I know a lot of that's around technology. Uh, people at like George and Graham will be able to give us their own perspective on that. But it's a very complicated uh, issue. Um, but I think, you know, to revisit a conversation with the NFU would be helpful, I think, uh, because ultimately it's farmers that are choosing to sell their land, albeit a, 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 a good inflated price, um, but that's individual choice to, to do so. Uh, as, as it is, uh, I'm happy to, to support the motion, uh, but there are caveats in there that I think that we've, uh, we've all raised this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So we are basically reaching consensus. So how are we going to take this forward? Oh, I have a suggestion here. I think given there's a lot of passion and knowledge on this and I have to sign it off and send it away, I don't normally give you advance copies of that. I think if we were to share it with each group leader prior to it being sent and they can share it with their respective woodland geeks like me in their group um, and then any amendments to that can be made and we would send it to whoever is appropriate. Okay. Okay. Councillor Johnson, are you happy with that as a way forward? Um, yeah, thank you, convener. Yes, I am. Um, I really just want to also, the reason I brought this motion today was to bring this to the attention of people because it's happening, but people don't see it happening. It's sort of going under the radar, and it's when suddenly we don't have that produce anymore and we're importing more. Um, that we need to really bring it to people's attention. So that was my main purpose in bringing this motion today and also to get some changes made if we can and maybe get some more control over planning on these, this matter. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go to the recommendations. So we agree to withdraw delegation 2.2. Consider the terms of the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Maureen Johnson and seconded by Councillor Ivor Hislop, set out in the appendix. And we've agreed that the leader will write to the appropriate parties after consultation with group leaders. Is that correct? Thank you. So we now move on to item 15. Notice of motion, call for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip and Israel to prevent a humanita humanitarian catastrophe and further loss of life. Report by Head of Government and Assur Governance and Assurance. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Tracy Little and seconded by Councillor Andy McFarlane. The notice of motion is attached at the appendix to the report. Councillors Little and McFarlane, please propose and second your motion, after which I shall invite contributions and questions from other members. And again, I'll just remind that the proposer has five minutes and the second or two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, convener. The unparalleled escalation of hostilities between Israel, Hamas and other armed groups has taken a devastating toll on the civilian population of Gaza. The level of casualties and the scale of destruction in the occupied Gaza Strip is unprecedented. Countless lives have been shattered, ripped apart and upended, and nearly 200 remain held hostage, including children and elderly. 
With each day that passes, more lives are lost and the humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza is getting worse. Much of Gaza has been destroyed and at least 75% of Gaza's entire population is now internally displaced. Gaza's healthcare system has been largely destroyed and the UN has said that water, food, fuel, medical supplies and even body bags are running out due to the siege. The shockingly high death toll, widespread destruction, engineered hunger and malnutrition, deliberate denial of humanitarian aid are all signs, warning signs of genocide. In January 2024, the International Court of Justice ruled that there is a real risk of genocide and ordered Israel to take preliminary measures to protect civilians. With no end in sight to the death and destruction we are witnessing, now more than ever, humanity must prevail. It is our collective responsibility. So my recommendations are today we put our voices together and call on all heads of government to prioritise the preservation of human life above all else. And due to the seriousness of the situation, Council asks that the leader of Dumfries and Galloway Council writes to the UK government and our two local MPs to call for an immediate ceasefire by all parties to end civilian bloodshed and ensure humanitarian aid access to Gaza. Members, anything less will be a stain on our collective conscience. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, Councillor... I'm getting lost here in my notes. Councillor McFarlane, can you, you please second the motion? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, as the elected members, we're often required to speak out on behalf of our communities, and this is often done through a notice of motion at full council. In many of these cases, we do so because we have a voice that others don't, and we have the opportunity to use it to draw attention to circumstances that we believe should be challenged for the wider benefit of others. This is one such notice of motion, whereby we are raising concerns, not on behalf of our communities, but on behalf of the people of Gaza. When Ukraine was invaded in 19 2022, we illuminated the Council HQ in Ukrainian colours to show solidarity. In this case, we have failed to show the same solidarity for the Palestinian people for almost six months. But we have this opportunity to speak out and challenge the UK government to oppose the actions of the State of Israel. We can align ourselves with the US and not side with the views of China and Russia, who recently used their vote on the UN to veto a ceasefire proposed by the United States. What is currently taking place in Gaza is collective punishment of the Palestinian people for the actions of a terrorist organisation over which they have no ability to resist. And we should not stand idly by and acquiesce to what is taking place. History will note our failure if we fail to do so. I second this motion. Thank you. I'm now open to questions and comments. Councillor Driver. Yeah, thank, thanks, Convener, and thanks to the um, mover and seconders of, of the motions. I don't think our group has any problems with this because this has already been to the Scottish Labour Party conference and it was agreed then. It's, it's been agreed at the UN in the last couple of days about this, this ceasefire as well. And I, I, I don't think, you know, uh, both, both councillors who proposed the SEC are under, under any um, misrepresentation that, you know, Dumfries and Galloway Council is a small voice in a big world. But it's a voice, and we need to show that voice at the end of the day. Um, and, and, you know, my, my group are, are totally, you know, uh, in, in agreement with this, with this motion, and I hope that it goes forward in the way suggested. Thank you. Councillor Slater. Councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, in total support of the motion that has come forward, uh, and you know, as has been said, what we see uh, on the national news and social media is collective punishment uh, of an unprecedented, unparalleled level. Uh, we uh, seem to ignore humanitarian grounds by uh, what is going on in Gaza, and I think that we should be calling uh, on the UK government to call for a ceasefire uh, in Gaza and to look for a, a resolution in terms of the two-state uh, and indeed uh, that be part of the whole negotiations uh, for the Palestinian people. Uh, so I'm in support of the motion and I would hope that it is fully endorsed today and agreed and we move forward on the, res on the motion. Have any further comments, questions, Councillor Ian Crothers? 
just a small point in regards to what Councillor Driver brought up, and I know we've discussed it previously, but has this been superseded? Does the language need to change slightly? I just, I suppose, the only point I've got in regards to the, the UN in particular. Thank you. Leader? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I support the spirit of, of the motion, but I think given events at the UN Security Council just a couple of days ago and, and that the UK government is in support of a ceasefire, um, we would be asking them to do something that they're already doing. So I wonder if we modify the wording to um, support the UK government in their support of the UN Security Council's position on an immediate ceasefire, because that has been decided. You know, that, that, that was voted on the other day. Um, so we would be asking them for something that they've already done. Um, so, but I, I'm not the writer of the motions, so... Councillor Hislop. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Leah. Oh. Well, perhaps what we could do is ask them why it's taking them so long. Councillor Hislop. Chair, maybe we could uh, ask the government if they could possibly keep pressure on... Uh, I think it's the Israeli government to allow humanitarian aid and we saw in the news the other night that limited amounts of humanitarian aid can get in through uh, drops from aircraft whereas if we could get that in through roads etc we could get more in quicker and relieve some of the issues that are there. Maybe that would be a better inclusion within the motion. Councillor Mayo. Thanks, uh, convener. Yeah, well, well, I fully agree with this. Does it go far enough in actual fact as well? Um, and Ukraine was mentioned, but at the moment we see half a million people either dead or seriously hurt in the, in the, in the Ukraine war. And should we not be adding these type of things if we're going to see it for all wars across, across the world? Because the number of people that are, that are being killed elsewhere is even of greater number. Plus, there's also the damage this is doing to, uh, to our communities right across, because we're all we're all going to suffer from this, from what's being, what's coming out with the bombs and shells as as we try and get get uh, the, the the planet neutral and and stop flying aircraft on fuel and stuff like that. So th th there's a bigger issue here. But I mean, I support this. But again, a ceasefire may not solve the problem because that this problem will not stop until someone like Iran says we accept Israel as a nation and we don't want to wipe it off the face of the planet. And as long as that is there, you're going to have your Hezbollahs and your Hamas always firing a rocket and starting the thing off again. I, I, this has got to stop, but, but there's got to be other ways to stop it. And I believe other gov the government should be putting pressure on people like Iran to accept Israel as a nation and, and, and really stop this once and for all, because a ceasefire will not stop it. It'll start again this year, next year, five years' time. So I just wonder if this needs to be strengthened in some way to even call for, for something like the, not just a, a ceasefire, but a permanent solution involving countries like Iran, etc., to, to make sure it can work. Thank you. Is there anyone else want to come in? Councillor Little, I was just going to bring you in there, just on the back That's of his comments. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I don't believe this has been superseded because, as Councillor um, uh, Dreiber has said, we're maybe a small voice, but we're a voice, and we need to we need to add the weight of our voice to this, and we need to keep pressure. Things can be agreed within governments, but they can also be U-turned on. We haven't seen this happen yet. This, there, there's been agreement, but it's not actually physically happened yet. So I am. I, I'd like to see us just keep adding to that pressure. Um, as, as well as um, Councillor Hislop had said um, about his inclusions in the, in the second part of the recommendations, uh, um, we've asked to ensure the humanitarian aid access to Gaza. So I, I think that kind of covers his, um, his input there. Thank you. Councillor John Campbell. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Convener. Yeah, I, I take on board what the leader was saying. Uh, I, I watched on the news uh, about the UN uh, ratifying a ceasefire. However, since that was ratified, the State of Israel have decided to withdraw the negotiators. So they're hell bent in carrying on. So uh, if it might help, maybe the second bullet point, 
you know, we were asking the UK government, the MPs, to call for immediate ceasefire. I think maybe we should just put our support uh, for the UK, uh, you know, making that ceasefire, uh, or at least voting on that ceasefire at the UN. I don't know if that would be acceptable. Councillor Little. So it's basically saying the same, but adding the words, the su support in the UK government. Is that what we're saying here? Um, Councillor Campbell. I'm trying to find a way forward, you know, I mean, I, I think we agree, and the leader uh, rightly outlined that, you know, things have already taken a step forward in the UN. So maybe, maybe it's just a slight change of word in it, but, but we do support a ceasefire. And we like to add that voice as Councillor Driver is. We might be a small group, you know, but we'd like to add that voice. Uh, I, I, I don't know if Councillor Little uh, wishes to include that. I, I understand but potentially the difficulty you might have in you know, supporting the, the government, but we, surely we can support or encourage the government to support the decision of the United Nations. I don't have an issue supporting a government that's going to go the right direction with this issue at all. This is um, not a prejudice in any way, shape or form. I just want to make sure we lend our voices as a strength behind everything. And I just want the right word. I thought this was basic language just to say we, we support and we want to, um, you know, to add to that to make sure that happens and to, and to contact uh, our local MPs and the, um, the UK government because that is where their mandate is. So, um, to add other sort of softening the edges, I'm not comfortable with softening the edges. But I, don't, I don't think there's any question of softening the edges. We want this to go ahead, that there is a, a ceasefire. We, we want that to happen and we want to enable aid, humanitarian aid to get through. That's the goal of the whole thing. So, it's the form of words we use to put that across. Councillor McFarlane. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, a number of my colleagues have talked about us being a small voice. When Nelson Mandela was incarcerated, the city of Glasgow gave him the freedom of the city. And on his release, the first place he went when he left South Africa was Scotland to go to Glasgow to take up that honour. And he recognised that councils have the power to shape the thinking of people locally and to raise issues and causes. So I don't think that the fact that we are hear that we are impotent, we have the opportunity to get the message out that we support the ceasefire, that we want humanitarian aid to get through, and if we don't say it, then who will? Well, the thing is as well, Andy, you know, you know, many many voices make a large voice as well, so if we, if we, if we join behind that, Councillor Dougie Campbell. Thanks, Convener. I, I think we're making this more complicated than, than it, it needs to be. I think, um, as well as I know everybody in this room, we all want an immediate ceasefire. We acknowledge that Dumfries and Galloway is just a wee place in the southwest of Scotland, but we represent our constituents, and our constituents are telling us that they want an immediate ceasefire. Uh, it's about solidarity. I will join the Labour Party if I keep up this kind of language. <laughs> but, but it's, it's about <laughs> it, it, it's about solidarity and uh, giving a voice to the people out there that, that speak to us um, and are deeply concerned. So I, I I think we accept the motion as it stands. Thank you. I'll send in my application shortly. Good offer. Uh, thank you. The Chief Executive has been busy uh, paraphrasing a lot of this, and she's. <laughs> Came up with a with a, a, a suggestion, but I mean, the end, the end of the day, the end result's got to be the same. Thank you, and and just in response to the the debate, I'm just you know, it's a suggestion that might help. Um, and so the second bullet point could read: Due to the seriousness of the situation, Council asks that the leader of the of Dumfries and Galloway Council writes to the UK government and our two local MPs to press for an immediate ceasefire for all parties to end civilian bloodshed in support of the UN's decision to call for such a ceasefire and ensure humanitarian aid access to Gaza, because it recognises the UN position. I'm happy with that. Councillor Ferguson, um, McFarlane is yet. 
Councillor Ferguson, you want to come back? And uh, you want, well, yeah. you'll come back, come in. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, 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 thanks, Don, for that, because that actually, I think, uh, helps clarify it. Uh, somebody said there about small things. Uh, it was Andy, Andy Mack. Actually, the, the very the smallest thing that the then Labour administration did in the city of Glasgow was they renamed a street to Nelson Mandela Place. And it just happened to be the street where the South African Embassy was. So every letter that came to them came with Nelson Mandela's name on the, the letter. Right? So we things do count, because that was then quoted all over the world, right? as you know, a really, really good way of just driving home to a, a, an administration who didn't want things to, a, to do it. So um, I don't want to take up too any more time on this, because I think we've got a consensus now, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll just move to the recommendations on that basis. We've been asked to consider the terms of the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Tracy Little and seconded by Councillor McFarlane as set out in the appendix. And we're as progressing as amended with the wording provided by the Chief Executive. Thank you very much. We now move on to item 16, notice of motion, period products to be fully accessible at point of need in our schools. Report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Before moving to the detail of the report given its subject matter, can we first agree to remove delegation from Education and Learning Committee so that we may discuss it? Yes, we're happy to do that. Yep. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Tracy Little and seconded by Councillor Kim Lowe. The notice of motion is attached at the appendix to the report. Lindsay Green, Principal Officer, Health and Wellbeing, and Carnan Bryden, Quality Improvement Manager, are available to assist members with any questions. Councillors Little and Lowe, please propose and second your motion, after which I shall invite contributions and questions from other members. Thank you, convener. Me again. Menstruating is a basic fact of human existence. Period products are necessities, not luxuries, and should be available to everyone who needs them. This is more important than ever, as many struggle during the cost of living crisis. And the cost of these products may not seem excessive to some, but to others, that cost is unachievable. Now, Period Products um, Free Provision Act 2021, the Act was passed in late 2020 and came into effect. And it places legal duty on local authorities to ensure anyone who needs products used during menstruation, such as tampons, menstrual cups, and um, sanitary towels, um, can access them for free. Now, Rafis and Galloway Council responded positively to this challenge because they were, in fact, ahead of the game, having already made these products free and available in schools. But how are we delivering? Now, dignity is a basic need. It's also a fundamental right of every person. Now, let me ask you to consider the following scenario. A 14-year-old girl in school sits down for a wee during break time because, God forbid, she needs to go visit the toilet during class time, which is another issue regarding this very matter. And she discovers her period has arrived either unexpectedly, either, um, well, when you're young, the, your period isn't necessarily punctual or time reliant, or indeed, it could be the very first day of her very first period. So now she panics. She reaches out for toilet tissue. There's nothing there, um, or very limited, and she's embarrassed, she's shy. Maybe she's neither. But now she has to walk the distance from the school toilet, down corridors, passing perhaps hundreds of other students, because it's break time after all, and everyone's milling about, makes her way to the school office, all while bleeding. There she must wait her turn in a queue to speak to a staff member, all while other are mil others are milling about, it's break time after all. She must alert the staff member of her dilemma. The staff member must alert another staff member, the keeper of the period products cupboard key, which must be a very important role given the security apportioned. Though this alerting the key bearer in some schools is done by tannoy system. Now she's still waiting and she's still bleeding without protection. And the key holder eventually arrives, goes to the heavily protected cupboard and hands the girl a single sanitary towel and proceeds to lock the cupboard again. Now, the 14-year-old must now make the journey back to the toilet to apply the towel, which won't be so easy because now she has bloody underwear. Now, she's also now late for class, so must explain her lateness on entry to her classroom and possibly, or probably, receive a detention for being late. And she can't really sit down, or the blood will soak through her skirt and trousers and mark the chair, and she'll spend the rest of the day with a blood stain on her clothes, 
for all to see. How to humiliate our young people in one easy step. Now consider the same situation if we have a 14-year-old trans male in the same position, fully accepted as a gender identified, normally confident because of that, but now has to go through the whole aforementioned. Office staff may not be privy to this, this pupil's gender status. Why should they? So now they have to go through another distressing explanation process, all while still bleeding. Now, how uncomfortable some of you feel right now regarding this form of narrative. It's not the usual, usually done in chambers, but I can assure you it's nowhere near as the discomfort experienced by pupils in this situation on a daily basis. Why are we locking up and guarding period products that are supposed to be free and freely available to our pupils? And why are we dishing them out one at a time? Many of our pupils do not have the finances to, for, to be able to purchase enough to last the whole period time. And that's the very reason they're free. And justification sometimes is given as they could be stolen if they're freely accessible, and that is ridiculous. If they're going missing, it's because they're needed. There isn't a black market for tampons, and no one's selling them on. They're being used, either in school or enough's been taken to see out the duration of the period. That is their purpose. You go into pubs, clubs, restaurants, cafes and community spaces, and these necessary products are openly in tubs and baskets, unchained, unguarded and completely acceptable, accessible to all who require them. So why are some of our schools choosing this form of restricted distribution? Now, I've spoken to elected members from other councils across Scotland, and all but none are flabbergasted at our take on the delivery of this policy. So today I'm asking members to support this motion unanimously. I ask that Council agrees that those in need of period products in school should not have to inform or seek permission from a staff member. And to create a blanket policy for dignity, Council asks that Dumfries and Galloway Council Education Department instructs all schools that period products should not be kept under lock and key, but should be freely available in all school bathrooms at the point of need. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lowe. Thank you, Councillor Little. Fellow members, you've heard what Councillor Little has said. In the event that a pupil is caught short at school, their education can be disrupted by practical issues of access to period products. This means they either miss out on part of a lesson at best, or feel so awkward about going to school when they need more frequent visits to the toilet that they've taken the day off, and that has much greater effect. The layout of many of our schools does not help. But at least of the policy, if the policy that period products are made available free at point of need is followed, it would make their school day pass much smoother. Fellow members, and I repeat the word, is dignity. Young people who already face so many pressures need every support to be able to learn to the best of their ability. So the additional indignity of walking extra distance to collect an item which should be accessible in the toilet is extremely embarrassing. Then to receive maybe just one item and have to repeat the exercise later in the day more than once is not acceptable. Period products are expensive, but we have agreed to provide them. We have the funding. In fact, we've topped that funding up and there should be no problem allowing our pupils to take what they need when they need and not having to ask another person. So I appeal to every member here, including our male colleagues, to support this notice of motion. If you have younger children, maybe teenagers now, or those who have been teenagers, who have needed menstrual products, just think how they would feel experiencing that scenario that Councillor Little has outlined. This is policy. It is fully funded. It needs to be followed in every council building for all ages including being immediately available in schools on their return next week or the week after, where the policy is not being followed. I hereby second this motion. Thank you. Do we have any questions from anyone? Any comments? Councillor Norwood. Thank you, Chair. I just think we move the motion and agree it um, without a great deal of debate. I don't think there's a great deal of debate to be had about this from my perspective. It is legislation that is there. It should be followed. End of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So on that basis, we'll just move to the recommendations. We have agreed to withdraw delegation from the Education and Learning Committee in 2.2, subject to agree and consider the terms of the motion 
proposed by Councillor Tracy Little and seconded by Councillor Kim Lowe. So we, we've done that and we've agreed the motion. Thank you. So now item 17, notice of motion, support our staff's right to strike, report by Head of People and Transformation. Before moving to the detail of the report, given its subject matter, can we first agree to remove delegation from the Economy and Resources Committee so that we may discuss it? Yes, thank you. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Andy Ferguson and seconded by Councillor Katie Hagman. The notice of motion is attached at the appendix to the report. Mike Shepley, Head of People and Transformation, is available to assist members with any questions. Councillors Ferguson and Hagman, please propose and second your motion, after which I shall invite contributions and questions. Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, for letting me speak. Uh, just for the record, I think uh, Councillor Thompson's going to second because I think Katie Hagman's still at a funeral. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak and uh, move this notice of motion. I think uh, I need to start by reminding Council of the many hitches, drawbacks and obstacles put in the way of an employee who wishes to take the ultimate sanction if they are caught up in a protracted industrial dispute. Is there a right to strike is an often asked question. I would suggest there, uh, there is, and that view is supported by international law, which successive UK governments have followed until now. In 1948, the then Labour government introduced and recognised the Convention on the Right to Strike, introduced by the International Labour Organization. This was followed by the Council of Europe's Social Charter in 1961, which was ratified by the then Tory government. This was further supported by the United Nations International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in 1966. All of these have been upheld by successive UK governments until now. So to the motion. So there's little doubt that the legislation referred to in the motion is designed to limit the effect that workers in certain sectors will be restricted on what activity they can engage in to complement what is a legitimate industrial grievance. However, the Act is worded in a way that allows employers to dispense with the rights set out in the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidations Act of 1992, commonly known as TOLRA which was introduced at the time by the Conservative government. TOLRA started to weaken and limit the rights of workers, bringing in new conditions uh, around strike action, uh, like having, having to give due notice of the intention to withdraw labour, or strike as we would refer to it. Interestingly, interestingly, Tony Blair, in his election campaign in the late 1990s, promised to dispense with TOLRA but it appears that Mr Blair forgot his party's roots and, unsurprisingly, Tolra is still on the statute book. Fast forward to today, and we have this legislation which enhances the rights of employers to take more draconian action against their workforce if they wish to do so. It does not say employers must use it, giving employers the right to do so if they choose. Included in this new legislation is the proscribed workplaces, is the removal of protection previously given to workers. It is particularly relevant to us as a council, as education, health and transport come entirely or to some extent under our remit. Further the right in including further areas into legislation lies solely at the whim of UK ministers, should they choose to do so. So what's next? Is it the bin men? Um, it should be noted that this council has an excellent record of understanding and mutual cooperation with our joint trade unions especially during industrial disputes, and we have always come to agreement to support minimum service requirements in emergency type services, for example, social work. This Act, as mentioned in the Notice of Motion, has received widespread condemnation from trade unions, and both the Welsh, which is a Labour government, and the Scottish, which is an SNP Green government, have refused publicly to use the rights given to them under the Act. Again, the current Labour leader and probable Prime Minister in waiting has said that, like Tony Blair in the 1990s, he will abolish this legislation when, not if, he takes office. But can we really take the chance and wait for that promise to be fulfilled? Colleagues, I'm urging you to support this motion, condemn the legislation and refuse to use it against our workforce, write to the UK Government supporting the Welsh and Scottish Government's position, and finally, 
write to COSLA in support of both Scottish and Welsh governments and asking that we create a partnership with the trade union colleagues, including the SGC, SNCT, Craft and Chief Officer Collective Bargaining Groups. I move the motion. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Convener. And I can't really add more to the knowledge that uh, Councillor Ferguson has drawn upon to make uh, his initial speak speech, but I think um, we spent quite a long time in a recent committee, I think, agreeing that the most valuable asset to a council is its staff. Um, so it's very hard to really see another way uh, other than to second this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Councillor Driver. Thanks very much, Chair. And, you know, I, I don't have any issue with the, the, the motion coming forward because, you know, the, the Labour group here in Dumfries and Galloway were the only group that were actually out with the strikers last year when the, the school strikes were on with their staff. So I'm really pleased to, to support this. What I do have a concern about is this continuous knocking back and forward between the Scottish Government and the UK Government about what's right and what's, what's actually wrong. No problem with the motion, absolutely no problem at all. I think everybody has the right to strike. You know, at the end of the day, they have to go through a process and the reason why they're striking, they have to ballot their members. And that all, as Andy says, that all takes time and they have to go through that, that, that motion. So, so I don't have any problem at all with the motion. But let's get away from blaming each other government. The two, the two, two governments for Scottish people need to start working together to better improve the terms and conditions of the workforce here in Scotland to make sure that they don't need to strike in the first place. That would be a good one. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, just to draw attention to the fact this is a reserved issue. So we can you go to the Scottish Government about it. Are we any further comment, Leader? Thanks. I don't have any particular comment. It's maybe more of a question for, for the mover or seconder of the motion. Um, does COSLA have a position on this? Has it already been discussed through leaders um, and the various places there? Because it seems to me that we're writing to support a position of a Scottish and Welsh government that COSLA don't have a position on. And I'm not sure if that's the correct way to do things, but I'll take my lead from the mover. Convener, can I come in? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the intention, of course, is to write to COSLA suggesting that actually we just, that's exactly the, uh, the action we take. If COSLA don't have a position, then we should be, as a council, asking COSLA to uh, have a position. But in the meantime, talk to all the other bodies that COSLA currently works with in terms of uh, staff conditions, terms conditions, that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, uh, I think we're in the same hymn sheet here, uh, Gail. Um, Yeah, that's fine. So we can write to COSLA to ask them to consider what COSLA's position would be, but that's not what's in the motion. It does say supporting the position of both Scottish and, and Welsh governments. I don't think we have the remit to do that. So I think we need to be careful in how we word this one, that we're asking COSLA to look into this issue and form a, a, a national position. It's not normal for us to, to form a position as a local authority before you know, leaders and, uh, and COSLA have discussed it. it. It's usually the other way around. But maybe I've been in the employer's team for too long, I don't know. Councillor Ferguson, as well, uh, Vlad's seeking a wee bit of clarity on, on the motion. Vlad? Yes, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, uh, it's just uh, for, for uh, clarity and transparency uh, for all concerned. Uh, as I read the motion, uh, although it says Dumfries and Galloway Council, th there's a, an important paragraph above that uh, which states this notice of motion asks Council to follow the lead of Scottish and Welsh governments and refuse to use the legislation to curb and deny uh, our loyal workforce to the right to withdraw their labour during legitimate industrial disputes. So it's just to clarify that that's part of the motion, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, yes, absolutely, because uh, we, we, we set the tone here. We are the employers, not the Scottish Government, not the UK Government. We, uh, the Council, are the employers. So it's up to us to actually implement this, or use it or not. So it's within our gift to say we don't want to use it. Thank you. I'm just going to bring Mike Shep. Mike, can you give us a bit of, a, a bit of an idea about you know that particular part? 
the notice of motion asked Council to follow the lead of the Scottish Mills Government and refuse to, to use it. Are we able to refuse to use legislation? Oh, sorry, Vlad's going to take that one over. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, sorry, Mike. Um, yeah, we discussed this. Uh, so, in terms of um, the legislation, it's, 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 I think Councillor Ferguson's probably summarised it uh, uh, well in terms of uh, it's simply a tool for employers to use if they wish to use it. They do not have to choose to use it. The legislation's there, and if full council agrees, then we wouldn't be implementing that. Um, but uh, another uh, important point to note is that in that sort of scenario, uh, if officers uh, were looking to use that, we would generally bring that to full council anyways, um, and therefore uh, it would be for uh, full council to decide that in the future uh, as well, if that were to be the case. But uh, in this instance, just to clarify, the legislation is there. It, it's not forcing employers to use it. It's simply another mechanism for employers to use if they so wish. And if full council takes a position on that, that's the position. Thank you. Is councillor? No, councillor Scobie. Yeah, Chair, as a, a, an active trade unionist all my days, uh, I, I would support the motion in, in, in the spirit that has been introduced. I was always of the belief that bad legislation should be resisted, not just for, for Scotland, as Andy has pointed out. This is a reserve matter for all our comrades and brothers and sisters. That it was language in the trade and the, the Labour as well. So we would look for uh, it to be repealed at the earliest opportunity. Uh, and hope that the Council will adopt that we don't uh, use the legislation in any way when a, a, an individual is exercising the right to withdraw their labour and go on strike. Uh, and I think that's the essence of, the, of the, the motion. But to also add weight to the Welsh and the Scottish uh, governments in asking the, the, the current one to, to reconsider their position in this legislation. Councillor Ian Crothers. I suppose I'm not wanting to be controversial here, but I may be the only person in this room who actually supported this bill going through. It certainly feels like it. But uh, I suppose I've got a question, regards because my understanding this this was this 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 uh, bill struck uh, legislation was about keeping the country running. It was about stopping the impact. It was about stopping folks' right to strike. That's the last thing it was about. Should I would always defend that 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 okay, members of unions have right to strike. Uh, but that's about keeping the country running. That's another thing as well. That's why I was supportive of this when it came through. I just wonder if I get clarity in the guys. I don't know if that's Mike or who that is or Vlad. Or, but I mean, my understanding, that's what the act was for. It wasn't act to actually stop people striking. But when it comes to people's health care, their education, border protection, so on and so forth, as well outlined within the actual motion, that's what this was about. And Vlad's already outlined that actually this is, this is up to the individual corporate organisation to implement it if they wish. So I can understand the political stance in regards to this and, and, and it'll be what it'll be, but I feel like the only member in here that's actually was in support of this legislation for the right reasons, not even really for political reasons. So there is a question there, uh, Convener. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, just very briefly, the, um, the narrative behind this that was passed on to um, all HR, heads of HR uh, and HR professionals on a wider context was that what this act has tried to do is to find that balance between the right to strike um, and obviously the right to protect society. Um, those are the words of the government, not, not mine. Um, and therefore, as uh, I will um, agree with uh, Vlad, my colleague, that whatever decision is, is taken uh, today and forward at full council uh, would be the decision that uh, officers would support. What I would say also is that in terms of uh, um, minimum levels, um, that is in effect um, already in place, albeit on a voluntary basis. Once um, there is a notice of a right to strike, the dialogue doesn't cease. We actually um, continue to engage with the trade unions, um, allowing the, the rights of their members um, to proceed, but also to ensure that um, we find some way of ensuring that public services can still be delivered. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. So, no, <laughs> thumbs up from Councillor. Right. Thank you. So, happy so, that confirmation, Kevin. Thanks. Mm. So, and Councillor Ferguson. Thank you. I'm hoping I'm going to shoot myself in the foot because it looks as if we've got consensus. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, as somebody, and there's a number of others in the uh, in the council chambers here who are in uh, council roles who have been involved in industrial disputes negotiations in the past. Right? This legislation, some of this legislation was driven by employers not budging. Right. That's the bit you need to keep into mind, into mind here, because they can be, if it's an us and them situation, it, the, the best one I can think of in recent memory was the, the, the BS strike, where they had to bring in new negotiators from both sides, and they got a, they got a resolution within a, a week. Right? So uh, we, we kind of lose sight of that. It's uh, both sides need to toe the line at times. Yeah, these things always come down to dialogue in the end of the day. That's the way, that's the way things work. Right. So we've uh, agreed, we've considered it and uh, discussed it. So, and in the absence of any alternative, <laughs> nothing else, it looks like your motion is uh, unanimously agreed, Councillor Ferguson. Now, I've had a, had a request for a wee five minute comfort break, if everybody's happy with that. So we'll, I will just make it come back at 10 past. Would that do? Yeah. Thanks.
move on to item 18. Notice of motion, health and social care provision in Dumfries and Galloway, report by Chief Officer. Before moving to the detail of the report, given its subject matter, can we first agree to remove delegation from Social Work Services Committee? Thank you. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Dougie Campbell and seconded by Councillor Willie Scobie. The notice of motion is attached at the appendix to the report. David Rowland, Director of Strategic Planning and Transformation, is available on Microsoft Teams to assist members with any questions. Councillors Campbell and Scobie, please propose and second your motion, after which we'll invite contributions and questions from other members. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, members, Willie, who is seconding this motion, will focus on some of the, the real-life problems with access to health and social care in our communities. However, I want to provide the wider context on why we have submitted this motion and what we want to achieve. I know that from recent conversations, sorry, I know that from recent conversations with senior officers and members that we widely share concerns about our influence within the health and social care partnership and how we work together effectively as a council in partnership with the NHS in the face of some very tough times ahead. We might focus on different aspects that impact the communities we represent, but the principles are more or less the same. So I welcome that our conversations have been productive and that our IGIB representatives will now receive briefings prior to IGIB meetings on the Council's position where decisions have been made on our behalf. And the recent seminar on the functioning of the IGIB and the Health and Social Care Partnership which helps us develop our understanding of the, how the partnership operates. I think the, this bodes well uh, with the, the changes of leadership in both social work services and the NHS, but the question I'll throw out to you is, what is our role as elected members? Do we sufficiently scrutinise decisions on health and social care? What are the consequences for our constituents if we don't? This isn't a criticism of the NHS, Health and Social Care Partnership, Council or IGIB. If anything, it's a criticism of our, us as elected members. It's simply an assertion that we can and should perhaps do more to influence decision making in this area for the benefit of those who don't have a platform to do so. If the motion is adopted today as it currently stands, we're recognising the roles of local action groups, tell them that, telling them that we hear you and that we understand your legitimate concerns for the future in the teeth of a perfect storm with the financial challenges the NHS and the Council are faced with. Changes are inevitable. No one is arguing this. And I don't like the term transformation as it invariably promises more than it delivers. And whilst there's no avoiding the fact that we need to do more with less, cuts of services are always more damaging for rural communities whether it's banks, dentists, schools, pharmacies, post offices, public transport or cottage hospitals, communities are becoming increasingly more isolated. For me locally, it's supporting a local action group that has considerable community support in arguing the case for Kirkubri Cottage Hospital uh, to keep care local. We're concerned that our hospital will be an easy target for savings, and I know that some action groups and elected members in other wards will share those concerns. If rural communities in particular are the focus of service cuts, such as cottage hospitals, this equality gap in health and social care provision will widen further, which will impact directly on people's lives, health and well-being. I don't think there's anyone in this room, at least I hope not, that, but it was suggested recently that politicians need to better understand, and a better understanding, sorry, on the financial challenges being faced but my response to that is that perhaps it's a lack of understanding of rural communities and all the challenges that brings that needs to be understood. So this motion isn't about bricks and mortar. mortar. It's not an emotional attachment to buildings. It's about not sleepwalking through the loss of services, urban and rural, but recognising that rural communities will be particularly more vulnerable to disproportionate loss of services. It's about taking a principled position on how we scrutinise and mitigate the impact of changes to service provision, whether that be care at home, care homes, cottage hostels or maternity services in the, facing, in the face of increasing demand, recruitment challenges and insufficient funding. 
I hope that we have some healthy debate today on our role as councillors and as community leaders and how best we can influence the decisions that may have consequences for our constituents for many years to come. If we achieve that today, the motion will have been worth it. Please support the motion. Thank you, Kieran Veer. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Thank you, Chair. I'm delighted to see the breadth of motions being considered today. And I was pleased to hear Andy McFarland talk on, on two other motions today that we should be listening to the community. Well, we're asking, the motion is asking to listen to the communities in health and social care services. I see in 3.4 of the report that the Health and Social Care Partnership recognises the importance of engaging with local communities. Yet, in the three public meetings that have been held so far, 800 of the communities turning up in Kakubri, 200 plus in Newton Stewart, and 210 in the recent one public maintenance draw, the Health Board and IGB were invited to that, cordially invited, yet no one attended. They reclined the invitation to all three. All we are asking is engage with the public. And if the public are asking for public meetings, then that's what the Health Board should be uh, responding to as public servants. I want to build on, on, on what Dougie says, and that's again, what uh, the communities expect of the, uh, their elected representatives. And that's to stand up for the, the health and social care services that they uh, treasure and they value. They want to see their cottage hospitals reopen, not necessarily as uh, they were in the past, but for respite, rehabilitation, palliative care, step down, step up provision against what we're being uh, asked is care uh, in care homes when we know one in five in Scotland are closing. We just heard the one in Lanarkshire uh, this month, uh, and we've had two recent ones in, in, in the past number of years. 3,500 hours on met care hours. Care homes unable to recruit, uh, yet we're being asked to, to accept that we'll, we'll, the IGB will purchase 80 beds, 31 in the first year. A motion to this effect uh, was agreed uh, by this council only last year in terms of our cottage hospitals and the use of those. This month, we've heard for the health board that uh, is running with a deficit of 35 million. Colin Smith at the public maintenance in announced that it's now at 54 million with 20 mile, 29 million savings to, to, to be found in, in this year. And at the same time that they announced this deficit, they also announced that there was to be a re review of the Galloway Community Hospital. That's 75 miles away from the General Hospital. And the fear is within the public that they'll consider downgrading the accident and emergency minor injuries uh, and close acute wards. That fear is genuine and it's for public servants and the health board to come and explain what they actually mean. We've had a review on the maternity services in the Gallo County Hospital, and I would thank Gail for her, her efforts when, when I was putting that forward, that we had that review. That review has been held, and the recommendations from, from the, the review body was that the preferred option was to reopen the Gallo Community Hospital maternity unit as a midwifery-led service. That unit is still not open and there was, uh, for what I can understand, there was a fallout in, in between the board and the IGB as to what they, they, they wanted to support. It's back out to consultation. What are the consultants? And we know what the people want. We know what the women want rather than go through the horrendous experiences that we've read in the paper, we've seen on, on, on local news of uh, women giving birth at the side of the road. Or, or, or of what the recent one uh, where, sadly, a, a young woman lost her child in the back of an ambulance that didn't even get leaving the car park at the Galloway Community Hospital. That's unacceptable, and that's the services that the people are, are, are asking for. We've... We, aye. Oh, aye. Sorry. Recent aye. Uh, I, I'll... Move to, to the right care, right place. 
And I'll, I'll not go into this in any great depth because I think that Pauline Drysdale, as the, the chair of social work, put it eloquently in terms of all our concerns, in terms of the right care, right place. And we go to see, are they listening? Because it doesn't feel like they're listening when, when, when they make the decisions that they do. And Dougie has spoken of it. We want the, the, the more scrutiny of the reports. We, we, we want to see more monitor. And I, I'm pleased to note in the earlier report that that is now being built into uh, our role uh, uh, as councillors. But the question was asked to me, uh, what do we want from the IGB councillors? Well, what we want from the IGB councillors is we expect elect the elected representatives to stand up for the local health and social care partnership services that, that, that are delivered. We want them to listen to the communities uh, that elected all of us and to reflect the views of, 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 of the community. We want them to take cognizance of, of council decisions. And already we've had a, a motion passed in this council on uh, right care, right place, uh, cottage hospitals. We've had maternity uh, motions passed, but we don't seem to think that they are listening to what we are saying, both as a community or as a council and council uh, representatives. We want to, to scrutinise, as I've said, uh, uh, reports and challenge laws or, or services, uh, local social care uh, and health services. Chair, I'm delighted to, to second the motion. I hope that we will get unanimous support here today for the very reasons that the community are asking us to do and, and, and to protect uh, uh, and secure the services that they treasure and value. I second, Chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, I'd like to support the motion and I'd like to thank Councillor Campbell and Councillor Scobie. I strongly feel that with the newly appointed service director and also the head of Children, Family and Justice, plus the appointment of the CEO of the NHS and the interim officer of Dumfries and Galloway Health and Social Care Partnership, we now do have a better opportunity to work more efficiently and effectively to scrutinise the decision-making process which affects the health and welfare of our communities, particularly those in rural areas. So following discussions after the last Social Work Committee meeting that um, Councillor Scobie alluded to, and as Chair of Social Work, and on behalf of myself, the Vice Chair, and the majority of political groups, we wrote to the Health and Social Care Partnership noting our concerns regarding right care, right place consultation and the potential reduction of services, particularly again in rural areas. So I really hope that after today and from this motion, the correspondence with the HSCP and with multi-agency working, we can all agree to make sure that all decisions made in this sector are primarily patient driven, despite the recruitment challenges we face going forward. Thank you, members. Thank you, Councillor Drysdale. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I mean, this has uh, generated a fair bit of discussion and it's been um, good to have those discussions with Mover in the Seconder uh, before this meeting happened. And uh, I think, I mean, it puts it in stark sort of uh, relief whenever we look at um, <clears throat> under the implications and risk on page 30. Um, and I, th I think we have, to, you know, it's not a sign of intelligence to keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting no results. Uh, and I, th I think the way I like to try and move forward as a council is what's the best levers we can use, what's the best influence we can have to deliver the outcomes we agree as a council um, to achieve those for our communities. So while it's frustrating, you know, we can listen and listen and listen, but if we don't have the means or the mechanism to deliver what people are saying, then we have to either redesign services, work differently, find out alternate ways of doing things that actually try and address the key outcomes that people are needing. And I think... I think that's the kind of a uh, journey of necessity we have to take with ourselves and our partners. So, but that, that section there on page 30 just basically says, governance for such services sit with the IGB through the Public Bodies Act. Elected members are voting members of the IGB and can influence decisions. And there'll be many people in this chamber who over the period of time have been members on that IGB and have had the chance to influence decisions uh, that are affecting us today. So. I think part of it's about taking responsibility when we have that opportunity, when we're on the IGB, because um, ultimately both this council and the NHS takes direction 
uh, in order to deliver what the IJB as a, as a joint board agrees. So, I mean, that's, that just sets the, the, the context for this. But I would say that, I mean, it would be no, um, no surprise that, that I think, you know, as, part, as our council, I mean, we ultimately want to know that health and social care service delivery is prioritised as locally as possible for the people in local communities because we recognise the fragility in the geography of the region. Um, and all we really want, I suppose, is that people have the right access to the care that they need as close to home as possible. And I think that's, I think that's a reasonable thing to want to prioritise. So how we do that is, is through the mechanism that we have on the IGB, through scrutiny, through social work, through our area committees that scrutinise the reports that get given us, through our membership on the health board. Uh, all, all, we, we have these at our disposal. So it's how well we use them. And I would suggest that the best way to use them is to... Uh, fulfill our responsibilities as elected members in those roles. I'm not saying there's no shortage of challenge, but I think everybody wants to know that um, whether it's a uh, step up, step down, patient clinics, dental health, maternity, palliative care, care at home, care homes, all things that we've discussed in here in the past. Um, I think we just need to recognize that in order to continue that, we're gonna to have to redesign services and that's why we have to work with our partners. But there's a lot in the motion that I like. I just think it really needs to embed uh, that we lobby our representatives on the IJB and health board to prioritise what we want, but we, it doesn't matter how big the public meeting is, uh, we can't deliver things we're not capable of delivering if we don't have the right staff or the right assets or the right funding or the right resources. So we have to kind of figure out how we can do that, uh, notwithstanding that no matter how much you say something, it doesn't mean you always get what you want, but you, you might get what you, need, what you need where you need it, and I think that's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Norwood. Thank you, Convener. Um, Labour Group are happy to support this motion and thanks Willie and Dougie for providing a lot of the history. Just a little bit more history, um, going back a little bit more so that some people might have still been councillors here in 1997, I don't know, maybe somewhere. Um, that the council um, in 1997 resolved to enter into contracts with two providers from the independent sector for provision and re of residential care older people in residential homes. So we signed over council homes to the private sector in 1997. We had 45 care homes in 2012, we now have 29. So something is going wrong somewhere and you could say it's managed decline. Now I totally understand what Councillor Thompson, Thompson is saying about we need to work with what we've got, but we all seem to lobby for more or better. We need to be more ambitious about this. We are currently, every single care home in Dumfries and Galloway's private sector is owned there's no, there's no public sector care homes. Um, care at home provision, 63% of that's provided by the private sector. And it's not working because it, we're, we're at the mercy of market forces, I would suggest. We're not a rich region, so they don't want to come here. They don't want, it's, not, it's not a profitable place to provide services for our elderly people. And that's a challenge for us. We need to look at changing. So that's something that, that is within the power of the council to look at. It's also within the power of, of the IGB to look at. We need, I think we need to look at that in it from a different perspective than we are at the moment. Not an easy one, not an easy one to look at, but something we need to look at. Otherwise, we're going to have a managed decline of services as they are at the moment. So I think we need to scrutinise more. I think we need to lobby more and look at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, it's not OK to accept the status quo because the status quo isn't working for this region. So I think we need to do something different. And from that, the Liberal Party are fully supportive of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dempster. Uh, thanks, convener. When, when COVID struck this region, COVID-19, indeed when it struck Scotland, it struck the world, it was a disaster and everyone had to do what they, could, what they could do to try and save lives. And one of the things the health board did was draw in their services. They closed all of the cottage hospitals, shut some completely, changed the, de the, the, the designation of others in order to support the community at an extreme time of need. But I think it's now become an opportunity to keep some cottage hospitals shut or to use them for different purposes. And, and I somehow think that's flawed. And, and uh, although no mention specifically in the motion, I know that Dougie and Willie have recognised that Thornhill Hospital is one of the other hospitals that are, are closed and that should be considered for reopening in the context or, or, or demand indeed and need 
for the wider Dumfries and Galloway area. And you know, there has been a public consultation, I'm sure it's happened elsewhere as well, and the Health Board are offering or, or suggesting that uh, instead of a cottage hospital, there might be podiatry, physiotherapy, daycare. They don't deliver that from the services and the locations have at the moment, and I think that's fanciful and misleading. And really, we need to have a more in-depth discussion with the health board about the direction of travel and what facilities are there, what can be modified and used for the, and, and indeed brought back into use for the benefit of the wider community. And that's something that would certainly support, and, and I support the motion anyway. The only concern I have, and I know uh, Willie and, and, and Doogie must have spent some time tidying up the exact language, but you know, I was the first chairman of the IJB, and it was quite clear, if you look at page 263 in the main papers, it's an external body, an outside body. We don't control it. And we have 10 members, they're all still present, five members, five substitutes, that represent our interests on that board. And that should be the channel for any concerns we have. I don't want to take away anything that Willie and Doogie say. I certainly wouldn't want to change the language at all because it's important. But we have input to the IGB. We need to understand we don't own it. We're partners in it. It's an external body and we need to feed in and, and it shouldn't be a, 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 the one mistake or, or, or I think error Wally made is talking about council decisions. We shouldn't be placing council decisions in the lap of members to take to the IJB. That's not the process that works. They're council members and as soon as they sit down in their chairs and wherever it is, whether it's uh, the, the health centre, the, the hospital or whatever setting they're in, they represent the interest of the IJB at that point, not the interest of the council. Although I do agree that we have an important role to play, and unless we create influence, then nothing will happen. So I absolutely agree with what William Dugger are saying. It's the right thing to do to campaign. We just have to be careful with the language and how we approach that. And that's just my opinion. Convener, that's not an instruction to neither the mover nor the seconder of the motion, but I'll certainly support it. Thank you, Councillor Deb. So, Councillor McFarlane, I'm sorry we missed, missed you in the speaking element. No, no problem, Convener. Thank you very much for that. You would expect me to come in on this, and I'm sure Willie's been waiting to hear what I've got to say. Um, as, as a council, as a council, we have an active role to play in the IJB. We've got five elected members, and in the time that I've been chair, I've constantly come along to meetings and encouraged members to get involved. Last November and December, the IJB held two members' briefings and four elected members attended. Councillor Drysdale, McCammon, Councillor Thompson, and forgive me, but I can't remember, Councillor Hagman. Those were the four who attended. And sorry, I, have I missed someone? Councillor Robert? Yeah. You know, we've got 43 members, and then we sit here and say, what are they doing about this? What are they doing about that? and we need to scrutinise them. But when we have an opportunity to go along, we don't take it. When we have the opportunity to speak to the public and tell them how bad they're doing, we do take it. And I feel that this situation is, is a, a, an outcome caused by members' indifference or by members' lack of engagement. There are members who have been on the IJB who have stepped aside and if you want to make change, you don't leave. If we want to make change in Europe, we should have stayed. We shouldn't have Brexited. You want to make change in the IJB, you don't walk away. You stay and you make your point and you argue for your communities. And I just feel that the, the language is not good. And I do feel that whilst there are aspects in this motion that I could agree with, we have had conversations with the mover and the seconder, and we try to offer an alternative. <coughs> If there was one alternative that was to be proposed, I would suggest that it would be in the last paragraph, where it says that members would undertake to work collaboratively to develop models for local delivery and scrutiny to ensure health and social care partnership services, etc. The way it's phrased at the moment, it's as if we're going to scrutinise, we're going to tell you how to do it, we're going to scrutinise you, and I feel that that is to overlook the point that Mr. Uh, Councillor Dempster made. 
in that this is an outside body. We have no right to scrutinise them. But what we can do, and what we have the opportunity to do now, is to look at the directions that are given to us as a council through the Social Work Committee. And that's something that's fa it's fairly new, um, whereby those directions are coming. We get to scrutinise and, and challenge what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it. And we have an opportunity then to feed it back to the IJB if we are happy with that or if we're not, and then we can have that negotiation. So I am constantly speaking with the people within the IJB, uh, the chief officer, etc., and driving home to them that there needs to be more involvement by the local authority in the IJB and its running and whatever else. And one of the key things for that was that our last IJB meeting was held at a council premises. That's the first time in a long, long time if it's happened previously. And for me, it has to be seen to be more than just a health issue because it's a health and social care issue. And there's more than just the health board that have got responsibility for this. They do have a deficit and they currently brokerage that through the Scottish Government. However, what they do is we, we balance our budget so they're carrying that. So whilst that deficit is there, you know, that's because we're making sure that our books are balanced. So I, I would say that if an outsider came along and looked at all that, they'd say, why is that? Why is it just one part of this partnership is carrying that deficit? And I would say that there's a notional deficit in there that, that should be ours and perhaps would be. So I think that whilst I agree we need to get the best care for people for our communities as close to home as possible, that might not be in Dumfries and Galloway. My next door neighbour had a heart attack, ended up in Glasgow. Would they rather have been in Dumfries and Galloway or would they rather be in the cottage hospital where they wouldn't get the care or would they rather be where the care is? And I think the priority in this is about the health and social well-being of our communities. And sometimes it won't be next door. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Driver. Yeah, th thanks, convener, and you know, and thanks to Councillor Dobber for putting those suggestions forward on on on, on where we should be looking. Um, and it's it's you know, coming back to Councillor McFarlane, that you know, we mentioned outside bodies earlier on. For instance, the amount of outside bodies that elected members are on may not have given them the opportunity to actually attend any of the meetings that, that, that he suggests, as well as other things that councillors are on. So it may not be indifference or, or whatever, it may be because they were on other duties, and I would, I would suggest that he looks at um, word in, in, in that particular area. I do support the, the, the motion as is, but I would like to add one thing to it, and it, it, it comes along the lines of what Councillor McFarlane was saying, because in the last days, members undertake to work collegially, robustly scrutinising where appropriately challenge any localised threat. But I also think we need to come forward with solutions. You know, some of the solutions that I have seen across the UK in places like the Highlands and Islands is, is because there's a lack of some place to meet a general practitioner, a podiatrist, a dentist, you know, some of the, the, the big issues that we've been dealing with recently. There, there have been organisations, along with the NHS, along with IGBs, who have actually put those services onto buses and taken them out to the more rural uh, areas in, in places like what could be classed as Dumfries and Galloway, so that individuals could actually go to whatever is needed on that bus in their local area, 10 at a time, as opposed to taking 10 people from a small community area down to for instance, Langham from the S Valley, for instance. You know, the bus goes up to the S Valley where there's 260 different families in, in that large area, and they come into an area where the, the solution could be on a bus. And we've seen how important those, those type of things actually are in, in other areas. Libraries, for instance, you know. Um, so I, I, I would say that, you know, we, need, we do need to have that, that issue, but we need to look at and suggest solutions to the to the the, the IGB and, and and whoever else that can come forward with those those solutions, um, and it may actually be more beneficial cost-wise for that to happen as well. Uh, thanks, Archie. Councillor Ian Crothers. The convener and I had a, con I had a conversation earlier. We said it is really difficult to see that screen and see the names coming up, so I was after Councillor Drysdale, but I'll forgive you for that one, Malcolm. 
Right, I'm, I'm just going to concentrate completely and give a wee bit of background information at the conversation I had last night. Not with Willie, because I had one with Willie as well. But uh, I, I would commend this actually coming forward to be do grand Willie. And I'm going to read it straight from what, what the act the acts last for. You've, you've got a, a congratulations, let's look at that, to be Stephen Morgan, Julie White. And it goes on about, in regards to the new roles, the leadership, how they'll take this forward, which is only right and appropriate. And there's background information in regards to what's going on and, and their view in, NH, in the Health and Social Care Partnership, in particular the, the budget pressures and, and resources, uh, lack of resources, the pressures there that are under. But the actual ask for when I read this, and I read it a number of times, members undertake to work collegiately, robustly scrutinise and, where appropriate, challenge any localised threat to health and social care partnership services, including those currently suspended, particularly through scrutiny and decision-making bodies, including the Integration Joint Board, Full Council, Social Work, Services Committees and Area Committees. That is a simple ask, and I totally support that. I mean, I'm absolutely right behind that, and I'm absolutely committed to doing that as well. I think I have been for since the inception of the Integration Joint Board and also the health social, Community Health Social Care Partnership before that, which I was a member of then as well. But a conversation we were having last night after the conversation with Willie was that so I, I, I live with somebody who travels from Chapel Cross area, who works for NHS to Stranra, delivers mental health services, and drives all the way back in the same day or a 13 hour day, quite often, because of the lack of resource being able to get people to undertake uh, uh, employment up in that area in particular. So the west of the region, there is difficulty there. And you can't need nurses, is one of the comments that was made as part of the conversation. And it's right, it doesn't matter if it's nurses, social workers, or whatever it is, but actually see the right, this right care, right place. And I've committed through the, the Integration Joint Board and the Transformation, Innovation and Futures Committee to, but when we're going to go, we do go to consult properly now in regards to the right care and the right place, whether that's Cottage Hospitals, Dentistry, Maternity Service, so on and so forth. I'll be there. I will be there at those, those public meetings and I will be held accountable. But not beyond that, I think at Annadale and SDL's area committee, we are seriously now starting to change it through agenda management that we can look at these type of... Uh, and have these, these type of decisions and engage properly with the Health Social Care Partnership. And that's already started as far as I'm concerned. So I'm not being critical at all of these. I think it's a really simple ask, well put together. It's concise and absolutely support and I'm committed to, to getting behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, there's a suggestion put on the, on the screen. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, thanks, Convener, for letting me back in on this one. Um, this is this is something that I'd like to be able to support, and it's just for want of a few words, a wee slight shift in emphasis. So I've put something in the Teams chat function which can be read out in the appropriate way to satisfy governance. But if they move in the second, they're happy to consider that uh, in terms of that um, working collaboratively. And it's kind of on Councillor Driver's point about developing models that are going to work locally. Because um, I think the most important thing today is to be having this discussion, I think. Um, but ultimately, if we can agree someone as a council that we can all get behind, then I think that would be a good outcome for the council. But it has to be something we can actually both challenge the other parties to listen to what our concerns are, but recognise our part and help them to deliver the solutions for that as well, um, you know, as partners in the IGB. So... Oh. So, um, sorry, I just got, a, got an echo there. Um, but that, it's there in the chat function. Obviously, um, it's there for consideration if the mover and seconders are willing to accept it, if they'd be willing to consider it. Thank you. It's actually on the screen now. Councillor McFarlane, I think you're wanting to come back. Yeah, thank you for letting me back in again, Convino. Yeah, one of the, the points that I, I omitted in my last uh, contribution was um, there was make, there was mention made of of the maternity services in the west of the region, and I'm sure that that members understand that the the reason for the current situation is is on safety grounds, and uh, both the recommendations which came to the IJB were recommending that births recommence, but only low risk births, and that would still be the case. There is never likely to be, I would suggest, and this is a personal view now, there is never likely to be uh, a full maternity service provided in the west of the region because we don't have sufficient staff to, to do it safely, because the number of births aren't sufficiently high, because the staff need that engagement with birthing mothers in order to maintain their skills. 
Um, and there's a whole host of, of specialist reasons why that would be the case. However, there is a drive to make sure that we do try to return them to the west of the region, but it would always be low risk births. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and what Councillor Thompson has put forward was the the phrase that I used earlier. It's about making sure that we work together. We do what we can in order to support the delivery of healthcare services across the region, rather than just feeling that it's us to sit here and point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks very much for letting me in, convener. Uh, uh, like Jim, I chaired the IGB for uh, two years, was vice chair for two years. I think Jim did a full two year stint as chair as well. There's a bit of mystique goes about here. I mean, the IGB is a strategic commissioning body, right? We come up with a strategy, high level, you will provide X, okay? It's then up to the Health Social Care Partnership, which is the delivery body, to how they're going to deliver X. And they come back to the IGB and say, this is how we're going to do it. Now, we've been arguing for a long time, some of us, that the, there should be more stuff should come to the Social Work Committee. We've agreed that today, right? So there is movement there. So I think what we really need to get to here is we need to separate out the IGB from the Health and Social Care Partnership because the Health and Social Care Partnership is overseen by the two chief execs right, with a chief officer. Right? So that part of it is actually relatively easy for us as a council to actually influence. Relatively easy, I'll say, Wally, you know. Um, yes, but we need to make the case, we need to make the case properly. And uh, I've heard today Dougie and, and Wally put forward an argument that's really difficult to argue against. Right, okay. But Stephen's suggestion there is probably the right one, I, w I would uh, argue, in that the influence from this council would be more effective at the Health and Social Care Partnership than the IGB. Because as I say, the IGB decides the high level overarching strategy that we're going to take forward health and social care in the Vries and Galloway. Um, and that's it, and that's a, it's an autonomous body in its own right. The minute you go through the door there, you are not a councillor, you're an IGB member. Okay? So that's why we, we should not be, uh, no, Willie, that's why we should not be getting lobbied, right? Um, if there's a lobby comes at all, it should come for full council and then it goes through the proper channels rather than nobling individual councillors. So uh, for, for me, that's, that's where we need to, to, to focus the attention here is how can we as a council influence the health and social care partnership, the delivery arm? That's what it is, okay? Because all the IGB ask is they deliver, uh, they have a, a maternity service, they have an acute service, they have whatever different services they are, right? And it's then up to that partnership to tell us how they're going to do that. We need to separate the two out. Thank you. I mean, my, I, took, I took, when I, when I read the motion, I've got to say, I took it almost as if I was being told as a councillor I was seriously needing to up my game. It's, I'm just paraphrasing it simply, that, you know, I should be doing more. I don't know if anybody else interpreted it the same way, and the discussion seems to have went in a slightly different direction. Do you want to come in? To... Yeah, that that wasn't the intention. It was about taking the opportunity to reflect on what's coming down the, the line and how it impacts on our constituents. And I made the point that it wasn't wasn't passing any judgment on the IGIB or anybody else. Um, I suppose I was I was being a bit creative by sort of passing responsibility on us as a, a full a full council um but you know to, 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 to a great degree I'm, I'm just happy we're having this conversation um and that you know there are there, there are opposing opposing views on what the, the motion actually means and what should be included but can, can i just maybe ask stephen um in relation to the the proposed amendment i take it it would be to replace the the whole of the last paragraph and what do you mean about deli delivering or sorry developing models could you maybe flesh that out a wee bit please uh through yourself convener thanks yeah so i mean i, I think we so we all have different uh, ways of bringing someone to the table on this whether it's through um seminars, whether it's through scrutiny area committees, whether it's because we've got membership in the IGB, whether it's uh, 
our membership in social work, or even just conversations with uh, our chief executive and decisions at full council. But either way, if we act, probably in the way that you sort of described in your original paragraph, uh, which is like, if we fulfil our responsibilities for scrutiny and challenge as councillors in the normal way, but also exercise our um, capacity for developing solutions by taking decisions at this council or the relevant committees or the, the relevant bodies that we re were represented on, then we can actually start to move away from the, uh, what would you say, we can be very good at describing problems, but we need to move to a place where we're starting to develop solutions. And I think that's really what the shift in emphasis is about. It's about that little bit of, um, yeah, we know there's challenges coming down the line. There's challenges here already. We're concerned about what will local delivery look like, et cetera. There's, a, there's consultations going on now about right okay, right place, et cetera. Decisions, you know, all, all that's in the pipeline, as it were. And I think our role is to make sure that doesn't get delayed, distracted um, or derailed or whatever, and make sure that whatever the outcomes are, we've got as much influence as possible to deliver locally what we need. So I think it's more about what are we do what are we doing to change the game? Not you over there, what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? So I think we have to take ownership of that because we've actually got much more power than you think. I think that's all it is really. Thank you. I don't want to um, turn it or get this over too much muddied, but uh, I'm, I'm puzzled about in terms of uh, Andy Ferguson's uh, position on we shouldn't be lobbying IJB members, which I think was what you were saying, Andy. Uh, you know, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we address that? Because nobody comes to me before an IJB meeting and says, what do you think and how is this decision going to impact people in, in your ward? And we need to think about a structure or a form of communication that enables that conversation. And what I'm not suggesting is that um, Andy Ferguson or Andy McFarlane have to do as I say or what I want, but at the very least they should know what I think and what I would like. And it's how we actually achieve that position so that we do get the opportunity to influence, albeit indirectly. Um, Councillor Ian Crowler. That would be very, very brief, but do, you could have a seat at the table and that's what's been made. I never mentioned it, but it has been said a few times. Councillor Scovey. I was wondering if you're going to call me in there, Chair. Uh, and uh, Dougie summed it up there. You know, when, when we pass motions at this council, and we have passed uh, maternity motions, we have passed motions on, on the cottage hospital. This is to, 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 to put forward a, a, as a suggestion to whatever board, IGB or whatever, so that are solutions. And it's not a matter of listening and keep the, for the community keep talking and, and, and they, by them keeping talking, they're always right. But we've got to listen to them. They're the ones that elected us here in the first place. Uh, and this idea that because you know, you're an outside body, you've got no accountability back to the people that elected you in the first place really confuses me. Uh, because they, they are the community and, and, and any decision should reflect whatever it is that's in the best interest, however much it may not be able to be delivered. Uh, but yet we should be trying that. Uh, just on the point made about the 13-hour day, and it's right, it is hard to recruit uh, west of the region. It's hard to recruit to Dumfries and Galloway. So it is at the DGRI. So, so we're no different, but we want to see a fair share. Uh, and there's no reason looking at innovation and, and, and initiatives that... Uh, anyone who's employed uh, at DGRI couldn't travel to, as part of a contract. So there's ways and means of overcoming this. And indeed, the, the, the Galloway Community Hospital, uh, to be more efficient in doing day surgery, there is already people who travel from Dumfries to Stranraer. And there's no reason why it shouldn't. But on the maternity service about safety, and, and the whole issue has raised the, the, uh, and inspired the, the Human Rights Commissioner to look at this, because uh, there is an inequality, uh, and, and it's not safe even for uh, any woman to, to be told to, to get in your car and find your own way, assuming they've got a car, uh, 75 miles or 90 miles. So that's no safe. So uh, Andy's right in terms of its low uh, risk baths, but nevertheless, it would be reopened and it would be a, an available source, because 
Inequality is one of the pillars of this council. And that's a huge inequality for women uh, who, who, are, uh, in, who are pregnant, given birth and so forth, to think that you've got to jump a car and, and give birth at a side of a road. That's no safe. So it's no. So uh, I, I make mention because the Human Rights uh, Commission is now looking at this and, uh, and is to come back. So it, it, it's a matter of, it's a motion or direction. It, it may not be, but it's given an indication of where this council stands, and that's a position when it adopted it on uh, maternity, when it adopt, adopted it in cottage hospitals. And it wasn't to return to the cottage hospitals as they were. Uh, and, and Jimmy Dempster has said that, you know, there's innovation there, and, and, and the ideas that came from the community at that public meeting were, were, were uh, you know, sensible and reasonable ones. And that was about, as I've said, respite, rehabilitation, palliative care, uh, as a means of, of, of delivering these uh, as close to home as possible. And that's all they're asking, you know. So any decisions being taken at either IGB, Health and Social Care Partnership, Health Board, all we're asking is that we, you know, uh, our members get the opportunity, and the opportunity is here. If we pass a motion, then that gets carried. And that's all that's asking, that we, we scrutinise, we monitor, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and I don't think that's beyond asking of the five IGB members, or indeed Health Board members, or any anyone else, coming back to where and why we were elected is my position. Councillor Hill. Hi, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to support this motion um, going forward. I, I kind of think that we, we need to, as a council, as IJB, as NHS, as every board that we sit on, we're elected to look after the views um, and listen to the views of our constituents who voted us into this privileged position. You know, we have influence over things that happen in people's everyday lives. Um, and when we look at the cottage hospitals and we look at the services that we have across Dumfries and Galloway, we look at our geographical area and we look at our demographic and the demographic is getting older. So what are we doing to put in place um, recruitment, how, how are we looking at our younger generation to be there to pick up these services that we're finding it difficult to get people to come and work in, particularly in these services that we've been talking about today. We need to be working collaboratively with every sector across the council, and um, particularly education, social work and the NHS to look at how we can train and how we can use the facilities that we've got to give these um, to give these services back to local communities because the infrastructure isn't there in the transport links, in the travel. So we need to build our economy from our grassroots. We need to look at our children that are coming through schools, the ones that don't want to go away, the ones that can't afford to go away into further education and possibly go back to the SVQ levels, get kids in as healthcare assistants. Um, and train from our grassroots and see if see if we can work in partnership to try and evolve some way like that to try and alleviate some of these problems and make sure that local services do remain. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Little. Thank you for letting me in, Convener. Um, I believe we have an officer from the NHS in the meeting today. I was wondering if they had anything to contribute to this conversation. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Convener, and, and thanks for inviting me in. Um, I, I've, I've been sitting and I have been, been listening with, with great interest, and I, and I purposely have not um, interjected so far. I, I have to say, I think the discussion has been really, really interesting. I think it's been reassuring to hear from, from some members the affirmation of the IGIB as an independent body, and I think the, the delineation that's been called between the IGIB and the Health and Social Care Partnership is an important one. Um, I think the, the recent report we brought through the Social Work Committee on the extent to which the directions issued by the IGIB to the Council for delivery through the Health and Social Care Partnership is a huge step forward in terms of visibility and the opportunity for the, the committee members to hold us to account for delivery um, of, of those directions on behalf of, of the Council. Um, the, the the motion itself, um, I, I think is, I think is an interesting one. I think it does 
absolutely reaffirm the role of councillors and, and the important role they play in, in reflecting the views um, and, 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 and concerns of, of their constituents around any change. Um, what I would say is over the course of the last 15 months or so, we have been undertaking Right Care, Right Place, which has been, been discussed a few times this afternoon. Um, throughout that process, we have um, offered up sessions for elected members on, on a really broad way for, 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 for briefings to be offered and discussions to be had. We've also had one-to-one -one discussions with, with some elected members when that's been requested, and we've offered every political group um, three opportunities thus far to come and engage with us around the direction that that's taking. So an opportunity to hear what the local population have been saying from our point of view, how we've been translating that in, into um, options for the IGIB to consider, um, and indeed how we plan to take forward further engagement and, and, and participation and indeed consultation around all of that. So I personally have found those sessions to be incredibly helpful. I think discussions have been really good where, where the opportunities have been, been taken up. And that's something, as I've said in my response to the motion, that we absolutely want to build on as a health and social care partnership. We we want to see more of, of those those engagements with, with political groups, with individual elected members and, and, and indeed elected members as a whole, as we begin to plan for some of the service change that, that, that is going to have to come forward. And, and there is no there's no dispute in the fact, as, as, as is said within the paper, that that service change is going to be absolutely necessary. We are going to have to change our service models if we are to sustain services as close to local communities as, as we possibly can in the most efficient and effective way we possibly can. So I really do welcome the discussion this afternoon. I really do welcome the, the commitment that I'm hearing from around um, the table to engage with the Health and Social Care Partnership going forward and to um, offer that, that that challenge and scrutiny, but uh, based on, on the proposed amendment, to work collaboratively with us as well to develop those, those new models that we are going to absolutely need to see delivered and deployed within Dumfries and Galloway to best meet the, the health and social care needs of our local communities into the future. So um, um, that's, that's my thinking just now. Uh, I'm happy to answer any specific questions that, that, that colleagues might have this afternoon, um, but I've got not a lot more to say at this point in time, Convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Convener. And I, I'm glad that we heard from the health professional uh, after the discussion we've had, and I would just ask, would the mover and the seconder, on the basis of that, take on board the, the paragraph I suggested as an amendment to include the very important parts, but also it's about that um, we can be part of the solution and it's about that working collaboratively. So um, I would just ask you to do that. I don't think we're going to die in a ditch over it, but um, I think it would enhance the spirit of the motion. Um, that's, that's my offer to you. Thank you. Councillor McCammon, I'll just bring you in quickly because you've been waiting a wee while. Sorry, convener, was that me you brought in? I, might, I, lose, I lost connection. Yes, it is indeed. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, my um, question is, will take us back to the motion, which I, I fully support. I mean, just to touch <laughs> very briefly on the maternity services in the West, um, you know, I don't believe that there's anybody wants the return of, of the, um, or any councillor wants the, the return of a maternity hub in the Galloway Community Hospital more than I do. I have lobbied as many people as I can. So if there is anything else that I can possibly do, please tell me and I shall do it. Um, so but the last paragraph uh, mentions area committees. And, and again, it's on, this is maybe a, a question for David, please, if that's okay. David, the last, or the, Two area committees ago, I had asked for an update um, on maternity services, and I was pretty shocked that I was told um, the the health health representative there at, at that committee meeting that maternity service updates don't come to area committee. Now, I appreciate that you might not have the answer to that, but I would suggest that, and I'm, I think it was taken back that it was suggested that, that given that everything that's going on in the West at the minute with maternity, that we do get updates at area committee from here on in. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that and um, if there was any movement on getting updates across to area committee, please. Thank you. Thanks, convener. 
So is it okay to come in from here? Yeah, just come in, David. It's fine. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so, so I don't have a definitive answer to that at, at this point in time, um, Councillor McCammon. I, I want to have a conversation with some colleagues around that. I think what we what we need to be really clear about, and and this is going to sound terribly bureaucratic, and it's it's, it's not supposed to. We need to be clear that in terms of um, holding the health and social care partnership to to account, um, it's it's the role of the social work committee within within council to hold us to account for those those services and functions that are delegated from the council, and the, there are a series of NHS committees to hold us to account for those services and functions that are delegated uh, from an NHS board perspective, um, and I think we need to keep those lines very, very clean and clear to avoid any confusion around that. Now, that's not to say, Councillor McCann, that, that we should not be offering briefings to elected members on where we are with um, the maternity services consultation, respecting the due process that it has to follow in terms of uh, concluding consultation and taking that, those consultation findings through IGIB for, for a formal decision. Um, but whether that's area committee or not, I, I don't have a definitive answer for that just now, but I will take that away as a, as a question and I will speak to colleagues and I'll come back with an answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Are you happy with that, Jackie? Um, yes, just one quick comment in that, you know, I fully appreciate the, the not to muddy the lines or blur the lines, um, whatever the, the phrase was that you used there, uh, David, and I thank you for your response. Um, I don't recall even getting, a, and I might be wrong here, other members of the ward can, can put me right, over in the West, I don't even recall having a, a, a discussion, if you like, with members and a member of the health board with regards to, to various issues in, in the West. I don't even know, know if that's a thing. All we are offered, as far as I I'm aware is a member's briefing with the NHS CEO and we can discuss. We don't really have time to, to d discuss in depth certain things. So again, if you take that comments back um, to whoever you need to, that would be great. But thank you for, for your response. Thank you, Jackie. Councillor Dempster, I'll just bring you quickly in and then I'll go back to Councillor Campbell. Thanks very much, Congener. One thing I would want to raise with you today, and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about it, according to Councillor Carruthers, we have a member of staff driving from Annandale to Estdale to Stranra. Oh, where? Oh, You're, oh, oh. <laughs> a member of staff <laughs> driving to Stranra today, work a day's work and drive back again. There's health and well-being there, but anyway, that's if it's Ian's wife, will not bother about it. <laughs> uh, the, the one point I would want to make, members, and if you just read the motion again, the last paragraph simply asks us in an elaborate way to agree to lobbying. That's what I've been asked to do, and I'm sure we could do that. Thank you. Councillor Campbell, I, mean, I must admit, that was my, my interpretation when I said that it's basically asking me to up my game. But equally, from what Councillor Thompson said, to include up in, your, up in my game by collaborating as well would be the way forward. Yeah, I've got a proposal to cut a deal here. Uh, cut a deal. Um, <laughs> as, I, as I said uh, when I was speaking, you know, just to have this debate that we're having, I think is really, really healthy, really, really positive. Um, I still have concerns about how I represent my constituents when it comes to decisions that are being made, for example, through the, the IGIB. Uh, I'll be guided by how other political groups feel, but um, Willie and I don't have any great concern about the po proposed replacement of the last paragraph that's come from, from, from Stephen. Um, unless anybody else has got a concern about that and if that would be a deal breaker for them, because I don't want this to go a vote. A vote. I think it's, it's too important for that. But what I would be looking for, I think, is uh, an agreement that uh, th this issue is taken to the leaders panel and that we look at how we actually address the concerns that have been expressed um, and you know where, where we can lobby, where we can't lobby. Um, what influence we do have or we don't have uh, and how we best represent our constituents. So if group leaders are, are happy with that, um, I, I think we are, we are minded to go with the, the pro proposed amendment. Thank you very much, Councillor Campbell. I think, we, I think everybody is happy with that. I think that's the, 
that's the way forward and take it to leaders panel to discuss. Okay, uh, 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 as, as early as possible, I think it would be, would be good. Thank you. I'm just checking. Did, did everybody amend it, <laughs> accepted Stephen's amendment? Is that basically what we're saying? Yeah. So, excellent. Thank you very much. So, we've agreed to remove delegation of 2.2. Consider the terms of notice and motion accepting the amendment by Councillor Thompson. Thank you. So, we now move on to notice of motion secondary school mothballing policy report by Director, Skills of Education and Learning. Before moving to the detail of the report, given its subject matter, can we first agree to remove delegation from Education and Learning Committee so we may discuss it? Yeah, thank you. Members are asked to consider the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Dougie Campbell and seconded by Councillor Andy McFarlane. The notice of motion is attached at the Appendix 1 to the report. John Thin, Head of Education, Learning and Resources, is available to assist members with any questions. Councillors Campbell and McFarlane, please propose and second your motion, after which I'll invite contribution and questions from other members. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, convener. Uh, members, this motion is about future-proofing the decisions we make on the future of secondary schools across the, the region. Dorai is just the case in point and the opportunity to fully understand the consequences of our decisions. It's for you to weigh up the officer report in response to this motion and the correspondence you've received from community representatives. And I'm very pleased to see some of them in the hall here today to see democracy in action. Uh, but I'm not going to highlight what's in the report. What I'm going to highlight is what is not in the report, and that isn't a slight against officers. I just think it, we, look, we have to look more widely than the processes that have been followed by the Education Department. So, what's not in the report? The impact of losing a secondary school in a geographically remote rural community. The denial of secondary education close to home. The impact of secondary school pupils being on a bus for many hours each week. Access to after school clubs and activities enjoyed by pupils living close to their school. There's no mention of 10,000 voices, which members will be familiar with, and reversing the trend of young people having little option other than choosing to live and work elsewhere. Rural population decline and the new national action plan to tackle this. Sorry, my laptop's playing slowly on me. The appetite to go further than the narrow statutory requirements of the 2010 Act and mothballing guidance and recognising the unique nature of Dumfries and Galloway. Our mention, our mention of the Council being ready and willing to work in partnership with a community to engage on alternative and innovative ed education models. The Glen Ken's Community Action Plan, supported by the Council, and their vision to be a connected, resilient and carbon neutral place where people want to live, work and visit to bring up their families and grow old. Their decision to establish an education forum and to commission research on alternative and innovative <coughs> education models. The opportunity for our council to develop and implement cost-effective solutions for others to follow. Local place plans, plans being developed in the towns and villages region-wide with support of the council. The regional economic partnership housing plans for a significant number of new homes being built for families and tackling rural decline including in the Glen Kens, and the Rural Development Plan. The national debate on rural schools and best practice across Scotland. Stagnation and socio-economic rural decline that may be created by loss of the school at a time when the community have a clear ambition and a plan for the way forward and a proven track record on delivery. The impact on significant local employers such as Natural Power to expand and encourage young professionals and their families to come and work in the Glen Kens. The opportunities to invest uh, an investment available from South Scotland Enterprise. The community planning partnership and the shared LOIP objective to support rural communities. The national and international <coughs> opportunities 
for rural communities through projects such as Galloway and South Ayrshire Biosphere, and I'm sorry, Councillor Bell, the possibility of Galloway National Park. <laughs> the national importance of the Glen Cairns in terms of timber and renewable energy de generation. The decision just the other week by Economy and Resources Committee to support a proposed Carsfair and Woodland Skills and Training Centre to give young people meaningful employment and the ability to stay in the area with a £131,000 grant from the Council <coughs> because it aligns with our ambitions for the region. My point is that the Glen Cairns is a vibrant community with ambition and plans for the future. So shouldn't we consider all of the above, much of which goes beyond school education, before making what, uh, a decision that will have long-lasting consequences? And fundamentally, and I'm not accusing you here again, convener, but do we pay lip service to supporting rural communities or do we genuinely want to enjoy the quality of opportunity, whether you live in Dumfries or Carsfern? As of 1st April, the Skills Education and Learning Directorate will assume responsibility for community wellbeing. This is a substantial change that goes beyond what happens in our schools, but to the heart of what makes communities tick. Work streams within the new thriving community service include strategic and local employability skills, community learning and development, lifelong learning, community planning and engagement, youth services, resilience and community safety, leisure culture and wellbeing, community empowerment and community engagement. I'm not, <coughs> not going along, uh, convener. Members, this motion is about communities willing to face up to significant challenges ahead and working in partnership. It's about responding to school roles dropping region-wide and the opportunity to get it right. How we manage and mitigate the challenges and in a scenario you'll very possibly face, members, in your own ward at some point. The Rye Secondary just happens to be the first. It's about pupil and parental choice and seeking ways to ensure that school kids across to Fries and Galloway get equitable and fair access to secondary level education. It's about a mindset, a whole council mindset. It's about getting it right for every child and their community. It's about us, the impact, our decisions, the impact of the decisions we make and the power and influence we have to ensure communities don't just survive but actually thrive. Members, please support the motion. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Councillor McFarlane. Thank you, Convener. As seconder here, I have to express my disappointment that this motion wasn't taken as an urgent motion as was proposed for the last full council and that Councillor Campbell's point of order was dismissed. I feel a lack of political leadership has led us to this point and members should know that this failure has left us all involved, has left all involved in a state of limbo for the last month, children, teachers and parents as well as officers, with limited time before the end of term. Members have an opportunity to act now to redress this. In only four days, the directorate that has responsibility for education and skills will also have responsibility for community wellbeing, highlighting the strong links between our schools and our communities. Communities thrive when they come together, and the actions of this community has shown that they can thrive and that they can work together, and that they see the role of the school as central to that. I propose that as a way forward, should this motion be adopted, that mothballing is suspended to offer a period of stability and certainty for pupils, staff and parents in Dalry, that there is provision of equitable education provision across S1 Test 4 at Dalry until at least the end of 2025, and that a short-term cross-party member and officer working group is formed to develop a mothballing policy. It takes account of the wider community wellbeing and includes cross-border, that is, out of region options for benefit of pupils. This group would then bring this policy to full council for approval by its members and thereafter implementation of the policy should be overseen by the relevant committee who would then have responsibility for the implementation of the policy for any secondary school across the region to which it may, to which it may apply. I second this motion. Thank you. Open up to questions. Oh, quick off the mark. Councillor Jameson, I think. Thank you. And thanks for thanks to Debbie and Andy. To begin with, I fully support this this uh, motion. I would like to add a few things. Um, two major transformational pieces of work that the Education Director have been working on 
uh, with a lot of professionalism, a lot of intelligence, and or I, I urge everybody to take every opportunity to see it. Two of the main things are modernising our school estate. So much of our school estate is less than ideal, and that's being polite. The children in our schools and young people can't get the, de the education that they deserve, and neither can the staff deliver the education that they're prepared, they are, are able to, to do. It's a long-standing thing, and it's not just involved in the Fusion Gallery. The rurality makes it more difficult. The other major transformational notion proposal is that we have aligned, con aligned common timetables across the region to help every child and young person in the Fusion Gallery get an equitable and fair education that's the same in Langham as it is in Srinagar as it is in Dalai. My disappointment that we've come to this is that and I'm, this is not political games because I'm, I'm too invested in education for that. Is our, that work has not been recognised and it's not been studied hard enough. And the directorate, but more importantly, ourselves and the administration are maybe failing to actually engage with all stakeholders. There's been an immense amount of work, and, I, and I'll be privy to it by the officials, but we need to take folk with us. And rather than have negotiations and lobbying, we'll have a genuine discussion about what's best for our children. First and foremost, what's best for our children and young people? What gives them the best opportunity? But with that comes, as, as, as Dougie has said, it comes, we need to look at individual circumstances. And Dorian may well be that, that, that circumstance. So we, we need to have the discussions, not arguments, discussions. Because I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there is modernization in the pipeline that will be to the benefit of staff, parents, and children. I support the motion wholeheartedly because we don't have a secondary plan for, for mothballing. And, and I don't think we've got a, the, the good enough communication to take folk with us. So I support the motion, but with the caveat that, this, that we, we must look very carefully at how we communicate. We don't tell folk, we ask them. Similarly, the people that we're asking don't tell us, they ask us. Let's have a proper discussion to remember what it's all about. It's about our young people and giving them the best opportunities possible. So we're getting it right for every child, having sustainable schools. These are council priorities. So I hope we can support this motion, but I hope we can learn the lessons that the communication has to be better. And we have to be open to alternative views rather than come to a dogfight, as we have done today. Thank you. Councillor Denerly. Thank you, convener. I'm one of the councillors in Ward 3 and have met with various members of uh, community and constituents and they've shared their voice with me. I believe that Dalry Secondary School's viability is essential for educational purposes and our community's overall well-being and growth. I'm concerned about the adverse impact of mothballing the school, particularly regarding access to education for families in remote areas and the vitality of St. John's Town of Dalry and its surrounding communities. I fully support Councillor Dougie Campbell's motion and seconded by Councillor McFarlane to pause the Education Department's mothballing policy. It is crucial that the work towards finding a sustainable solution that preserves the integrity of our Glenkins communities and ensures a bright future for generations to come. By pausing the mothballing policy, we can engage in meaningful dialogue and explore alternative options that address the needs of our community while maintaining the education opportunities provided by Dial Rye Secondary School. Thank you, Leader. No, sorry, Councillor Dempster's next. Actually. Thanks, Convener. I, uh, it's a pity that we hadn't had the Education Committee first because as Councillor Jimison said, there's a report coming there that may well cause consternation among a lot of members and it might have been a healthier debate to debate the whole of that report rather than take a schools in isolation. Sometimes you divide to conquer and that's not a good thing either. Uh, I think though, 
Schools were built to serve the communities. They weren't built to serve the needs of officers, nor indeed elected members. And we need to be mindful of that. And if you want trouble, the one thing to do is motivate communities against you, because there's nothing sure you'll get trouble then. So I'm happy to support this motion, but I would want to a, 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 revisit maybe the whole concept of, of, of how you deal with schools after the next education committee. So that'll be likely in June this year we'll get the opportunity to again convene. The only thing I would caution Councillor Campbell and Councillor McFarlane about is that uh, if you look at the officer's report in page 39, 4.16, it says quite clearly if the majority of the community are not happy with mothballing, the education department should move straight to closure. That's not reflected in the motion, and I'd be concerned if by agreeing the motion today, you're actually instructing officers to close the Rye School. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, that's for Dougie Campbell and Andy McFarlane to deal with, no me, but I'm just concerned that's the context that we're looking at this motion in. But certainly, I support the proposal in not mothballing the school. I support the concept of us dealing constructively with the report that's coming to Education Committee or Education Learning Committee and, and coming back here for a mere detailed discussion because some of the things that are likely to come out it will cause a lot of members concern and there's no, deed, no point in second guessing what the report might say. We should see the report, consider it and then review again it the Dorai School in the light of what the report and, and what it suggests that other schools might have to undergo as well. Thanks, convener. Thank you. Leader, do you want to come in Yeah, thank you. And Councillor Dempster, I think you've covered off quite a few of the points that, that or issues, I would say, that I had. Um, I watched your video yesterday, uh, and I have a huge sympathy with your situation, and Dougie and I have discussed this previously. I have a huge sympathy with the entire situation in Dalry. I do worry that we're getting a wee bit um, fixated on the words mothballing or statutory consultation and we may end up getting in a really difficult situation. The mothballing um, policy was only agreed in December 22 under the previous administration. Um, so it's not actually been in existence for all that long. If it requires a review, I think that that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but as I say, it's only been in existence since uh, December 22. It's only guidance from Scottish Government as well. The only way that we can go to proper consultation with our communities is through a statutory consultation for closure. And, and, and it puts us in a really difficult situation. So, I mean, I'll, I'll read here. The term mothballing is used according to Scottish Government guidance to refer to a temporary decision to close a school where the role has fallen to zero. To zero where the school has essentially mothballed itself, which is what has happened at Hutton. So we continued the mothballing at Hutton, um, and now we're moving to statutory consultation on that. So I have worries around the guidance and our interpretation of the guidance, and that we could actually be tying the hands of our education officers to take us to a position that will not be in the best interests of Dalry. Dougie's shaking his head. He's clearly a better expert than I am. But uh, I, I think we need to be very clear around our legislative responsibilities and what is guidance um, and, and, and not get ourselves in a situation where we end up closing the school by stealth um, because we do need to take the communities with us. Thank you. Councillor Dorward. Thank you, convener. Um, this is a really difficult one and a big decision for the region. I wouldn't put it all on education directorate's um, head. It's not entirely. They've got, a, they've got a job to do as well. But I would clarify, as said by convener at the last full council, there's no mothballing policy for secondary schools. So we don't have one, so we can't really pontificate about one until we've got one, and that'll be for education committee, which is May, June, whenever, May. In terms of Dalry School, um, I'm a local councillor, so my first duty is towards my ward and my constituents, but my second duty is towards the region of Dumfries and Galloway. So I went out on the bus trip, they were invited by the people in the school, uh, myself, Councillor Jameson, Councillor Denley, Councillor Campbell, all went out and spent 
most of a morning, well, a, half of a day, listening to the people, the residents, the children of Dee and Glen Kens about the school. As I've said before, I've got a great deal of sympathy for the education directorate, but would posit they're trying to place an urban template on a rural area, and that's really difficult. And they've been trying to do this for a long time. Let's be, let's be fair about it. And it's really challenging for them. Um, and they're doing what they're being asked to do. Um, and they've done it with other, with other areas. As a, as a region, we have to close some of our schools. We can't keep them all open. We know that. But this is a secondary school, so perhaps it's a, from a different perspective. And I believe the proposal to mothball the rice school needs to be seen through a wider lens than just education. So there's a different perspective as well coming into this. And it isn't just about legislation. It's about rural depopulation or... You know, we, we, we've got a massive issue with depopulation in Dumfries and Galloway. As a region, we have the highest depopulation figures in Scotland out with the islands. We're sitting at 3.9% depopulation. And we need to look at that and look closely at how we deal with that. I'm not suggesting a school will save us from depopulation in Dee and Glen Cairns, but it's using a model for perhaps that area. So it's the most rural area in Dumfries and Galloway, I would suggest. We have a region that's compared to Scotland in miniature. So is Arden, but I think ours is probably more like Scotland in miniature. We have urban areas, Dumfries, Annan, Stranraer. We have rural areas, Dee Glen, Dee and Glen Cairns. And we try to use the same model across the whole region. And it's not, I would suggest, working that well. So why don't we have a pause and a think about how we deal with this? We have had 30,000 from Scottish government, big wow, for depopulation studies. Or we're getting it. It was in the paper anyway, so I think we're getting some money from Scottish government. They're giving 180,000 to three other regions, and the other regions have also got um, uh, resettlement officers. We're not getting any of that stuff. We're getting 30,000 to do some studies on depopulation. I would suggest we know what the issues are with depopulation, but, but if you look at Dean Glen Kens, it could be used that 30,000 to do a micro study on that area. It's rural, as a very rural place. It's got hundreds of wind turbines. They're, all, they're being built at the moment. It was really interesting to see them being going up. I've never seen that before. It's got lots of natural resources, natural power. It's got lots of private industries, forestry, who are getting a lot out of that area, and I don't know how much they're putting back into it. So, for a Labour councillor, this might sound odd, but it's not. Why don't we look at things from a bigger picture and look at levering some money in from the private sector and working with the whole community and the council and try to make a go of this for a different perspective. Leave the school as it is just now. It, you know, leave it until we get a mothballing policy that actually has a community impact assessment in it, something that we can all agree on. But I think to, we're getting to a very sort of, um, what's the word, adversarial position on this. And perhaps that isn't the way to go. It's not a black and white position. It might be a grey position or not. Um, and I think if, if we look at something and actually get community stakeholders engaged and we take, say, a year or 18 months to do that, that gives us time to look at that area specifically and we can, we can feed back to Scottish Government on what are we doing about depopulation or more proactively repopulation in our area. Because £30,000 won't touch the sides of Dunfees and Galloway as a whole, but it will maybe do something about Dean Glen Cairns. So it's about us being, and leader, you said this, I'm going to repeat it, an ambitious, bold, innovative and creative council. I don't know where that's going at the moment, but we're not being very bold, creative and ambitious about Dean Glen Cairns or the Rye School. And maybe we need to look at that from a different perspective. So that's a suggestion. And it's not part of the motion, but it's something that I was thinking about when I was sitting on that bus talking to the people that live there. I'm thinking, how can we work with local stakeholders, private sector, to make this happen? rather than just going, it's a black or a white issue, and work with the education director, and work with the newly created, now what's the name? I've got it down here, and it's, it's timely, and it's really good that it's there. Directorate for Education Skills and Importantly Community Wellbeing, and use all the, the, the people in that directorate to help us make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, some interesting suggestions there. At this point, I was just going to ask if uh, uh, it's the Julian... Same point. Oh, sorry, I was just going to raise the same point. Uh, we might do a small rural and a larger rural study like Stranra so that we've got a, a comparable situation for different sized communities. And Delray, I think, pay a significant amount of money into the regional uh, wide wind farm fund. So it would be the reasonable thing to take some back out to study uh, 
Dorai in particular to see what the, the, the circumstances, local and regional circumstances are, because Dorai's position reflects, as Linda's already said, a council of the it reflects many other rural areas uh, 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 within the Frisian Galloway. Yeah, very, very much does. Uh, Councillor McFarlane, you want to come back? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I did, in my seconding of the motion, mention a, a cross-party officer working group, and it was in, aimed at looking at issues like that. I, I don't take the leader's um, view on this that we either have the mothballing or we go to, to statutory closure because or consultation on statutory closure. I don't believe that that's the case. I think there are a number of innovative innovations and in ways of working out there that we can get evidence for. And certainly the parents have been working very, very hard to sort of gather evidence to support their case for maintaining the school. And there is a anecdotal evidence that schools in the Highlands and Islands with similar levels of pupil ratio um, have less full-time equivalent staff, but are still delivering a full curriculum. And it's about different ways of looking at how you deliver that. And I don't think we're being innovative enough. And I think in our original motion that we tried to put forward a month ago, we were talking about what innovative ways of working have been considered to try and bring this forward in order to maintain the school. And I do think that if we do a little bit more work and, and be a bit more creative, that we can find a solution to this. And certainly in the, the public meeting that was held on the 29th of January, there was uh, people there who were saying that they were prepared to invest in the area, but would find that difficult to do if there wasn't a school in order to find a workforce that was coming through. And certainly within our group, we've had conversations about the, the renewable energy activities that are taking place in that area and why couldn't we utilise a school or, or get an extension to the school whereby it became a centre of excellence for that sort of activity. So I think there are things out there that we could do. But one of the key things, and, and Councillor Dorward touched on it about the depopulation, but while we're depopulating, we're also, everybody talks about uh, ageing populations. And the, the motion that we discussed just before this was about health and social care. And one of the big issues that were flagged up there is the, the number of beds that we're going to need because we have an aging population. And here we have a, a, a community that is working really, really hard, being very creative, bringing forward a lot of ideas, a lot of cohesiveness there. Some facilities that other bigger places would really be quite envious of. And obviously they've got engagement with the community that a lot of people would be envious of. And I do think that we can, with a different approach, address some of those issues. If we have a school that will attract families in a prior life, I worked with a, a colleague in, in England who was moving to Dalry because it had a school. He wanted to move to Scotland, he looked at Dalry, and one of the reasons he wanted to go there was because it had a school. Whether he ever actually did that, I don't know, but that is one thing that people will look at, and if they think that they're going to have to go to Dalry and send their kids for an hour on a bus each way, they won't get the after school, they won't get the socialisation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then I don't think that we are doing our job. I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. We need to look at creative solutions. We need to look at what's happening elsewhere. And we need to look to see if we can adjust and adapt to do, deliver that. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I, th I think looking to, looking to the future, this, this is going to be an issue going forward. And I think it's important that we look at different solutions and different ways of working, because we're going to have to. Um, Councillor Ferguson. Thanks, Convener. Um, this is a bit frustrating for me, this, because I was once told it's not the building you should look at, it's what happens inside the building. Uh, there's an opportunity here to continue. There's uh, certainly a, a, a very, very vibrant, um, very quiet, just now it's the quietest I've seen them, uh, behind us here, uh, who coming forward with lots of ideas about what else could happen in that building? Right. What else could we do in that building? Right. We've just heard, I think it was, uh, what was it, Jim or somebody said, uh, previously we just talked about health social care. Right. We know, has anybody been to the health social care partnership to see if there's actually anything we could deliver in that building um, for the Greater Glint Ken's area? And again, it's, uh, it's strewn with wind farms, so there's money coming in the area from external. I think there should be the beneficiaries of that. Uh, if we mothball or close that school um, or that building, call it that rather than school, 
uh, you're taking away the, all the opportunity that that community has. To, a, you would have to build something, or do you know? Uh, just that infrastructure wouldn't be there. And and I think what I, I think what I'm going to say to finish off, convener, would be listening to what the community are saying. I, I, I quite like Linda's idea, when she was talking about the other things and how we could take this forward. I think we're all agreed here right, that we could find other uses for that building uh, in non-school time. Uh, I, and, we, you know, and again, just referring back to the last item, we're talking about having to come all the way from Stranraer uh, to, to Dumfries, for example, or Newton Stewart to Dumfries. It, it's as bad coming through the top end of Glen Kens to Dumfries um, in terms of transport. Uh, so they are remote rural, and if, 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 if in any way we can actually help them, because uh, that, that building or school it should be the beating heart of that community. That was, what, that was the original uh, foundation of a school in the first place. It was, it, well, yes, it was to educate, but it was also a focal point for the community to come together. And that's what used to happen in the good old days before we had education acts and that came, that, all that came in. So maybe history tells us something. Thank you. Councillor Lowe, you wanted to come in. Thank you. Um, in our ward, we have a primary school that's about to be mothballed and one that's possibly on its way. And I'm aware that's primary and there are more schools that they can go to so that they still get an education. Um, having worked at Class Fen, I'm also very well aware of well the distance to Del Wright. Um, we've been talking about equity of access to education, but also behind the scenes, in fact, not just behind the scenes, we've been discussing aligned timetables and I'm just wondering that if we were to put a hold on mothballing for some time at Del Rai, that this is a position where we can introduce some of these other policies that were, is coming in through the education and learning and will come in through the wellbeing to actually say we can support a, an accessible, varied education in that school, maybe a mixed use with other things in the building as well, but a possibility that if we're coming up with these policies and then we say, but we're going to close Del Rai, um, well, why could they not um, have access to the, the timetables on online learning, which might be a better option ahead? It's just a possibility. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor McCallan. Councillor McCammon, are you wanting to come in? Are you speaking or have you still got your thing on mute? Councillor Dougie Campbell, you were next after that. Thanks, convener. Um, just a, a couple of points. Uh, I mean, the, the, the discussion and debate is, is, is great yet again. I'll take pride in my two motions to stimulate and uh, really good debate. I uh, really like the idea from Councillor Dorward. Uh, I'd love to see that being fleshed out and looked at in, in more detail. In terms of the, the point that you were making, Gail, about statutory consultation, taking this back to 29th of January, the community were told the recommendation was that the school would be mothballed. Okay? Uh, it's difficult to argue against numbers, but there is so much going on in, in the round in relation to the, the, the Glen Kens. Um, there are really ambitious, vibrant, uh, uh, they're, just, they're just a great community. And I'm, I'm really proud to, to represent the, the, the Glen Kens and, and, and the people that are uh, here joining us uh, today. Um, but I think very, very strongly that this is a full council issue in that if we were to go down the line of not properly engaging with the community, consulting on what are the, the options before we look at mothballing, before we look at statutory consultation, if we didn't do that, we would effectively be pulling the rug under the feet of this, this community. There is so much going on economically, socially, uh, you know, aspirations. Um, and, and I. I genuinely see this as it's not just a, a ward issue, it's a, a, it's a region-wide issue because we all know that school roles are, are, are falling and other schools, other secondary schools may very well come into 
that this kind of scope at some future point. So we really need to get it right. Um, and that, I'm afraid, it's a lot of work that we're talking about here, but we've got a great opportunity to be the envy of rural communities across the whole of Scotland in terms of what we achieve working with the, the community and basically ticking off all those different areas of national, regional and local policy. Um, so, you know, for, for me, the motion still stands as it is, but what I would like to suggest um, uh, is that we uh, adopt the, the, the way forward as articulated by Councillor McFarlane as a reasonable way to, to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, um, this is a bit of a damp squib compared to what's been said already. It was more just a question about uh, how we work out with our bound... How do we look outwards? So I'm conscious that if you live north of Cars Fair and your closest secondary school probably be uh, doing academy in Dalmellington. So, uh, and this is more of a question for just, uh, I suppose, as an education authority, do we make it easy for people who live in our region to um, attend schools that are closer than any other school within the region, potentially? Uh, and is that something that, um, I mean, is that, is it I-been? Or is, there, is it really complicated? Does it involve money and transport and all the rest of it? And is there a way that we can try being creative along the lines that we're discussing today to explore all these options for um, whatever choices parents might want to make for what they think is going to be the best education for their children. But I totally support the motion. Let's, let's take that as granted. But it's just, it's not mentioned in the report, but I'm very conscious that in such a big area where rurality, um, I think the point's well made, um, it's, a, it's a factor and feature that we kind of need to understand better. But there, there are options that are closer than we think. They're just not within our, our boundary. So I'm just sort of thinking... Is that part of it? And um, could we maybe pick that up as part of any future discussions relating to this? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Thompson. I was thinking exactly the same. And we got sent the Google Maps things, you know, from from the parents, and we looked at the the distances and the routes, and and obviously, I mean, I'm I'm just sitting looking at it from my terrible from a kind of accountancy background here, thinking, is this just a bookkeeping exercise that we can't actually? use another facility that is, that is closer. You know, I, I, I don't know if... Gillian, can you help with that? If I may, and I've got... Um, certainly, local authorities across Scotland have reciprocal agreements, and there are no inter-authority charges for attendance if there are no additional support needs. However, the critical factor in this and in many other factors is school transport. You, do, you are not entitled to school transport if you attend a school out with your catchment. Therefore, the number of pupils who attend Langham Academy from Hoyk, or Stranraer Academy from Girvan, or Sankin Academy from East Ayrshire, they make their own way to school. So, of course, pupils who live in Kersfairn and the northern end of the Glen Cairns can access other schools, but they do that as parental choice with no transport. And I think that also brings us to the point in 4.1.2 in my report today, where those pupils who are currently choosing for their own educational experience, they are currently choosing to go out with their catchment, and they are currently not receiving transport to go to Castle Douglas or to other schools. So we are in a, we're in a very difficult position, and I fully respect members' position here and the parents and children that are here today. I've been working personally on this since 2014, and I've heard many, many of these ambitions and promises and <laughs> over the last decade, and they have not come to fruition. And therefore, it is on very difficult grounds, and not in terms of part of the transformation programme, but as part of the Commission for Rural Education, the local authority considered the school role to be not viable in terms of meeting the educational interests of the children. That is why it is not transformation school mothballing policy. Absolutely right, we do not have a mothballing policy for secondary schools. The mothballing policy was agreed as part of the transformation in 2022. The recommendation to parents to look to have their child's learning needs met at another school came purely and simply in, on grounds that the numbers are so low that it is our professional recommendation and it's my job to give you professional 
recommendation and advice that the numbers are so low that it's no longer in the educational interests of the children. And that is why we are here today. Thank you. Councillor Young. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, I remember when I started teaching at Castle Douglas High School, Dalry Secondary School still had its own head teacher. And it was during my time at Castle Douglas that it was amalgamated with Castle Douglas under a single head teacher. And at that time, the head teacher, Donald Campbell, who some of you may remember, um, arranged for, say, a, a math teacher to travel up from Castle Douglas up to Dalry, say, in a Wednesday and a Friday afternoon, and other subject experts travel up on different days of the week. So at that time, the two schools had... Um, agreed integrated timetables to allow that to happen. But I do remember some teachers refused to go. I remember particularly a PE teacher refused to go up in the afternoon to um, run football matches, etc. But uh, I, I do believe that while fully in favour of the motion, I agree more, more research needs to be done. I mean, Dalry is, if you like, in the middle of an industrial landscape. The, the sort of regenerative aspects of e energy being produced up in the Glen Cairns is, 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 is probably understated and not really recognised. You've got natural power, one, one of the biggest energy organisations in the UK. A Drax is... <coughs> Involved up there, and it at the moment is trying to green to um, improve its green credentials to get away from the the type of power it produces in the north of England, and and you've got acres after acres of wind farms. Now, surely there should be some sort of consultation with um, renewable energy providers or in renewable energy training courses at the college to make the most of this hub of uh, energy production. So. <laughs> I, I, I believe it's an opportunity to go beyond um, traditional education. I mean, what, what do we learn from COVID? We managed a, a digital education offering during COVID, but now in some cases we seem to we want to go straight back to traditional schools education with 20-plus uh, pupils sitting in front of a teacher. We've learned a lot from digital, and I think we really need to use the next... 18 months, shall we say, to investigate and talk to people, talk to the, these energy producers who are really big in Glen Cairns and see what sort of a combined future we could have for, for Darai Secondary School. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Young. Councillor Slater. Thank you, Chair. It was just to say, really, that I support this motion. But what I would also say, if you mothball the school as such, and quite often if these buildings are closed, they tend to maybe get vandalised or f fall into rock and ruin. Uh, so I think, really, the school, if it remains open, there should be a look at other ways and other things to do with the school as well to try and keep it open. But if you close it, they lose the school, and probably in time, if the building lies empty, the building will be lost as well. So if, you've half the, if you have a building, you've half the project. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jameson. Yeah, I will give you much more time because it's nearly five o'clock. As I say, I support the motion because it's highly sensible that we discuss it. My, my, I agree with Linda's aspirations uh, and uh, Councillor Dempster as well originally. Education and learning is the, the, the first priority here, but we'll have to consider everything else. There's a lot of information. We talk about research. There's a pile of research that the officers have done already. The education committee guys should have seen it and they should have read it. And that's where we can start from. But what learning process here is we need to take folk with us. We need to understand particular issues. And I don't think that was missed by the directorate either. The modernization of the school estate is really important because it is about the building as well. Because if, if, if the members that took the time to go to the Fees Academy and Lorburn could see that those schools were not fit for modern education, there was kids, ASN kids, sitting in the corridor with ear defenders on. And I don't think many folk will have seen that before, but I've been in a lot of schools 
Well, that's the situation. So we can't, we can't shed away from the fact that we need to modernise our schools. We need to look at the bigger picture, but we obviously have to look at the community side as well. And I'm repeating this all, we need to ask each other, not tell each other. There needs to be a meeting of minds here so as we go forward. And I totally respect the work that the professionals have done and the, the presentation that we'll get in, in May will be really illuminating. So I think, I hope we can all agree that, we, I think the agreement is coming forward that we need to support this motion, but a lot of caveats and a lot of interesting stuff going forward. So um, I recommend we, 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 we take on the motion, but really take forward all the things that's been discussed today. It's been brilliant to actually thrash it out because too many of us don't really get it for obvious reasons, because we're all in different committees and really busy. But if you look at the work that's been done, it's very illuminated. And we can all have a proper discussion if we know the facts and, and the opportunities that we have. I'll leave it at that, but I think we've probably had a really good discussion. And it's Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Convener. No, yeah, I totally take on board what all other members have said today. It's clear to see the desire and commitment from the parents, teachers and pupils, uh, specifically Dalry. But I'm somewhat concerned that we're not being absolutely honest with all our constituents. To touch on a point Councillor Jameson made about the review of the school estate. Now, at the moment, we have too many buildings that we can't afford to upkeep. Surely the, the conclusion of this review is going to be that some of these, I don't know the number, but some of these buildings have to be closed because we cannot afford to upkeep them to the appropriate standard. So I fear that we're not being absolutely open and honest with the constituents that this is what we're going to face. We're going to be back here time and time again discussing other schools, possibly not do right, but because we do not have the finances to operate the school estate as it exists at the moment. Are we potentially delaying the inevitable? As harsh and as horrible as that sounds, is that the hard truth of, of the situation that we're in? Thank you. Councillor Crothers. Thank you. Is it McFarlane for me? Chair, I maybe got that wrong. Oh, oh, it is. Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Convener. Uh, it's interesting that Councillor Marsh just, just raised that point. Um, I think everyone is accepting that the current position can't be maintained. I think we all accept that there has to be change, and it's how we manage that change and where we manage it. And, and whilst there may be over-provision of school buildings, I would suggest that they're not in the Glencairns that they may be closer to where we're sitting just now, then perhaps we should be looking at that if we're looking at reducing our school uh, our school buildings and such like. Um, but it's been brought to my attention that there's been a suggestion um, that this has been a managed decline at Dalry, and, and the officers have, have rejected that and said that that's not the case. But but Gillian's said about the, the people who have got pupils who live in the catchment area of Dalry who are travelling to Castle Douglas at their own expense. But I've been led to believe that there is a, a bus that travels, which takes uh, the year fives, year sixes, from the Dalry catchment area to Castle Douglas, and that they actually allow year S1s to S3 to use that bus. So in effect, they're facilitating the depopulation of the school, which you, know, you could understand why somebody might then think that, well, this has been manufactured, this has been uh, contrived in order to sort of make us unviable. So it'd be interesting to get Julian, uh, Gillian's take on that. Thanks. Thank you, Gillian. You come in on that one. Thank you. If I could respond. It, this has been very difficult over the last 10 years because we have a group of parents who wish to send their children in S1 or S2 to a different school. They do not wish their children to attend or Rye and they wish transport. And we have another group of parents who wish to ensure the sustainability of the Rye Secondary School and, as you suggest, see any offer of transport that I make as a managed decline. And I try to navigate and meet all sides. So if there are spaces on the bus, now clearly bus transport is now free for young people, but if, there is, if a parent has made on curricular grounds a request to attend to study certain subjects at Castle Douglas earlier than S4, because they go in S5 anyway, 
at then we will offer school transport because we genuinely feel that their curricular needs are best met. And I completely accept the position that's been put forward. It is a genuine view of the Education Authority and the Chief Education Officer that the educational needs are best met curricularly at Castle Douglas High School. And therefore, I find it difficult to refuse transport when I myself am making that professional recommendation that they attend a different school. But I absolutely recognise we are navigating two paths here. We've got the school transport policy, which does not allow transport to non-catchment pupils. And I have got a group of parents who wish their young people to study and have the continuity of their secondary education at Castle Douglas High School. And I have great sympathy for both sides and we do our best to meet the needs of all pupils living in that area. And it's really not been easy over the last 10 years, believe you me. Councillor Crummers. Thanks very much, Convener. Listen, I've been really interested in uh, debate, I think. Uh, I thought Councillor Marsh's point there uh, was just throwing a bit of cold water on it. It made, made us realise we were, but Councillor McFarlane's coming in and said, I think we're all aware of that. And uh, Jillian, as Director of Education and Learning, has made it quite clear over the last 10 years, this hasn't just happened overnight, it's over the last 10 years, it has been declining. But there's, there's been enough representation showing their support for this, so that this will get carried today. There's no two ways about that. It's just, how does this now get implemented for here? And that, that's the, over the next 12 to 18 months. How do we, we uh, look at our own policies, is what I'm thinking. Maybe uh, Councillor Campbell, he's next to speak for what I can see, can start to outline that as we go forward with this decision. How do we look at, as a council, uh, our policies internally? How do we manage this process to either make it happen or it has to, uh, or it'll fail, depending on the outcome of how the consultation process, how private sector, public sector, different organisations buy into this over the next year or so. So that's what I'm keen, keen to say, Jim. And I think this, this will be carried today. There's no two ways about it, but how does Councillor Campbell and McFarlane see that being implemented after the comments that have been made? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crothers. I've, and, you know, my, my view in reading the motion and, uh, and the previous discussions is the fact, as much as anything else, this is about transparency, it's about honesty, it's about engagement, it's, like do, it's about doing a a broader impact assessment throughout the whole the whole community, and I, I fully understand that. And I've, I've said before, you know, I support it. So, Councillor Campbell. Yeah, <coughs> thank thanks, Convener. Hopefully, I can bring things to a, a, a sort of conclusion. Um, I, I spoke in my last motion about bricks and mortar when I was in opposition to uh, the current seconder of this motion, but I'm going to mention bricks and mortar again. It's not about that. It's about education and it's about community. Uh, we can't run away from the fact that the school role is dropping, but there's a range of factors in that through parent and, and pupil choice. Um, and the thing that concerns me um, is that, you know, the, the education director is going to take on community wellbeing. And I've spoken about that, and Andy has spoken about that. And you mentioned, Gillian, about you know that th these promises have been made in the past and they haven't been fulfilled. That's not the same picture now. And I could have a number of people at your office tomorrow morning who will give you guarantees. They're desperate to engage with you, to talk about alternative solutions. Uh, and I know they'll be listening, the, the, the Glen Kensington District uh, Trust, and they've established the Community Action Plan Steering Group and they're very much looking at social and economic factors. And they're, they're spending wind farm money, uh, and they, they manage a number of wind farm funds on behalf of the whole of the Glen Kens. So they've got a very wide vision. Uh, they're not naive, they understand the challenges, but I think what we need is that period of time where you uh, can engage with the, the community and start to flesh these, these ideas out, um, and thereafter, um, hopefully we can we can uh, achieve a, a solution that, that suits everyone. Uh, but just to finally finally say um, that it's about the implications that we have in future about our school estate and falling roles. But co this community are coming up with ideas, and we've got to listen to them. We really have because if we don't, uh, we're, we're just set, you know hammering a nail into the, the coffin in that community. And uh, just finally, I would, I would again say that I'd like to, I'd like to propose that uh, the way forward, as, as uh, um, articulated by Councillor McFarlane, is added on as an amendment 
to the, the motion. Thank you. Councillor Campbell, we all we also need to agree if we're pausing the moth polling. We need that to agree a period of time. Have you got a suggestion for that? I, I think for the benefit of uh, the families and the children and to create a, a, a space for um, the, the, the new policy to be developed uh, and thereafter for um, consultation with the community and taking into account all the factors that we've mentioned today, uh, at the very least I would suggest 12 months to give that, that, that security to families and the, the, the pupils. Um, and possibly up to 18 months if, if required. Thank you. So if you're going to put a number on it, we're going to put 18 months or we're going to put 12? 12? 12, 18? Given that, we're, given that we're in March and the academic year starts in August, I suppose. But, uh, or earlier. Thank you. Ah. Ah, Andy, that's you. you. If I may convene a yeah. Um, just Dougie's made mention a couple of times about the, the way forward that I suggested, so I have put it in the chat. Uh, if you want to put it up on the screen for everyone to have a look and see if we can agree that. Thank you. Councillor Dorward. Thank you, convener. I think the other thing that we mentioned that maybe hasn't been captured is the depopulation study or the repopulation study if people are, are happy to use that huge sum of money, it's not £30,000 um, from Scottish Government, it's a massive issue for the, the region, and we need to start somewhere. So if we can use it to look at, um, you know, how do we get everybody together to look at repopulation as opposed to depopulation. And the school's a big part of that, and I think it's a big test for the region and for this council as well. So if we can agree to do something about that as well. I'm not suggesting to use that funding, but it'd be really good if we could use it for something specific because it's a great deal of money to, to focus on the, the Dee and Glen Cairns area. We'll get something maybe quite innovative, creative and ambitious out of that that we perhaps we wouldn't have had had this not come up in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, thank you. Just briefly, I, I don't disagree, Linda. Um, I think we'll need to double check the criteria if it's Scottish Government funding. Because as you know, they don't always give us the greatest of flexibility. So we'd need to be sure that, that, that it could be used for a, you know, a narrower purpose. Thank you, convener. Um, um, and thank you for the debate, members. And the words, Councillor McFarlane, that you've suggested. I just wondered whether Gillian would want to clarify um, if this is agreed, the second paragraph there, that's provision of equitable education provision across S1 to S4 at Dolrai until at least the end of 2025, what that would actually mean for members, you know, for transparency and clarity. I think it's important that members understand what that would mean. Thank you, and I think... In, in terms of openness, honesty, and transparency, having a second year, with, uh, sorry, a first year input with two pupils is extremely challenging. And we certainly have our chief education officer representative here who will know exactly how difficult that will be in terms of meeting the expectations of Education Scotland and the post inspection for Dolrai. And we will work as hard as we can to ensure equitable provision for those two S1 pupils. But this as, as I've clearly outlined in the paper, this will not be easy, and it's the educational interests of the young people that are foremost in my thinking, but I'm here to deliver members' agreed policy. So as it stands at the moment, we are negotiating with the individual pupils on individualised timetables to ensure that their timetables and their courses of study are aligned to their post-school ambitions. So depending on what they want to do, whether they are leaving school at the end of S4 or moving on to S5 and S6, we need to ensure that smooth transition. And as some of you may be aware, we have received the resignation of the head teacher of Castle Douglas and Dolry School, so we will be negotiating that with the new head teacher as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hislop. 
Chief asked the question that I was wondering what the actual was meant by equitable education provision. You know, is it you will have a full, you know, a, a child in Dumfries has the option of numerous curricular uh, options. Equitable, does that mean the same number of options have to be offered and they'll arrive for the number of pupils there? Or it was just to clarify what that equitable was. Perhaps Councillor McFarlane wants to answer that. Do you want to answer? Yeah, thank you, uh, Don, and thank you, convener. Yes, well, basically what it means is that we work as hard as we can to deliver what it is that is required for the, the children who are in that area. And if that means a teacher perhaps moving across and, and doing that, then we do that. As I said earlier, I think we have to be creative. I think we have to think outside the box and, and look for alternatives to what we already have. We already agreed that what we have isn't consistent. We, we, we can't sustain it, so we have to look at other things. Just as um, Julian started to respond to that, I've, I've had a look at the email that I received in relation to the, the schools that I mentioned earlier from the Highlands and Islands. Then I've got a thing here that says all four schools I spoke to have pupil numbers ranging between 15 and 25, same as Dorai. All four schools that run, is, run through uh, nursery to S4 in three cases and junior high schools like Dorai. All schools offer full range of sub subjects, the only difficulty being where there's a PA at exam level, where they, they do that. All these schools will run subjects for small class sizes as low as single pupils, and frequently do. Only constraint being teacher time, which isn't an issue at Delray. All the schools run a significantly lower FTE, full-time equivalent, most around half the FTE of Delray. All schools believe that for small rural schools to be successful, a head teacher on the ground fighting for the side is the way forward. Basically, this is happening in other places. And if we just sit here and carry on doing what we're doing, we're going to lose schools like this. We're going to lose the benefit of them. And we're going to lose the benefit and the, the tapestry that we have is our communities across the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. Lida, you wanted to come in? Yeah, again, very briefly, because I think we need to get the wording absolutely right. And, and the, the motion as written by Councillor Campbell I was very content with the wording on that. What Andy's added to it is that, that the first paragraph we proposed as a way forward, should this motion be adopted, that mothballing is suspended for 18 months. And I think that that's absolutely not what we're suggesting. Um, we, we need to be able to mothball our very small rural schools in lines with the guidance. So maybe it's just putting that secondary mothballing. <laughs> I'm just getting quite nervous about that one. Can I just quietly come in? And I, yeah. uh, uh, unless Gillian tells me otherwise, I don't think any other secondary schools are, are under threat. Of, no, I wouldn't have thought of, so. But no. that is specifically what we're, right. we're talking about. So if we put, insert the word secondary in that, uh, that would help. Councillor Dempster. Thanks, Convener. If we're talking about taking account of the proposal by, or oh, the amended proposal by Councillor McFarlane that's up on the the boards, I'd be really concerned about paragraph three, where it talks about community well-being and includes cross-border out-of-region options for the benefit of pupils. I've attended meetings with Lead Hills Primary School and with colleagues from across the border and defended the council's position about no paying to transport a child a mile from Warnlet Head to Lead Hills in the interest of their safety and well-being because we have a bus running to Sankar eh, to the primary school these kids are zoned to, D one of the most dangerous roads in the region and, and what the bus was jackknifed and the road was closed yesterday because of snow. So I find myself in a position where I'm telling the Lead Hills and Warnett Head folk we're not going to support cross-border travel because it's beyond council policy and here we are agreeing it eh, 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 for Dolry. So I think while I absolutely sympathise and I've always sympathised with the position that the members are taking, we can make this different from other schools and other parents in Dumfries and Galloway that might have the same set of circumstances that are here. I'm telling folks in Warnley Head we will not pay for their children to cross the border. It's a mile and we're talking about allegedly paying for kids to go to Dalmellington because it's for the community well-being that, that 
category would fit my children as well, and it's my ward, so I'd be really concerned if that's the direction travel members are taking. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, Councillor Dempster. Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks very much. And a, a wee bit of advice for Gillian would be welcome, or the education officer. Sorry, I don't know your name, but welcome. Um, I'm just looking at the 18 months part, and my worry in that and it, it is if, you, if you're just transitioning from S2 to S3, you'll be going on to a two year course basically till your next exams. So, halfway through your exam period, it, it, it doesn't. It, it, if it was me as a parent or me as a student, it wouldn't fill me full of hope that I would be able to actually finish my course. So I actually think the 18 months is, is, is too short, and I would put that up to 24 months and make it the two years. So that covers the, uh, the, the full time that the, uh, anybody who's going to do it. it, it you're shaking your head, uh, uh, Gail, but it's a point of view. It's a, it's a consideration, and I really welcome one of the two professionals uh, viewing that. Councillor McFarlane, you know, on, on reflection and looking at the at the 18 months part of it as well, uh, we've set a date, and I was guilty, obviously, looking for a number, really, but uh, should it be perhaps until the policy is agreed, uh, however long that might be? But anyway, Vlad wants to come in on that fact. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, um, I would have concerns about the, the 18 month uh, period uh, if that was to be agreed, uh, because in essence it ties the hands of the council in terms of setting a policy. Uh, I think what's uh, in clear in the motion that was actually tabled, and not the one that's uh, up on the screen at the moment, uh, was for that policy to take shape and for full council to take that decision on the full policy, not to uh, constrain the council in terms of uh, mothballing for 18 months. So that, that's a new part that's been added. Uh, I would have concerns about that. I don't know if that's been properly risk assessed, but my main concern is one of governance, which is it would tie the council's position down in terms of a future policy, uh, because you wouldn't be able to implement it for at least 18 months. Uh, even if it comes back to full council. So uh, I would have that concern, and my suggestion would be that it, the mothballing would be suspended, uh, similar to what it's in the motion that was actually tabled in, in written form, uh, which is uh, up to the, the time in which uh, full council decides a policy. Uh, and when full council decides a policy, we as officers will implement that in line with the policy. True. Presumably, when the policy is decided, part of that policy could be that we don't implement it for 18 months. Is that correct? If it's part of the policy. So we could put that in as part of the policy. So that, in, you know, in due course, if that, that was uh, acceptable. Yeah, can I come back and reverse, please? Yeah, um, I would be happy to just say suspend it then, suspend the mothballing policy for secondary schools at the moment. Um, but what I'm looking to do is offer some security and, and, and confidence for the, the children and the parents that are there just now. Uh, and that's why I put that, that sort of time span in. But if we were to be cognizant of that when we make the policy so that when we implement it, we have uh, an awareness of the situation the children might find themselves in so that we give them sufficient time to be able to make that transition, that adjustment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Marshall. There's, it was really just the point that was being made by Councillor Dempsey. I don't really have an issue with that because I think what we're wanting to do is look at a fresh look, look at all the options, you know, and because the proximity to Delmel, and I think it's, it's just, a, you know, a group that's actually got to look at all the different options. So at this stage, you know, that shouldn't be a concern. It's just, it's just a look at that. So, you know, I'm quite comfortable with that part. Councillor Ingalls. Thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. Can I ask Chilean to reiterate the reasons why she felt that in this paper, why the 17 children should be educated in Castle Douglas, please? Thank you. And I can hand over to my colleague Rachel Williams, who is the School Link Education Officer and has a great deal of experience in these matters. So thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, it's not my intention to put a dampener on the afternoon, um, but I think it is really important that members do understand the reasons behind the, the report, 
and are aware of some of the challenges in delivering education currently at Dalrai. Um, I would like to say before I start that um, I absolutely understand how important schools are to their communities and how having a vibrant, active, um, caring school within your community is a real asset. Um, and I completely applaud the, um, the community of Dalry for coming together. And for councillors, it's fantastic for me to hear that you want to be bold, that you want to be creative, that you want to be innovative. I mean, that is all absolutely music to my ears. The issues that we're facing in terms of delivering the equitable education, as mentioned in paragraph two, firstly, the declining school role. The projection is there'll be f um, 15 young people at Dalry Secondary School, two young people in S2, um, and then we're looking at eight young people, uh, sorry, in S1, eight young people in S2, and then a, a handful of children in S3 and S4. The attendance currently at Dalry Secondary School is lower than we would like. Um, currently, the attendance figures for Dalry is 85.96% compared to other schools in the stewartry, that is the lowest attendance. We have an issue of declining attainment across the school. Again, it's really difficult to put numbers to this because, because the numbers of children are so low, any statistical analysis would identify individual young people, and therefore I can't give you figures. However, you should be aware that it is not in a position where we are seeing um, the, the sorts of attainment levels that were perhaps seen in the past. It's increasingly difficult to provide appropriate opportunities uh, to address the areas for improvement that were identified by HMI in 2020. One of those was to improve the quality and consistency of teaching. And the statement within that report says that that is to be done by engaging pupils in activities that are more active and involve structured dialogue with their peers. As you will appreciate, in a school of such a small size, a secondary school of such a small size, that is a real challenge. HMI also noticed that it was important to improve the understanding of national standards through engagement with colleagues in school. Again, with a limited number of colleagues in school, that is really difficult for us to support the school to achieve. It is increasingly difficult for our dedicated and hardworking teachers to deliver high quality education due to some of the challenge that, challenges that were noted in a paper by EIS in 2015. And in that paper, it was made clear that teachers have real concerns about teaching multi-age, multi-stage classes, which is what they have to do in a secondary school of such a small size. And that is not the normal position for secondary schools. It's quite common in primary schools for us to teach um, multi-composite classes. That's not the case for secondary schools. It's not part of the normal provision of learning and teaching that, that teachers will take. And I will just add in that there is a further challenge in terms of GTCS registration. For secondary teachers, we are registered into a specific subject. My subject, for example, is physics. I can teach physics. I'm allowed to teach physics. My GTCS registered subject is physics, but I can't teach history. And so when we're talking about delivering education to a very small number of young people, we have to be mindful of the fact that we have GTCS registered subjects who are available to teach their subject um, area, and therefore it is very hard to reduce the number of staff that are required. The impact of the uncertainty has been huge, and I have spoken to families and young people at Dalry, and I don't think we can underestimate the impact of the uncertainty on the mental health and well-being of the young people, the families, and the staff at the school. Whether that is uncertainty over whether or not Dalry will exist in its current form, or whether that's uncertainty over option choices and whether they can be delivered. That uncertainty is, is absolutely detrimental to health and well-being. HMI also noted in their report that um, wider achievement opportunities were at absolutely essential at the school. And at the time the report was written, there were 44 young people attending Dalry Secondary School. Currently, the number of wider achievement opp opportunities are reduced within the school because the number of children are reduced and therefore the number of children who want to participate in these different activities is much smaller. And that means that young people do not always have the opportunities to develop the skills that HMI noted 
of communication, teamwork, social skills, planning, organizing, employability, and leadership. And that is why we have put together the paper, because we have concerns over how we deliver these many and varied aspects of education. Education is not just about sitting in a class and getting your learning delivered virtually or in person. Education is much wider than that. It is about your school community. It is about those wider achievement opportunities that you have. It is about the skills that you develop. It's about the whole of curriculum for excellence, not just about that very one small aspect, which is what subject are you taking? And so for that reason, I do have concerns over that paragraph that was mentioned about that, um, having that, those opportunities, equitable opportunities, for young people, because I believe very strongly that those equitable opportunities can be delivered regardless, actually, of, of what school you're in, um, but where you have peers in order to interact with and to be part of a, a wider school community. Yeah, thank you for that. I think Councillor Engels wants... Oh, Councillor Engels. Yeah, can I come back? Yeah, I think one of the things that's been missing from the debate is how important it is for the children that's involved in this and the quality of their education that they're going to get at Dolry Primary School, eh, Secondary School, sorry. The, I, I, I support the bulk of what's in this motion because I hate to see the heart ripped out of a community when you take a school away. But there's another angle to this, and it's the quality of the education that these young people are going to get at the present time in Dolry Primary School. And I think we should all be very clear on exactly who's going to be impacted by the decisions we take today, and it will be the children and their education. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ingalls. Councillor Campbell. I'm getting a bit irritated, convener, <laughs> mostly because it's half past five. Um, a lot of what we just heard there was articulated to the, the community on the, the 29th of January. and. I, I get the concern about the, 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 the pupils, but there's two sides to the story here. And if our uh, guests at the back were able to speak, they would speak about a managed decline and circumstances created that have resulted in pupils going to Kirkubri Academy or to Castle Douglas High School. Um, and who knows, maybe with that period of certainty of education provision, pupils will come back to, to Dalry Secondary. Uh, so just to emphasise, there's two sides of the story. Um, and I think at this stage, it appears to me that elected members have, have made their decision. We just need to go through the formalities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We, we all know the, the issues with the school. Well, as I, as I summarised uh, summarised earlier, the motions involving an awful lot of other issues as well. So, so 2.1, we had to agree to withdraw delegation, which we did. And 2.2, consider the terms of the notice of motion proposed by Councillor Dougie Campbell and seconded by Councillor Andy McFarland set out in the appendix of the report. We have now the exact wording of the motion. Is that the whole motion now in front of the... Thank you. I think no. at some point we could maybe talk about the terms of reference of the, the, the working group, but maybe that's not for, for today. But as long as that working group, when it is formed, it's, it's, it, it reflects what we've agreed today, I think Andy and I will both be comfortable with that. Thank you. So that's the motion as stands. Are we happy to... Can I just... Sorry. I'm glad. Sorry, convener. Um, j just uh, going back to my point earlier, uh, it's, it's suspending um, the, the mothballing until such time as the council... Uh, decides a policy, and that policy may determine the time period within that. Uh, I, I don't think we can make that uh, as it currently sits. Um, and the, the rest, um, I, I understand in terms of paragraph three, uh, within that, that it's uh, in essence that engagement between uh, members and officers in, in terms of uh, doing that, but obviously uh, the normal process for governance is for the service uh, the relevant service to bring those policies forward to ultimately be the, for the services to present that, not for uh, the, the, the members to present that. So that will be presented to full council, is my understanding, uh, and I think that seems to be the consensus. 
but it's just to make that clarity that is ultimately is a, is a service uh, policy that will be presented uh, with that engagement and consultation and collaborative working that's mentioned within that paragraph three, if that's okay with members. Thank you. We're happy with that, Councillor Dempster. Absolutely, convener. As long as the policy we bring forward is a region-wide one and it treats everybody the same, I'm absolutely content with that, yes. I think that's a whole, a large part of it is it does need to be region-wide. I think that's... That's thing. Thank you very much. So we now move on to the fun bit, item 20, minutes for approval. Anne and Common Goods Subcommittee, 14 February. Ian Crothers to move. Sean, I think it's... Yeah, happy, happy to second. Thank you. Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee, 13th of February. That'll move that, convener. Seconded. I'm afraid there's quite a list, actually. Civic Government Licensing Panel, 29th of September. Aye, happy to move, convener. Happy to second, convener. Civic Government Licensing Panel, 22nd November 2023. Happy to move. Councillor Denerly, are you happy to second? Yes, I second that. Thank you. Civic Government Licensing Panel, 9th of January 2024. Happy to move. Happy to second, Convener. Civic Government Licensing Panel, 24th of January 2024. Moved. Second. Communities Committee, 6th of February 2024. Happy to move. Councillor Crothers, can you second that? Oh, sorry, second, I didn't see that. Thank you. Well, do it. The Free's Common Goods Subcommittee, 16th of February. Move. Employment and Appeals Subcommittee, 23rd November. Move. Second. Employment and, Sub Employment and Appeals Subcommittee, 15th of December. Move. Happy to second. Employment and Appeals Subcommittee, 2nd of February. Move. Happy to second. Employment and Appeals Subcommittee, 22nd of February. Move on the next one. Councillor Dougie Campbell, you get a second that? Yes. Employment and Appeals Subcommittee, 29th of February. You've been very busy, Councillor Crowther. I have moved. I have moved. I Yep. Councillor Howie, are you going to second that? I have a second. Finance Procurement and Transformation Committee, 8th of February. Move. Second. Local Review Body, 1st of February. Councillor Crothers again. Move, so it is. Sorry, I missed that one. And Councillor Hill seconded. Lock, Lockerbie and Lock, Maven Common Good on, oh it doesn't give me a date, hold on, it's the other page, Night, 6th of February, sorry. Happy to move, second. Police Fire and Rescue Subcommittee, 7th of December. Happy to move. Happy to second. Thank you. Social Work Services Committee, 15th of February, 24. Happy to move. Happy to second. Thank you. Sunrar Common Good Fund Subcommittee, 26th of January. Move. Second. Thank you. So we have minutes for noting. It was 21A to 21L. Are you happy to note those minutes? Thank you. Any other business deemed urgent by the Chairman? No. We have no items of urgent business. Thank you for all your contributions. Thank you for the people taking the time to come down and attend from Dol Rye and just make sure you don't eat your Easter eggs all at once. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.